Prologue. College have always seemed so crucial, such an essential part of what measures a person's worth and determines their future. We live in a time where people ask which school you went to before asking your last name. From an early age I was taught, trained really, to prepare for my education. It had become this necessity that required an overwhelming amount of preparation and borderline obsession. Every class I chose, every assignment I completed since my first day of high school revolved around getting into college. And not just any college, my mother had it set in her mind that I attend Washington Central University, the same school that she attended, but never completed. I had no idea that there would be so much more to college than academics. I had no idea that choosing which electives to take during my first semester would seem, just a few months later, like trivial affairs. I was naive then, and in some ways I still am. But I couldn't have possibly known what lay ahead of me. Meeting my dorm mate was intense and awkward from the start, and meeting her wild group of friends even more so. They were so different from anyone I had ever known, and I was intimidated by their appearance, confused by their pure inattention to structure. I quickly became a part of their madness, indulging in it, and that's when he crept into my heart. From our first encounter, Hardin changed my life in ways that no amount of college prep courses or youth group lectures could have. Those movies I watched as a teen quickly became my life, and those ridiculous plot lines became my reality. Would I have done anything differently if I had known what was to come? I'm not sure. I would love to give a straight answer to that, but I can't. At times I am grateful, so utterly lost in the moment of passion, that my judgment is clouded, and all I can see is him. Other times, I think of the pain he caused me, the deep sting of loss for who I had been, the chaos of those moments, when I felt as if my world had been turned upside down, and the answer isn't as clear as it once was. All that I'm certain of is that my life and my heart will never be the same, not after Hardin crashed into them. Chapter 1. My alarm is set to go off any minute. I've been awake for half the night, shifting back and forth, counting the lines between the ceiling tiles and repeating the course schedule in my head. Others may count sheep, I plan. My mind doesn't allow a break from planning, and today, the most important day in my entire 18 years of life, is no exception. Tessa. I hear my mother's voice call from downstairs. Groaning to myself, I roll out of my tiny bed. I take my time tucking the corners of my bedsheet against the headboard, because this is the last morning that this will be a part of my regular routine. After today, this bedroom is no longer my home. Tessa, she calls again. I'm up. I yell back. The noise of the cabinets opening and slamming closed downstairs makes it known that she is feeling just as panicked as I am. My stomach is tight in a tight knot, and as I start my shower I pray that the anxiety I feel will lessen as the day goes on. All of my life has been a series of tasks in preparation for this day, my first day of college. I spent the last few years nervously anticipating this. I spent my weekend studying and preparing for this as my peers were hanging out, drinking, and doing whatever else it is teenagers do to get themselves in trouble. That wasn't me. I was the girl who spent her night studying cross-legged on the living room floor with my mother, while she gossiped and watched hours of QVC to find new ways to improve her appearance. The day my acceptance letter to Washington Central University came I couldn't have been more thrilled, and my mother cried for what felt like hours. I can't deny that I was proud that all my hard work had finally paid off. I got into the only college I applied for, and, because of our low income, I have enough grants to keep my student loans to a minimum. I had once, for just a moment, considered leaving Washington for college. But seeing all the color drain from my mother's face at the suggestion, and the way she paced around the living room for nearly an hour, I told her I really hadn't been serious about that. The moment I step into the spray of shower water some of the tension leaves my strained muscles. I'm standing here, under the hot water, trying to calm my mind, but really doing the opposite, and I get so distracted that by the time I finally wash my hair and body, I barely have enough hot water to run a razor over my legs from the knees down. As I wrap the towel around my wet body, my mother calls my name yet again. 
knowing that is her nerves getting the best of her, I give her some leeway but take the time to blow dry my hair. I know that she's anxious for my arrival day at college, but I have had this day planned down to the hour for months. Only one of us can be a nervous wreck, and I need to do what I can to make sure it's not me by following my plan. My hands shake as I fumble with the zipper on my dress. I don't care for the thing, but my mother insisted that I wear it. I finally win the battle with the zipper and pull my favorite sweater from the back of my closet door. As soon as I'm dressed, I feel slightly less nervous until I notice a small tee around the sleeve of my sweater. I toss it back onto my bed and slip my shoes onto my feet, knowing that my mother is growing more impatient with every second that passes. My boyfriend, Noah, will be here soon to ride up with us. He's a year younger than me, but will turn 18 soon. He's brilliant and has straight A's just like I did, and, I'm so excited, he's planning on joining me at WCU next year. I really wish he was coming now, especially considering that I won't know a single person at college, but I'm thankful that he's promised to visit as often as possible. I just need a decent roommate, that's the only thing I'm asking for, and the only thing I can't control with my planning. There is a mother, I am coming down now. Please do not scream my name again. I yell as I walk down the stairs. Noah is sitting at the table across from my mother, staring down at the watch on his wrist. The blue of his polo shirt matches the light blue of his eyes, and his blonde hair is combed and lightly gelled to perfection. Hey, college girl. He smiles a bright, perfectly lined smile as he stands. He pulls me into a tight hug, and I close my mouth when I catch his excessive cologne. Yeah, sometimes he overdoes it a bit with that. Hey. I give him an equally bright smile, trying to hide my nerves, and pull my dirty blonde hair into a ponytail. Honey, we can wait a couple minutes while you fix your hair, my mother says quietly. I make my way to the mirror and nod. She's right. My hair needs to be presentable for today, and of course she didn't hesitate to remind me. I should have curled it the way she likes anyhow, as a little goodbye gift. I'll put your bags in the car, Noah offers, opening his palm for my mother to drop the keys into. With a quick kiss on my cheek he disappears from the room, bags in hand, and my mother follows him. Round two of styling my hair ends with a better result than the first, and I brush a lint roller over my gray dress one last time. As I go outside and walk to the car packed up with my things, the butterflies in my stomach dance around, making me slightly relieved that I have a two-hour drive to make them disappear. I have no idea what college will be like, and, unexpectedly, the question that keeps dominating my thoughts is, will I make any friends? Chapter 2. I wish I could say that the familiar scenery of my home state calmed me as we drove, or that a sense of adventure took hold of me with each sign that indicated we were getting closer and closer to Washington Central. But really I was mostly in a daze of planning and obsessing. I'm not even sure what Noah was really talking about, but I know he was trying to be reassuring and excited for me. Here we are, my mother squeals when we drive through a stone gate and onto campus. It looks just as great in person as it did in the brochures and online, and I'm immediately impressed by the elegant stone buildings. Hundreds of people, parents hugging and kissing their children goodbye, clusters of freshmen dressed head to toe in WCU gear, and a few stragglers, lost and confused, fill the area. The size of the campus is intimidating, but hopefully after a few weeks I will feel at home. My mother insists that she and Noah accompany me to freshman orientation. My mother manages to hold a smile on her face the entire three hours and Noah listens. Intently, the same way that I do. I would like to see your dorm room before we head out. I need to make sure everything's up to par, my mother says once orientation is over. Her eyes scan the old building, full of disapproval. She has a way of finding the worst in things. Noah smiles, lightening the mood, and my mother perks up. I just can't believe you're in college. My only daughter, a college student, living on her own. I just can't believe it, she whines, dabbing under her eyes, though careful not to mess up her makeup. Noah follows behind us, carrying my bags as we navigate through the corridors. It's V22 we are in C Hall, I tell them. 
Luckily, I see a large bee painted on the wall. Down here, I instruct when my mother begins to turn the opposite way. I'm thankful that I only brought a few clothes, a blanket, and some of my favorite books along, so Noah doesn't have too much to carry, and I won't have too much to unpack. B22, my mother huffs. Her heels are outrageously high for the amount of walking we endure. At the end of a long hallway, I slide the key into the old wooden door, and when it creaks open my mother lets out a loud gasp. The room is small, with two single beds and two desks. After a moment, my eyes travel to the reason behind my mother's surprise, one side of the room, is covered in music posters of bands, that I've never heard of, the faces on them covered in piercings and their bodies with tattoos. And then there's the girl lying across one bed, and her bright red hair, eyes lined with what looks like inches of black liner, and arms covered in colorful tattoos. Hey, she says, offering a smile, a smile that I find quite intriguing, much to my surprise. I'm Steph. She sits up on her elbows, causing her cleavage to push tight against her laced up top, and I gently kick at Noah's shoe, when his eyes focus on her chest. H hey. I'm Tessa, I choke, all of my manners flying out the door. Hey, Tessa, nice to meet you. Welcome to WCU, where the dorms are tiny, and the parties are huge. The crimson-haired girl grins wider. Her head falls back into a fit of laughter as she takes in the three horrified expressions in front of her. My mother's jaw is wide open, practically on the carpet, and Noah shifts uncomfortably. Steph walks over, closing the gap between us, and wraps her thin arms around my body. I'm frozen for a moment, surprised by her affection, but I return her kind gesture. A knock sounds at the door just as Noah drops my bags onto the floor, and I can't help but hope that this is all some sort of joke. Come in, my new roommate yells. The door opens and two boys walk inside, before she finishes her greeting. Boys inside the female dorms on the first day? Maybe Washington Central was a bad decision. Or perhaps I could have found a way, to screen my roommate first. I assume by the pained expression covering my mother's face, that her thoughts have taken the same course. The poor woman looks like she might pass out any moment. Hey, you Steph's roomie, one of the boys asks. His blonde hair is styled straight up and there are sections of brown peeking through. His arms are scattered with tattoos, and the earrings in his ear are the size of a nickel. Um yes. My name is Tessa, I manage to say. I'm Nate. Don't look so nervous, he says with a smile, reaching out to touch my shoulder. You love it here. His expression is warm and inviting despite his harsh appearance. I'm ready, guys, Steph says, grabbing a heavy black bag from her bed. My eyes shift to the tall brown-haired boy leaning against the wall. His hair is a mop of thick waves on his head, pushed back off his forehead, and he has metal in his eyebrow and lip. My focus moves down his black t-shirt to his arms, which are also covered in tattoos. Not an inch of untouched skin is seen. Unlike Steph's and Nate's, his appear to be all black, gray, and white. He's tall, lean, and I know that I'm staring at him in the most impolite way, but I can't seem to look away. I expect him to introduce himself the way that his friend did, but he stays quiet, rolling his eyes in annoyance and pulling a cell phone from the pocket of his tight black jeans. He definitely isn't as friendly as Steph or Nate. He's more appealing, though, Something about him makes it hard to tear my eyes from his face. I'm vaguely aware of Noah's eyes on me as I finally look away, and pretend I was staring out of shock. Because that's what it is, right? See you around, Tessa, Nate says and the three of them exit the room. I let out a long breath. Calling the last few minutes uncomfortable would be an understatement. You're getting a new dorm, my mother roars, as soon as the door clicks shut. No, I can't. I sigh. It's fine, mother. I do my best to hide my nerves. I don't know how well this will work out either, but the last thing I want is my overbearing mother causing a scene on my first day of college. I'm sure she won't be around much at all anyway, I try to convince her, along with myself. Absolutely not. We are going to switch now. Her clean appearance clashes with the anger in her face. Her long blonde hair is flipped to one shoulder, yet every curl is still perfectly intact. 
You will not room with someone who allows men in like that, those punks, at that. I look into her gray eyes, then to Noah. Mother please, let's just see how it goes. Please, I beg. I can't begin to imagine the mess it would create trying to get a last minute dorm change. And how humiliating it would feel. My mother looks around to the room again, taking in the decor covering staff side, and huffs dramatically at the dark theme. Fine, she spits out, much to my surprise. But we're going to have a little talk before I go. Chapter 3. An hour later, after listening to my mother warn me against the dangers of parties and college men, and using some language that's rather uncomfortable for Noah and me to hear from her, she finally makes her move to leave. In her usual style, a quick hug and kiss, she exits the dorm room, informing Noah that she will wait for him in the car. I'll miss having you around every day, he says softly, and pulls me into his arms. I inhale his cologne, the one I bought him two Christmases in a row, and sigh. Some of the overpowering scent has worn off, and I realize that I'll miss this smell and the comfort and familiarity that go along with it, no matter how many times I complained about it in the past. I'll miss you too, but we can talk every day, I promise and tighten my arms around his torso and nuzzle into his neck. I wish you were here this year. Noah is only a few inches taller than me, but I like that he doesn't tower over me. My mother used to tease me growing up, claiming that a man grows an inch for every lie he tells. My father was a tall man, so I won't argue with her logic there. Noah brushes his lips across mine, and just then I hear a horn honking in the parking lot. Noah laughs and breaks away from me. Dear mom. She's persistent. He kisses me on the cheek and hurries out the door, yelling, call you tonight, as he goes. Left alone, I think about his hasty exit for just a moment, and then begin to unpack my bags. Shortly, half my clothes are neatly folded and stored in one of the small dressers, the remainder are hung neatly in my closet. I cringe at the sheer amount of leather and animal print filling the other closet. Still, my curiosity does get the best of me, and I find myself running my finger along a dress made of some sort of metal, and another that's so thin it's barely there at all. Feeling the beginnings of exhaustion from the day, I lie across the bed. An unfamiliar loneliness is creeping its way into me already, and it doesn't help that my roommate is gone no matter how uncomfortable her friends make me. I have a feeling she will be gone a lot, or, worse, she may have company over too often. Why couldn't I get a roommate who loved to read and study? I suppose it could be a good thing, because I will have the small room to myself, but I don't have a good feeling about any of this. So far college is neither what I had dreamed of nor expected. I remind myself that it's only been a few hours. Tomorrow will be better, it has to be. I gather my planner and textbooks, taking the time to write down my classes for the semester and my potential meetings for the literary club I plan on joining. I'm still undecided on that, but I read a few student testimonials and want to check it out. I want to try to find a group of like-minded people I can talk to. I don't expect to make a lot of friends, just enough that I can have someone to maybe eat a meal with every once in a while. I plan for a trip off campus tomorrow to get some more things for my dorm room. I don't want to crowd my side of the room the way that Steph has, but I would like to add a few things of my own to make me feel more at home in the unfamiliar space. The fact that I don't have a car yet will make it a little difficult. The sooner I get one, the better. I have enough money from graduation gifts and savings from my summer job at a bookstore, but I'm not sure if I want the stress of owning a car right now. The fact that I live on campus gives me full access to public transport, and I've already researched the bus lines. With thoughts of schedules, red-haired girls, and unfriendly men covered in tattoos, I drift asleep with my planner still in hand. The next morning staff is not in her bed. I would like to get to know her, but that might be difficult, if she's never around. Maybe one of the two boys that she was with was her boyfriend, for her sake, I hope it was the blonde one. Grabbing my toiletry bag, I make my way to the shower room. I can already tell that one of my least favorite things about dorm life is going to be the shower situation, I wish each of the rooms had their own bathrooms. It's awkward, but at least they won't be co-ed. Or I had assumed they wouldn't be, 
wouldn't everyone assume that? But when I reach the door, sure enough, there are two stick figures printed on the sign, one male and one female. Ugh. I can't believe they let this kind of thing happen. I can't believe I didn't uncover it while I was researching WCU. Spotting an open shower stall, I skirt through the half-naked boys and girls quickly, pull the curtain closed tight, and undress, then hang my clothes on the rack outside by blindly poking one hand out of the curtain. The shower takes too long to get warm, and the entire time I'm in there I'm paranoid that someone will pull back the thin curtains separating my naked body from the rest of the guys and girls out there. Everyone seems to be comfortable with half-naked bodies of both genders walking around, college life is strange so far, and it's only the second day. The shower stall is tiny, lined with a small rack, to hang my clothes on while I shower, and barely enough room to stretch my arms in front of me. I find my mind drifting to Noah and my life back home. Distracted, I turn around and my elbow knocks into the rack, knocking my clothes to the wet floor. The shower pours onto them, completely soaking them. You've got to be kidding me. I groan to myself, hastily cutting the water off and wrapping my towel around myself. I grab my pile of heavy, soaked clothes and rush down the hall, desperately hoping no one sees me. I reach my room and shove the key in, instantly relaxing when I push the door closed behind me. Until I turn around to see the rude, tattooed, brown-haired boy sprawled across Steph's bed. Chapter 4. Um, where's Steph? I try to sound authoritative, but my voice comes out as more of a squeak. My hands are clenched around the soft fabric of my towel, and my eyes keep darting down to make sure it's actually covering my naked body. The boy looks at me, the corners of his mouth lifting slightly, but doesn't say a word. Did you hear me? I ask you where Steph is, I repeat, trying to be slightly more polite this time. The expression on his face magnifies and he finally mumbles, I don't know, and turns on the small flat screen on Steph's dresser. What is he even doing in here? Doesn't he have his own room? I bide my tongue, trying to keep my rude comments to myself. Okay? Well, could you like leave or something, so I can get dressed? He hasn't even noticed I'm in a towel. Or maybe he has but it doesn't impress him. Don't flatter yourself, it's not like I'm going to look at you. He scoffs and rolls over, his hands covering his face. He has a thick English accent that I didn't notice at first. Probably because he was too rude to actually speak to me yesterday. Unsure how I should respond to his rude remark, I huff and walk to my dresser. Maybe he isn't straight, maybe that's what he meant by it's not like I'm going to look. Either that or he finds me unattractive. I hastily put on a bra and panties, followed by a plain white shirt and khaki shorts. Are you done yet? He asks, snapping the last bit of patience I held. Could you be any more disrespectful? I did nothing to you. What is your problem? I shout, much louder than I had wanted to, but by the surprised look on his face, my words had the intended effect. He silently stares at me for a moment. And while I wait for his apology he bursts into laughter. His laugh is deep and would be an almost lovely sound if he didn't come off so unpleasant. Dimples indent both of his cheeks as he continues on and I feel like a complete idiot, unsure what to do or say. I don't usually like conflict and this boy seems like the last person I should start a fight with. The door opens and Steph bursts in. Sorry I'm late. I have a hell of a hangover, she says dramatically, and her eyes dart back and forth between the two of us. Sorry, Tess, I forgot to tell you Hardin would be coming by. She shrugs apologetically. I would like to thank me, and Steph could make our living arrangement work, maybe even build some sort of a friendship, but with her choice of friends and late nights, I'm just not sure anymore. Your boyfriend is rude. The words tumble out before I can stop them. Steph looks over at the boy. And then they both burst into laughter. What is it with people laughing at me? It's getting really annoying. Hardin Scott is not my boyfriend, she spits out, nearly choking. Calming down, she turns and scowls at this Hardin. What did you say to her? Then, looking back at me, Hardin has a unique way of conversing. Lovely, so basically what she is saying is that Hardin is, simply, at his core, a rude person. 
The English boy shrugs and changes the channel with the remote in his hand. There is a party tonight. You should come with us, Tessa, she says. So now it's my turn to laugh. Parties aren't really my thing. Plus I have to go to get some things for my desk and walls. I look at Hardin, who, of course, is acting as if neither of us is in the room with him. Come on it's just one party. You're in college now, just one party won't hurt, she begs. Wait, how are you getting to the store? I thought you didn't have a car? I was going to take the bus. And besides, I can't go to a party, I don't even know anyone, I say, and Hardin laughs again, a subtle acknowledgement that he'll pay just enough attention to mock me. I was going to read and Skype with Noah. You don't want to take the bus on a Saturday. They're way too packed. Hardin can drop you on the way to his place, right, Hardin? And you'll know me at the party. Just come, please? She presses her hands together in a dramatic plea. I've only known her for a day. Should I trust her? My mother's warning about parties goes through my head. Steph seems quite sweet from the small interaction that I've had with her. But a party? I don't know, and, no, I don't want Hardin to drive me to the store, I say. Hardin rolls over across Steph's bed with an amused expression. Oh no. I was really looking forward to hanging out with you, he dryly replies, his voice so full of sarcasm that I want to throw a book at his curly head. Come on, Steph, you know this girl isn't going to show at the party, he says, laughing. His accent is so thick. The curious side of me, which I admit is quite large, is desperate to ask him where he is from. The competitive side of me wants to prove that smug face of his wrong. Actually, yeah, I'll come, I say with as sweet a smile as I can manage. It sounds like it might be fun. Hardin shakes his head in disbelief and Steph squeals, before wrapping her arms around me in a tight hug. Yay. We'll have so much fun, she shrieks. And a big part of me is practically praying that she'll be right. Chapter 5. I'm thankful when Hardin finally leaves, so Steph and I can discuss the party. I need more details to ease my nerves, and having him around is no help at all. Where is the party? Is it within walking distance? I ask her, trying to sound calm as I align my books neatly on the shelf. Technically, it's a frat party at one of the biggest frat houses here. Her mouth is wide open as she layers more mascara onto her lashes. It's off campus, so we won't be walking, but Nate will pick us up. I'm grateful it won't be Hardin, even though I know he will be there. Somehow riding with him seems unbearable. Why is he so rude? If anything, he should be grateful that I'm not judging him for the way he has destroyed his body with holes and tattoos. Okay, maybe I'm judging him a little, but not to his face. I'm at least polite about our differences. In my home, tattoos and piercings are not a normal thing. I always had to have my hair combed, my eyebrows plucked, and my clothes clean and ironed. It's just the way it is. Did you hear me? Steph says and interrupts my thoughts. I'm sorry what? I hadn't realized my mind had wandered to the rude boy. I said let's get ready, you can help me pick my outfit, she says. The dresses she picks out are so inappropriate that I keep looking around for a hidden camera and someone to jump out and tell me this is all a joke. I cringe at each one and she laughs, obviously finding my distaste humorous. The dress, no, piece of scrap material, she chooses is a black fishnet which lets her red bra show through. The only thing keeping her from showing her entire body is a solid black slip. The dress barely reaches the tops of her thighs and she keeps tugging the material up to reveal more leg, then back down to reveal more cleavage. The heels of her shoes are at least four inches tall. Her flaming red hair is pulled into a wild bun with curls escaping down to her shoulders, and her eyes are lined with blue and black liner, somehow even more eyeliner than she had on before. Do your tattoos hurt? I ask her as I pull out my favorite maroon dress. The first one sort of did, but not as bad as you would think. It's almost like a bee stinging you over and over, she says with a shrug. That sounds terrible, I tell her and she laughs. It occurs to me that she probably finds me as strange as I find her. That we're both unfamiliar with each other is oddly comforting. She gapes at my dress. You're not really wearing that, 
Are you? My hand slides over the fabric. This is my nicest dress, my favorite dress, and it's not like I really have all that many. What is wrong with my dress? I ask, trying to hide how offended I am. The maroon material is soft but sturdy, the same material business suits are made of. The collar goes up to my neck, and the sleeves are three-quarter length, hitting just under my elbows. Nothing it's just so long, she says. It's barely below my knee. I can tell if she can see I'm offended or not, but for some reason I don't want her to know this about me. It's pretty. I just think it's a little too formal for a party. You could borrow something of mine, she says in all sincerity. I cringe at the idea of trying to squeeze into one of her tiny dresses. Thanks, Steph. I'm fine wearing this, though, I say and plug in my curling iron. Chapter 6. Later, when my hair is perfectly curled and lying down my back, I push two bobby pins in, one on each side to keep it out of my face. Do you want to use some of my makeup? Steph asks, and I look in the mirror again. My eyes always look a little too large for my face, but I prefer to wear minimal makeup and usually just put on a little mascara and lip balm. Maybe a little eyeliner? I say, still unsure. With a smile, she hands me three pencils, one purple, one black, and one brown. I roll them around in my fingers, deciding between the black and brown. The purple will look great with your eyes, she says, and I smile, but shake my head. Your eyes are so unique, want to trade, she jokes. But Steph has beautiful green eyes, why would she even joke about trading with me? I take the black pencil and draw the thinnest possible line around both eyes, earning a proud smile from Steph. Her phone buzzes, and she grabs her purse. Nate's here, she says. I grab my purse, smooth my dress, and slip on my flat, white toms, which she eyes, but doesn't comment on. Nate is waiting out front of the building, heavy rock music blaring out of his car's roll-down windows. I can't help but glance around to see everyone staring. I keep my head down, and just as I look up, I see Hardin lean up in the front seat. He must have been bending down. Ugh. Ladies, Nate greets us. Hardin glares at me as I climb in behind Steph and end up getting stuck sitting directly behind him. You do know that we are going to a party, not a church, right, Teresa, he says, and I glance at the side mirror and find a smirk across his face. Please don't call me Teresa. I prefer Tessa, I warn him. How does he even know that's my name? Teresa reminds me of my father, and I would rather not hear it. Sure thing, Teresa. I lean back against my seat and roll my eyes. I choose not to banter back and forth with him. It's not worth my time. I stare out the window, trying to drown out the loud music as we drive. Finally, Nate parks on the side of a busy street lined with large, seemingly identical houses. Painted in black letters is the name of the fraternity, but I can't make out the words because of the overgrown vine sneaking up the side of the massive house in front of us. Messy strings of toilet paper sprawl up the white house, and the noise coming from inside adds to the stereotypical frat house theme. It's so big. How many people will be here? I gulp. The lawn is full of people holding red cups, some of them dancing, right there on the lawn. I'm way out of my league here. A full house, hurry up, Hardin responds and gets out of the car, slamming the car door behind him. From the back seat, I watch as multiple people high-five and shake Nate's hand, ignoring Hardin. What surprises me is that no one else that I see is covered in tattoos like he, Nate, and Steph are. Maybe I can make some friends here tonight after all. Coming? Steph says with a smile and pops open her door and hops out. I nod, mostly to myself, as I climb out of the car, making sure to smooth my dress again. Chapter 7. Hardin has already disappeared into the house, which is great, because maybe I won't see him again for the rest of the night. Considering the number of people crammed into this place, I probably won't. I follow Steph and Nate into the crowded living room, and am handed a red cup. I turn to decline with a polite no, thank you, but it's too late, and I don't have a clue who gave it to me. I put the cup on the counter, and continue to walk through the house with them. We stop walking when we reach a group of people crowded on and around a couch. 
I assume they are friends with Steph, given their appearance. They are all tattooed like her, and sitting in a row on the couch. Unfortunately, Hardin is on the right arm of the couch, but I avoid looking at him as Steph introduces me to the group. This is Tessa, my roommate. She just got here yesterday, so I figured I would show her a good time for her first weekend at WCU, she explains. One by one they nod, or smile at me. All of them seem so friendly, except Hardin, of course. A very attractive boy with olive-toned skin reaches out his hand and shakes mine. His hands are slightly cold from the drink he was holding, but his smile is warm. The light reflects off his mouth, and I think I spot a piece of metal on his tongue, but he closes his mouth too quickly for me to be sure. I'm Zed. What's your major? He asks me. I notice his eyes travel down my bulky dress, and he smiles a little, but doesn't say anything. I'm an English major, I say proudly, smiling. Hardin snorts but I ignore him. Awesome, he says. I'm into flowers. Zed laughs and I return one. Flowers? What does that even mean? Want a drink? He asks before I can inquire further about flowers. Oh, no. I don't drink, I tell him, and he tries to hide his smile. Leave it to Steph, to bring little Miss Pris to a party, a tiny girl with pink hair, says under her breath. I pretend not to hear her, so I can avoid any kind of confrontation. Miss Pris? I'm in no way prissy, but I have worked and studied hard to get where I am, and since my father left us my mother has worked her entire life to make sure I have a good future. I'm going to get some air, I say in turn to walk away. I need to avoid party drama at all costs. I don't need to make any enemies, when I don't have any friends to begin with. Do you want me to come with you? Steph calls after me. I shake my head and make my way to the door. I knew I shouldn't have come. I should be in my pajamas curled up with a novel right now. I could be Skyping with Noah, whom I miss terribly. Even sleeping would be better than sitting outside this dreadful party with a bunch of drunken strangers. I decide to text Noah. I walk to the edge of the yard, since it seems to be the least crowded space. I miss you. College isn't very fun so far. I hit send and sit on the stone wall waiting for his reply. A group of drunk girls walk by giggling and stumbling over their own feet. He responds quickly, why not? I miss you too, Tessa. I wish I was there with you, and I smile at his words. Shit, sorry, a male voice says, and a second later I feel cold liquid soak the front of my dress. The guy stumbles and pulls himself up to lean against the low wall. My bad, really, he mumbles and sits down. This party could not get any worse. First that girl called me prissy, and now my dress is soaked with god knows what type of alcohol, and it really smells. Sighing, I pick up my phone and walk inside to find a bathroom. I push my way through the crowded hall and try to open every door on the way, none of them budging. I try not to think about what people are doing in the rooms. I make my way upstairs and continue my hunt for a bathroom. Finally, one of the doors does open. Unfortunately, it's not a bathroom. It's a bedroom, and, even more unfortunate for me, it's one in which Hardin is lying across the bed, while the pink-haired girl straddles his lap, her mouth covering his. Chapter 8. The girl turns around and looks at me as I try to move my feet, but they just won't budge. Can I help you? She snarks. Hardin sits up with her still on his torso. His face is flat, not amused or embarrassed at all. He must do this type of thing all the time. He must be used to being caught in frat houses practically having sex with strange girls. Oh no. Sorry, I am looking for a bathroom, someone spilled a drink on me, I quickly explain. This is so uncomfortable. The girl presses her mouth against Hardin's neck, and I look away. These two seem to be a good match. Both tattooed, and both rude. Okay? So go find a bathroom. She rolls her eyes and I nod, leaving the room. After the door closes I lean my back against it. So far college isn't fun at all. I just can't wrap my head around how a party like this could be considered fun. Instead of trying to find a bathroom, I decide to find the kitchen and clean myself off there. The last thing I want to do 
is open another door and find drunken hormonal college students on top of one another. Again. The kitchen isn't too hard to find, but it's crowded, since most of the alcohol supply is in ice buckets on the counter, and stacks of pizza boxes fill the countertops. I have to reach around a brunette puking in the sink to grab a paper towel and wet it. As I wipe it over my dress, small white flakes of the cheap paper towel cover the wet spot, making it worse. Frustrated, I groan and lean against the counter. Having fun? Nate asks as he approaches me. I'm relieved to see a familiar face. He smiles sweetly and takes a sip of his drink. Not exactly how long do these parties usually last? All night and half the day tomorrow. He laughs and my mouth drops. When would Steph want to leave? Hopefully soon. Wait. I begin to panic. Who's going to drive us back to the dorm? I ask him, well aware of his bloodshot eyes. I don't know you can drive my car if you want, he says. That's really nice, but I can't drive your car. If I wreck or get pulled over with underage drinkers in the car I would get in so much trouble. I can just imagine my mother's face as she bails me out of jail. No, no, it's not a far drive, you should just take my car. You haven't even been drinking. If not, you'll have to stay here, or I could ask around to see if someone, no, it's fine. I'll figure it out, I manage before the music gets turned way up and most everything is drowned out by bass and lyrics that are practically screamed. My decision to come to this party is proving to be worse and worse as the night goes on. Chapter 9. Finally, after pointing around and yelling Steph, like ten times at Nate, the music drops into a quieter song, and he nods and starts to laugh. His hand moves up into the air, and he points into the next room. He is really a sweet guy, why does he hang out with Hardin? As I turn to where he indicated, all I hear is my own gasp as I spot her. She, along with two other girls, are dancing on a table in the living room. A drunk guy climbs up and joins them, his hands gripping her hips. I expect her to swat his hands off, but she just smiles and pushes her bottom against him. Okay. They're just dancing, Tessa, Nate says and gives a quick chuckle at my uneasy expression. But they aren't just dancing. They're groping and grinding against each other. Yeah, I know. I shrug, even though it isn't as casual to me. I've never danced that way, not even with Noah, and we have been dating two years. Noah. I reach into my purse and check my messages from him. You there, Tess? Hello? Do you okay? Tessa? Should I call your mom? I'm getting worried. I dial him as fast as my fingers will allow, praying that he hasn't called my mother yet. He doesn't pick up, but I text him assuring him that I'm okay and there is no need for him to call my mother. She will lose it if she thinks something happened to me on my first weekend of college. Hey Tessa. Steph slurs and leans her head on my shoulder. You having fun yet, Rumi? She giggles, obviously heavily intoxicated. I think I need the room is starting to spend, Tess I mean spin, she says, laughing, and her body lurches forward. She's going to get sick, I tell Nate. He nods and lifts her into his arms, draping her body over his shoulder. Follow me, he instructs and heads upstairs. He opens a door halfway down the hall, finding a bathroom quickly, of course. Right as he places her on the floor by the toilet, she begins to vomit. I look away, but grab her red hair and gently hold it back away from her face. Finally, after more vomit than I can handle seeing, she stops and Nate hands me a towel. Let's get her to the room across the hall and lay her on the bed. She's going to need to sleep it off, he says. I nod, but what I'm really thinking is that I can't leave her here alone, passed out. You can stay in there too, he says, seeming to read my mind. Together we get her up off the floor and help her walk across the hall and into a dark bedroom. We gently lay a groaning staff onto the bed and Nate quickly takes off telling me he'll check in on us later. I sit down on the bed next to Steph and make sure her head is comfortable. Sober, with a drunk girl beside me, and a party raging all around, I feel like I've hit a new low. I turn on the lamp and look around the room, my eyes immediately going to the bookshelves that cover one of the walls. Since this perks my mood up, I go over to it and scan through the titles. 
whoever owns this collection is impressive, there are many classics, a whole range of different types of books, including all of my favorites. Spying Wuthering Heights, I pull it off the shelf. It's in bad shape, the binding giving away, how many times it's been opened. I'm so lost in Emily Bront's words, that I don't even notice the change in light when the door opens, or the presence of a third person in the space. Why the hell are you in my room, an angry voice booms from behind me. I know that accent by now. Harden. I ask you what the hell you're doing in my room, he repeats, just as harshly as the first time. I turn to see his long legs pulling him toward me, and he snatches the book from my hand, and tosses it back onto the shelf. My mind is whirling. I thought the party couldn't get any worse, but here I am, caught in Hardin's personal place. He rudely clears his throat and waves his hand in front of my face. Nate told me to bring Steph in here my voice is soft, barely audible. He takes a step closer, and lets out a deep breath. I gesture to his bed, causing his eyes to follow my hand. She drank too much and Nate said, I heard you the first time. He runs his hand through his messy hair, clearly upset. Why does he care, so much if we are in his room? Wait you are a part of this fraternity? I ask him. It's impossible to hide the shock in my voice. Hardin is far from what I imagined a frat boy to be like. Yeah, so, he answers and takes yet another step closer. The space between us is less than two feet, and when I try to inch away from him my back hits the bookcase. Does that surprise you? Teresa? Stop calling me Teresa. He has me cornered. That's your name, isn't it? He smirks, his mood slightly lightening. I sigh and turn away from him, basically facing into the wall of books. I have no idea where I'm going, but I need to get away from Hardin, before I slap him. Or cry. It has been a long day, so I will most likely cry before. Slapping him. And what a sight that would be. I turn and push past him. She can't stay in here, he says as I pass. When I turn around he has this small ring in his lip between his teeth. What made him decide to put a hole in his lip and eyebrow? That had to be painful, though the one piece does accent just how full and round his lips are. Why not? I thought you guys were friends. We are, he says, but no one stays in my room. His arms cross over his chest, and for the first time, since I met him, I can make out the shape of one of his tattoos. It's a flower, printed in the middle of his covered forearm. Hardin, with a flower tattoo? The black and gray design resembles a rose from this distance, but there is something surrounding the flower that takes the beauty from it, adding darkness to the delicate form. Feeling brave and annoyed, I let out a laugh. Oh I see. So only girls who make out with you can come into your room? As the words leave my mouth his smile grows. That wasn't my room. But if you're trying to say you want to make out with me, sorry, you're not my type, he says. I'm not sure why, but his words hurt my feelings. Hardin is far from my type, but I would never actually say that to him. You or you or I can't find the words to express my annoyance toward him. The music through the wall is like an itching sensation. I'm embarrassed, annoyed and exhausted from the party. Arguing with him isn't worth it. Well then you take her to another room, and I'll find a way back to the dorms, I say and head for the door. As I go through it, and slam it shut behind me, even through the noise of the party, I hear Hardin's mocking good night, Teresa. Chapter 10. I can't help the tears that fall down my cheeks as I reach the top of the stairs. I hate college so far, and my classes haven't even started. Why couldn't I just get a roommate who was more like me? I should be asleep now, preparing for Monday. I don't belong at parties like this, and I certainly don't belong hanging out with these type of people. I do like Steph, but I just don't have it in me to deal with a scene like this in people like Hardin. He's such a mystery to me. Why must he always be such a jerk? But then the next thing I think of is that wall of books of his. Why does he have all of them? There is no way a rude disrespectful, tattooed jerk like Hardin could possibly enjoy those amazing works. The only thing I can picture him reading is the back of a beer bottle. Dabbing at my wet cheeks, I realize I have no idea where this house is located or how to get back to the dorms. 
The more I think about my decisions tonight, the more frustrated and stressed I become. I really should have thought this through. This is exactly why I plan everything, so things like this don't happen. The house is still packed and the music is too loud. Nate is nowhere to be found. Neither is said. Maybe. I should just find a random bedroom upstairs and sleep on the floor? There are at least 15 rooms up there, and maybe I will get lucky and find an empty one? Despite my efforts to conceal my emotions, I can't and I don't want to go down and have everyone see me like this. I turn back, find the bathroom I was in with Steph, and sit on the floor with my head between my knees. I call Noah again, and this time he answers on the second ring. Tess. It's late, are you okay? He says, his voice groggy. Yes. No. I went to a stupid party with my roommate, and now I am stuck at a frat house with nowhere to sleep, and no way to get back to my room, I sob through the line. I know my problem isn't life or death, but I'm beyond frustrated at myself for getting into this overwhelming situation. A party? With that redeed girl? He sounds surprised. Yeah, with Steph. But she's passed out upstairs. Whoa, why are you even hanging out with her? She's so just not someone you would ever hang around with, he says, and the scorn in his voice irritates me. I wanted him to tell me it will be okay, that tomorrow is a new day, something positive and encouraging. Something not so judgmental and harsh. That isn't the point, Noah I said with a sigh, but right then the door handle jingles, and I sit up. Just a minute. I call to the person outside and wipe up my eyes with some toilet paper, but that only smears the eyeliner even more. This is exactly why I don't wear this stuff. I will call you back. Someone needs the bathroom, I say to Noah, and hang up before he can protest. Whoever's on the other side of the door begins pounding on it, and I groan as I hurry to open it, wiping my eyes again. I said just a min, but I stop as glaring green eyes pour into mine. Chapter 11 As I look into those amazing green eyes, I suddenly realize that I hadn't previously noticed their color before. And then I realize that it's because Hardin hasn't really made eye contact with me until just now. Amazing, deep, surprised green eyes. Hardin looks away quickly when I push past him. He grabs my arm and pulls me back. Don't touch me. I yell, jerking my arm away. Have you been crying? He asks, his tone curious. If this wasn't Hardin, I might actually think he was concerned for me. Just leave me alone, Hardin. He moves in front of me, his tall frame blocking my movements. I can't take more of his games, not tonight. Hardin, please. I am begging you, if you have one decent bone in your body you will leave me be. Just save whatever mean comment you are going to say for tomorrow. Please. I don't care if he hears the embarrassment and desperation in my voice. I just need to be left alone by him. A flash of confusion shows in his eyes before he opens. His mouth. He watches me for a moment before any words come out. There's a room down the hall you can sleep in. It's where I put Steph he flatly states. I wait a second for him to say something else, but he doesn't. He just stares at me. Okay, I quietly say, and he moves out of my way. It's the third door on the left, he instructs and heads down the hall, and disappears into his bedroom. What the hell was that? Harding without any rude comments? I know I'm in for it, if I see him tomorrow. He's probably got a planner for all his snide comments like I do for my classwork, and I'm sure I'll be on his agenda tomorrow. The third room on the left is a plain room, much smaller than Hardin's, and with two twin beds. It looks more like a dorm room than the larger space that Hardin has. Maybe he's the leader or something? The more likely explanation is that everyone is afraid of him, and he bullied his way into the largest room. Steph is lying across the bed closest to the window, so I kick off my shoes and cover her with a blanket before locking the door and lying down on the other. My thoughts are all over the place as I fall asleep, and images of clouded roses and angry green eyes flow through my dreams. Chapter 12 When I wake, it takes my mind a moment to remember the events of last night that led me to this strange bedroom. Steph is still asleep, snoring unattractively with her mouth wide open. 
I decide to wait until I know how we are getting back to the dorms before waking her. I quickly put my shoes on, grab my purse, and step out. Should I knock on Hardin's door or try to find Nate? Is Nate even part of the frat? I would have never guessed that Hardin would be a part of an organized social group, so maybe Nate is too. Stepping over sleeping bodies in the hallway, I make my way downstairs. Nate? I call, hoping to hear a reply. There are at least 25 people sleeping in the living room alone. The floor is littered with red cups and trash, which makes it hard to navigate through the mess, but also makes me realize how clean the upstairs hallway actually was, despite the people there. When I reach the kitchen, I have to force myself not to start cleaning it up. This will take the whole house all day to clean up. I would love to see Hardin cleaning up all this trash, and as the thought goes through my head I giggle a little. What's so funny? I turn around and find Hardin entering the kitchen, a trash bag in his hand. He sweeps his arm over the countertop, making the cups fall into the trash bag. Nothing, I lie. Does Nate live here too? He ignores me and continues to clean. Does he? I ask again, more impatient this time. The sooner you tell me if Nate lives here, the sooner I can leave. Okay, now you have my attention. But, no, he doesn't live here. Does he seem like a frat boy to you? He smirks. No, but neither do you, I snap and his jaw tenses. He moves around me and opens the cabinet next to my hip, pulling out a roll of paper towels. Is there a bus that runs close to here? I ask, not expecting an answer. Yep, about a block away. I follow him around the kitchen. Could you tell me where it is? Sure. It's about a block away. The corners of his mouth lift, taunting me. I roll my eyes and walk out of the kitchen. Hardin's momentary civility last night was obviously a one-time thing and today he'll be coming at me full force. After the night I had, I can't stand to be around him. I go wake up Steph, who wakes up surprisingly easily, and smiles at me. I'm grateful that she's just as ready to get out of this damn fraternity house. Hardin said there is a bus stop around the block, I tell her as we walk downstairs together. We aren't taking the damn bus. One of these assholes will take us back to our room. He was probably just giving you a hard time, she says, her hand resting on my shoulder. As we enter the kitchen and find Hardin pulling some beer cans out of the oven, she's all authority. Hardin, you ready to take us back now? My head is pounding. Yeah, sure. Just give me a minute, he says like he's been waiting for us all along. During the drive back to the dorm Steph sings along to whatever metal song is playing through the speakers and Hardin rolls all the windows down, despite my polite requests to roll them up. Silent the whole way, he mindlessly drums his long fingers on the steering wheel. Not that I was paying attention. I'll come by later, Steph, he tells her as she climbs out of the passenger seat. She nods and waves as I open my door. Bye, Teresa, he says with a smirk. I roll my eyes and follow Steph into the dorm. Chapter 13. The rest of the weekend goes quickly and I manage to avoid seeing Hardin. When I head out early Sunday to go shopping, I leave before he can come to the room and I return after he's apparently left. The new clothes I get fill up my small dresser, but as I put them away Hardin's obnoxious voice plays in my head, you know we are going to a party, not church. I suspect he'd say the same about these new outfits, but I've decided that I am no longer going to be going to parties with Steph or anywhere that Hardin may be. He is in good company and bickering with him is exhausting. Finally it's Monday morning, my first day of college classes, and I couldn't be more prepared. I wake up extra early to make sure I can take a shower without boys around and not be rushed. My white button-up shirt and tan pleated skirt are perfectly ironed and ready to be put on. I get dressed, pin my hair, and put my bag over my shoulder. I'm about to leave, about 15 minutes early, to ensure that I won't be late, when Steph's alarm goes off. She hits the snooze button, but I wonder if I should I wake her. Her classes may start later than mine, or maybe she isn't planning on going. The idea of missing the first day of classes stresses me out, but she is a sophomore, so maybe she has it under control. With one last glance in the mirror, 
I head to my first class. Studying the campus map proves to have been a good idea, and I find my first building within 20 minutes. When I walk into my freshman history class the room is empty, save one person. Since this person obviously cares about being on time too, I sit next to him. He could be my first new friend. Where is everyone? I ask, and he smiles. His smile alone puts me at ease. Probably running across campus to barely make it here on time, he jokes, and I instantly like him. That's exactly what I was thinking. I'm Tessa Young, I say and give him a friendly smile. Landon Gibson, he says with an equally adorable smile as the first one. We spend the rest of the time before class talking. I find out that he's an English major, like me, and he has a girlfriend named Dakota. Landon doesn't mock me or miss a beat in our easy conversation when I tell him that Noah is a grade below me. I decide now that he is someone whom I would like to see more of. As the class begins to fill, Landon and I make a point to introduce ourselves to the professor. Afterward, as the day continues, I begin to regret taking five classes instead of four. I rush to my British literature elective, thanking God it's the last class of the day and barely make it on time. I am relieved when I see Landon sitting in the front row, the seat next to him empty. Hey again, he says with a smile as I sit down. The professor begins the class, handing out the syllabus for the semester and giving a brief introduction about himself, what led to him to become a professor, and his excitement for the topic. I love that college is different from high school, and the professors don't make you stand in front of the class and introduce yourself or do any other embarrassing and unnecessary things. In the middle of the professor explaining our reading lists, the door creaks open, and I hear myself groan as Hardin stumbles into the classroom. Great, I say under my breath sarcastically. Do you know Hardin? Landon asks. Hardin must have quite the reputation around the campus, if someone as sweet as Landon knows of him. Sort of. My roommate is friends with him. He's not my favorite person, I whisper. As I do so, Hardin's green eyes lock on mine, and I worry that he's heard me. What would he do if he had? But, honestly, I don't care if he did, it's not like he isn't aware that we don't care for each other. I find myself curious about what Landon knows about him, though, so I can't help but ask, do you know him? Yeah he's he stops talking and turns slightly to look behind us. I look up and see Hardin sliding into the desk next to me. Landon stays quiet for the rest of the class, keeping his eyes focused on the professor the entire time. That's all for today. I will see you all again on Wednesday, Professor Hill says and dismisses us. I think this will be my favorite class, I tell Landon as we walk outside, and he agrees. But his face falls when we realize Hardin is walking next to us. What do you want, Hardin? I ask, giving him a taste of his own medicine. It doesn't work, or I don't have the right tone for it, because all he seems is amused. Nothing. Nothing. I'm just so glad we have a class together, he says mockingly, and runs his hands through his hair, shaking it and pushing it up on his forehead. I notice an oddly shaped infinity symbol tattooed just above his wrist, and he lowers his hand as I try to study the surrounding ink. I'll see you later, Tessa, Landon says, excusing himself. You would find the lamest kid in class to befriend, Hardin says as he watches him go. Don't say that about him. He's a sweet guy. Unlike you. I'm shocked at my harsh words. He really brings out the worst in me. Hardin turns back to me. You're becoming more feisty with each chat we have, Teresa. If you call me Teresa one more time I warn and he laughs. I try to picture what he would look like without his tattoos and piercings. Even with him, he's very attractive, but his sour personality ruins him. We begin walking along back in the direction of my dorm and get about 20 steps, when all of a sudden he shouts out, stops staring at me, turns a corner, and disappears down a pathway, before I can even think of a response. Chapter 14. After several exhausting, but exciting, days, it's finally Friday, and my first week of college is almost over. Feeling pleased with the way the week has gone overall, I plan on just watching some movies, since Steph will most likely be at a party, and it'll be quiet. 
Having all my classes syllabi really makes things easier for me, and I can do a lot of the work ahead of time. I grab my bag and leave early, stopping by the cafe to grab a coffee to get an extra shot of energy for the beginning of the weekend. Tessa, right? A girl's voice says behind me as I wait in line. I turn around to find the pink-haired girl from the party. Molly, I think Steph called her. Yeah. That's me, I answer and turn to face the counter, attempting to avoid further conversation. Are you coming to the party tonight? She asks. She has to be mocking me, so, sighing, I turn around again, and I'm about to shake my head no when she says, you should, it's going to be awesome. She runs her tiny fingers over a large fairy tattooed on her forearm. I pause for a moment, but do shake my head and say, sorry, I have plans. Too bad. I know Zed wanted to see you. At that I can't help but laugh, but she only smiles. What? He was talking about you just yesterday. I doubt that, but even if he was, I have a boyfriend, I tell her, causing her smile to grow. Too bad. We could have double dated, she says ambiguously, and I inwardly thank God, when the barista calls my order. In my haste, I grab the cup too roughly, and a little bit of coffee laps over the edge and burns my hand. I curse, hoping that this isn't setting the tone for my weekend. Molly waves goodbye to me, and I smile politely, before I exit the shop. Her comments replay in my mind, double date with who? Her and Harden? Are they actually dating? As nice and attractive as said may be, Noah is my boyfriend, and I would never do anything to hurt him. I know that we haven't spoken much this week, but that's only because we have both been so busy. I'd make a mental note to call him tonight and catch up, see how he's been doing without me. After my coffee burn and awkward encounter with Miss Pink Hair, my day improves. Landon and I had made plans to start meeting at the coffee shop before the classes we have together, so he's leaning against the brick wall, and as I walk up to him, he greets me with a big smile. I'm leaving about 30 minutes into class today. I forgot to tell you that I'm flying back to my hometown for the weekend, he says. I'm happy for him to visit Dakota, but I hate the idea of sitting through British literature without him, and with Hardin, if he shows. He was absent Wednesday, not that I was paying attention. I turn to him. So soon, the semester just started. It's her birthday and I promised her months back that I would be there. He shrugs. In class, Hardin takes his seat next to me, but doesn't say a word, not even when, as promised, Landon leaves 30 minutes into class, which suddenly makes me even more aware of Hardin's presence beside me. Monday we begin our week-long discussion of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, Professor Hill announces as class ends. I don't hide my excitement, and I'm fairly sure that I just let out a squeal. I have read that novel at least 10 times, and it's one of my favorites. Although he hadn't really said anything to me all during class, Hardin walks up close beside me. I swear I could almost predict what he's going to say with that deadpan look in his eyes. Let me guess, you are just madly in love with Mr. Darcy. Every woman who has read the novel is, I say without meeting his eyes. We reach the intersection and I look both ways, before crossing the street. Of course you do, he laughs, continuing to follow me along the busy sidewalk. I'm sure you aren't able to comprehend Mr. Darcy's appeal. My mind goes to the massive collection of novels in Hardin's room. They couldn't possibly be his. Could they? A man who is rude and intolerable being made into. A romantic hero? It's ridiculous. If Elizabeth had any sense, she would have told him to fuck off from the beginning. I laugh at his choice of words, but cover my mouth, stopping myself. I was actually enjoying our little banter and his presence, but it would only be a matter of time, three minutes, if I'm so lucky, until he says something hurtful. Looking up, I meet his dimpled grin and can't help but admire his good looks. Piercings and all. So you do agree that Elizabeth is an idiot? He raises his eyebrow. No, she's one of the strongest, most complex characters ever written, I say in her defense, using the words from one of my favorite movies. He laughs again, and I join him. But after a few seconds, catching himself having a decent laugh with me, he stops suddenly, and his laughter fades. Something flashes in his eyes. 
I'll see you around, Teresa, he says and turns on his heel and disappears back where we come from. What is with him? Before I can begin to analyze his actions, my phone rings. Noah's name flashes across my screen, and I feel oddly guilty as I answer. Hey, Tess, I was going to text you back, but I figured I might as well call. Noah's voice is clipped, a bit distant. What are you doing? You sound busy. No, just on my way to meet some friends at the grill, he explains. Okay, well, I won't keep you. I'm so glad it's Friday. I am ready for the weekend. Are you going to another party? Your mom is still disappointed. Wait, why did he mention it to my mother? I love that he has a close relationship with her, but sometimes dating him is like having an annoying little brother who tattles on me. I hate to compare him that way, but it's true. Rather than getting into it with him, I just tell him, no, I'm staying in this weekend. I miss you. I miss you too, Tess. So much. Call me later, okay? I agree and we exchange I love yous before hanging up. When I get back to my room, Steph is getting ready for another party, which I assume is the one Molly mentioned at the cafe. I log into Netflix and browse the movies. I really wish you would come. I swear we won't stay overnight this time. Just come for a little bit. Watching movies alone in this small room will be hell. Steph whines, and I laugh. She continues to beg me, while she teases her hair and changes into three different outfits, before deciding on a green dress, that leaves very little to the imagination. The crisp color looks really good with her bright red hair, I have to admit. I envy her confidence. I'm confident to a certain extent, but I'm aware that my hips and breasts are larger than most women my age. I tend to wear clothes that hide my large bust, while she tries to draw as much attention as possible to hers. I know I say, humoring her. But then my laptop screen turns black, and I press the power button and wait and wait. The black screen remains. See? It's a sign that you should come. My laptop's at Nate's apartment, so you can't use mine. She smirks and teases her hair again. Looking at her, I realize I really don't want to sit in the dorm alone without anything to do or watch. Fine, I say, and she jumps up and down, clapping her hands. But we're leaving before midnight. Chapter 15 I change out of my pajamas and put on a new pair of jeans that I haven't worn yet. They are a little tighter than my usual pants, but I'm in desperate need of a trip to the laundry room, so I don't have much of a choice. My shirt is a simple black button-up, sleeveless shirt with lace trim on the shoulders. Wow, I actually like your outfit a lot, Steph tells me. I smile and she tries to offer me eyeliner again. Not this time, I tell her, remembering how it's smeared from my tears last time. Why did I agree to go back to that frat house again? Okay. Molly is picking us up instead of Nate. She just texted that she'll be here any minute. I don't think she likes me, I say as I check myself out in the mirror. Steph cocks her head to one side. What? She does. She's just bitchy and too honest sometimes. And I think she is intimidated by you. Intimidated? By me? Why on earth would she be intimidated by me? I say and laugh. Steph clearly has this backward. I think just because you're so different from us, she says and smiles. I know I'm different from them, but to me, they are the different ones. Don't worry about her, though. She'll be occupied tonight. By Harden? I ask before I can stop myself. I continue to look at the mirror, but I can't help but notice the way she is looking at me with one eyebrow raised. No, by Zed probably. She changes guys every week. That's a harsh thing to say about a friend, but she just smiles and adjusts her top. She isn't dating Hardin? The image of them making out on the bed comes to mind. No way. Hardin doesn't date. He fucks with a lot of girls, but he doesn't date anyone. Ever. Oh, is all I managed to say. The party tonight is the same as last week. The lawn and house are crowded with drunk people everywhere. Why didn't I just stay in and stare at my ceiling? Molly disappears as soon as we arrive, and I end up getting a spot on the couch, and I'm sitting there for at least an hour when Hardin walks by. You look different, he says after a short pause. 
His eyes rake down my body and back up to rest on my face. He doesn't even try to be subtle about the way he's assessing me. I stay silent until his eyes meet mine. Your clothes actually fit you tonight. I roll my eyes and adjust my shirt, suddenly wishing I was wearing my normal loose clothing. It's a surprise to see you here. I'm a bit surprised that I ended up here again, I say and walk away from him. He doesn't follow, but for some reason I find myself wishing he would have. A few hours later, Steph is drunk again. Well, as much as everyone else is. Let's play truth or dare, said slurs and their small group of friends gather around the couch. Molly passes a bottle of clear alcohol to Nate, and he takes a swig. Hardin's hand is so large that it covers his entire red cup as he takes a sip. Another punk-looking girl joins the game, making it Hardin, said, Nate, Nate's roommate Tristan, Molly, Steph, and the new girl. I'm just thinking that a drunken game of truth or dare can possibly end well, when Molly says with a wicked smile, you should play too, Tessa. No, I'd rather not, I tell her, and focus my attention on a brown stain on the carpet. To actually play, she would have to stop being a prude for five minutes, Hardin tells them, and they all laugh except Steph. His words anger me. I am not a prude. Yeah, I will admit I'm not by any means wild, but I'm not some cloistered nun. I glare at Hardin and sit down cross-legged in their little circle, between Nate and another girl. Hardin laughs and whispers something to Zed before they start. The first few truths and dares include Zed being dared to chug an entire can of beer, Molly being dared to flash her bare chest to the group, which she does, and Steph revealing the truth that her nipples are pierced. Truth or dare, Teresa? Hardin asks and I gulp. Truth? I squeak. He laughs and mutters, of course, but I ignore him as Nate rubs his hands together. Okay. Are you a virgin? Zed asks, and I choke. No one seems fazed by the intrusive question besides me. I feel the heat in my cheeks and the humor in everyone's faces. Well? Hardin presses. Despite how much I want to run away and hide, I just nod. Of course I'm a virgin. The furthest Noah and I have gone is making out in some slight groping over our clothes, of course. Still, no one seems outright surprised by my answer, just intrigued. So you have been dating Noah for two years, and you haven't had sex? Steph asks, and I shift uncomfortably. I just shake my head. Hardin's turn, I say quickly, hoping to take the attention off myself. Chapter 16. Dare, Hardin answers before I even ask him. His green eyes bore through me with an intensity that says I'm the one on the spot, that I'm the one dare to do something. And I falter, not having really thought this out or expecting to be met with such a reaction. What should I dare him to do? I know he will do whatever it is, just. Because he won't want to back down from me. I hm. I dare you to do what? He says impatiently. I almost dare him to say something nice about each person in the group, but I decide against it, however amusing it would have been. Take your shirt off and keep it off the entire game. Molly yells out, and I'm glad. Not because Hardin will be taking his shirt off, of course, but because I couldn't think of anything, and it eases the pressure of my having to give him orders. How juvenile, he complains, but he lifts his shirt over his head. Without meaning to, my eyes go directly to his long torso, and the way the black tattoo ink stretches across his surprisingly tan skin. Under the birds on his chest, he has a large tree inked onto the skin of his stomach. The branches are bare and haunting. His upper arms have many more tattoos than I expected. Small, seemingly random images and icons are scattered along his shoulders and hips. Steph nudges me, and I tear my eyes away from him, praying that no one saw me staring. The game continues. Molly kisses Tristan and said both. Steph tells us about her first time having sex. Nate kisses the other girl. How did I find myself in the middle of this group of hormonal college recandral misfits? Tessa, truth or dare? Tristan asks. Why even ask? We know she will say truth, Hardin starts. Dare, I say, surprising them and myself. Hmm Tessa, I dare you to take a shot of vodka, Tristan says, smiling. 
I don't drink. That's the point of the dare. Look, if you don't want to do it Nate starts to say, and I look over at Hardin and Molly sharing a laugh at my expense. Fine, one shot, I say. I think Hardin will probably have yet another contemptuous expression at this, but when his eyes meet mine, I find he's giving me a strange look instead. Someone hands me the clear bottle of vodka. I mistakenly put my nose against the top, smelling the foul liquid, which burns my nostrils. I scrunch my nose, trying to ignore the chuckles behind me. I try not to think of all the mouths that have been on the bottle before me, and I just tilt it back and take a drink. The vodka feels hot and burns all the way down to my stomach, but I manage to swallow it. It tastes horrible. The group claps and laughs a little, everyone except Hardin. If I didn't know him any better, I would think he was mad or disappointed. He is so strange. After a short time, I can feel the heat in my cheeks and then, later, the small amount of alcohol in my veins that grows with each round that I am dared to take another shot. I oblige, and I have to admit I feel pretty relaxed for once. I feel good. With this feeling, everything seems a little easier. The people around me all seem a little more fun than before. Same dare, said says with a laugh and takes a swig from the bottle, before handing it to me for the fifth time. I don't even remember the dares and truths that have been happening around me for the last few rounds. This time I take two big drinks of the vodka before it's ripped from my grasp. I think you've had enough, Hardin says and hands the bottle to Nate, who takes a drink. Who the hell is Hardin Scott, to tell me when I have had enough? Everyone else is still drinking, so I can too. I grab the bottle back from Nate and take a drink again, making sure to give Hardin a smirk as the bottle touches my lips. I can't believe you have never been drunk before, Tessa. It's fun, right? Said asks and I giggle. Thoughts of my mother's lectures on irresponsibility flood my mind, but I push them back. It's only one night. Hardin, truth or dare? Molly asks. He answers dare, of course. I dare you to kiss Tessa, she says and gives him a fake smile. Hardin's eyes go wide, and though the alcohol is making everything more exciting, I really just want to run away from him. No, I have a boyfriend, I say making everyone laugh at me for the hundredth time tonight. Why am I even hanging around these people who keep laughing at me? So? It's just a dare. Just do it, Molly says, pressuring me. No, I'm not kissing anyone, I snap and stand up. Without looking at me, Hardin just takes a drink from his cup. I hope he's offended. Actually, I don't care if he is. I'm through interacting with him like this. He hates me and is just too rude. As I get to my feet, the full effect of the alcohol hits me. I stumble but manage to pull myself together and walk away from the group. Somehow I find the front door through the crowd. As soon as I'm outside, the fall breeze hits me. I close my eyes and breathe in the fresh air before going to sit on the familiar stone wall. Before I realize what I am doing, my phone is in my hands, dialing Noah. Hello, he says. The familiarity of his voice and the vodka in my system make me miss him more. Hey babe, I say and bring my knees to my chest. A beat of silence passes. Tessa, are you drunk? His voice is full of judgment. I shouldn't have called him. No of course not, I lie and hang up the phone. I press my finger down on the power button. I don't want him to call back. He's ruining the good feeling from the vodka, worse than even Hardin did. I stumble back inside, ignoring whistles and crude comments from drunk frat guys. I grab a bottle of brown liquor off the counter in the kitchen and take a drink, too big of a drink. It tastes worse than the vodka, and my throat feels like it's on fire. My hands fumble for a cup of anything to get the taste out of my mouth. I end up opening the cabinet and using a real glass to pour some water from the sink. It helps the burn a little, but not much. Through a break in the crowd, I see that the group of my friends are still sitting in a circle playing there. Stupid game. Are they my friends? I don't think they are. They only want me around so they can laugh at my inexperience. How dare Molly tell Hardin to kiss me, she knows that I have a boyfriend. Unlike her, I don't go around making out with everyone. I've kissed only two boys in my life, Noah and Johnny, 
a freckle-faced kid in third grade who kicked me in the shin afterward. Would Hardin have gone along with Adair? I doubt it. His lips are so pink and full, and my head plays an image of Hardin leaning over to kiss me, and my pulse begins to race. What the hell? Why am I thinking about him like that? I am never drinking again. Minutes later, the room begins to spin, and I feel dizzy. My feet lead me upstairs to the bathroom, and I sit in front of the toilet, expecting to throw up. Nothing happens. I groan and pull myself up. I am ready to go back to the dorms, but I know Steph won't be ready for hours. I shouldn't have come here. Again. Before I can stop myself, my hand is turning the knob on the only room I'm somewhat familiar with in this oversized house. Hardin's bedroom door opens without a problem. He claims to always lock his door, but he's proving otherwise. It looks the same as before, only this time the room is moving around beneath my unsteady feet. Wuthering Heights is missing from where it was on the shelf, but I find it on the bedside table, next to Pride and Prejudice. Hardin's comments about the novel replay in my mind. He has obviously read it before, and understood it, which is rare for our age group, and for a boy especially. Maybe he had to read it for class before, that's why. But why is this copy of Wuthering Heights out? I grab it, and sit on the bed, opening the book halfway through. My eyes scan the pages and the room stops spinning. I'm so lost in the world of Catherine and Heathcliff, that when the door opens, I don't hear it. What part of no one comes into my room did you not understand? Hardin booms. His angry expression scares me, but somehow humors me at the same time. Sorry. I get out, he spits, and I glare at him. The vodka is still fresh in my system, too fresh to let Hardin yell at me. You don't have to be such a jerk. My voice comes out much louder than I had intended. You're in my room, again, after I told you not to be. So get out, he yells, stepping closer to me. And with Hardin looming in front of me, mad, seething with scorn, and making it seem like I'm the worst person on earth to him, something inside me snaps. Any composure I had snaps in half, and I ask the question that's been at the front of my brain without my wanting to acknowledge it. Why don't you like me? I demand, staring up at him. It's a fair question, but, to be honest, I don't really think my already wounded ego can take the answer. Chapter 17. Hardin glares at me. It's aggressive. But unsure. Why are you asking me this? I don't know, because I have been nothing but nice to you, and you've been nothing but rude to me. And then I add, and here I actually thought at one point we could be friends, which sounds so stupid, that I pinch the bridge of my nose with my fingers, while I wait for his answer. Us. Friends. He laughs and throws up his hands. Isn't it obvious why we can't be friends? Not to me. Well, for starters you're too uptight, you probably grew up in some perfect little model home that looks like every other house on the block. Your parents probably bought you everything you ever asked for, and you never had to want for anything. With your stupid pleated skirts, I mean, honestly, who dresses like that at 18? My mouth falls open. You know nothing about me. You condescending jerk. My life is nothing like that. My alcoholic dad left us when I was 10, and my mother worked her ass off to make sure I could go to college. I got my own job as soon I turned 16 to help with bills, and I happen to like my clothes, sorry if I don't dress like a slut like all the girls around you. For someone who tries too hard to stand out and be different, you sure are judgmental about people who are different from you. I scream and feel the tears well up in my eyes. I turn around, so he won't get to remember me like this, and I notice that he's bowling his fists. Like he gets to be angry about this. Do you know what, I don't want to be friends with you anyway, Hardin, I tell him, and reach for the door handle. The vodka, which had made me brave, is also making me feel the sadness of this situation, of our yelling. Where are you going, he asks. So unpredictable so moody, to the bus stop, so I can go back to my room and never, ever come back here again. I am done trying to be friends with any of you. It's too late to take the bus alone. I spin around to face him. You are not seriously trying to act like you care, if something happened to me. I laugh. I can't keep up with his changes in tone. 
I'm not saying I do I'm just warning you. It's a bad idea. Well, Hardin, I don't have any other options. Everyone is drunk, including myself. And then the tears come. I am beyond humiliated that Hardin, of all people, is seeing me cry. Again. Do you always cry at parties? He asks and ducks his head a little, but with a small smile. Apparently, whenever you're at them. And since these are the only ones I've ever been to I reach the door again and open it. Teresa, he says so soft, that I almost don't hear him. His face is unreadable. The room starts to spin again, and I grab onto the dresser next to his door. You okay? He asks. I not even though I feel nauseous. Why? Don't you just sit down for a few minutes, then you can go to the bus station. I thought no one was allowed in your room, I state, then sit on the floor. I hiccup and he immediately warns, if you throw up in my room I think I just need some water, I say and move to stand up. Here, he says, putting a hand on my shoulder to keep me down, and handing me his red cup. I roll my eyes, and push it away. I said water, not beer. It is water. I don't drink, he says. A noise somewhere between a gasp and a laugh escapes me. There is no way Hardin doesn't drink. Hilarious. You're not going to sit here and babysit, are you? I really just want to be alone in my pathetic state, and my buzz is wearing off, so I'm starting to feel guilty for yelling at Hardin. You bring out the worst in me, I murmur aloud, not quite meaning to. That's harsh, he says, his tone serious. And yes, I am going to sit here and babysit you. You are drunk for the first time in your life, and you have a habit of touching my things when I'm not around. He goes and takes a seat on his bed, kicking his legs up. I get up and grab the cup of water. Taking a big drink, I can taste a hint of mint on the rim, and can't help but think about how Hardin's mouth would taste. But then the water hits the alcohol in my stomach, and I don't feel so hot. God, I am never drinking again, I remind myself as I sit back down on the floor. After a few minutes of silence Hardin finally speaks up. Can I ask you a question? The look on his face tells me I should say no, but the room's still not feeling entirely solid, and I think maybe talking will help me focus, so I say, sure. What do you want to do after college? I look up at him with new eyes. That is literally the last thing I thought he would ask. I assumed he would ask why I'm a virgin, or why I don't drink. Well, I want to be an author or a publisher, whichever comes first. I probably shouldn't be honest with him. He will just make fun of me. But when he doesn't say anything back, I start feeling brave and ask him the same question, earning an eye roll from him but no answer. Finally I ask, are those your books, even though it's probably futile. They are, he mumbles. Which is your favorite? I don't play favorites. I sigh and pick at a small fray on my jeans. Does Mr. Rogers know you're at a party again? Mr. Rogers? I look back up at him. I don't get it. Your boyfriend. He is the biggest tool I have ever seen. Don't talk about him like that, he is he is nice, I stutter. When Hardin laughs, I stand up. He doesn't know no at all. You could only dream of being as nice as he is, I say sharply. Nice? That's the first word that comes to your mind when talking about your boyfriend. Nice is your nice way of calling him boring. You don't know him. Well, I know that he's boring. I could tell by his cardigan and loafers. Hardin's head rolls back in laughter and I can't ignore his dimples. He doesn't wear loafers, I say, but have to cover my mouth, so I don't laugh with him at my boyfriend's expense. I grab the water and take another drink. Well, he has been dating you for two years and hasn't fucked you yet, so I would say he is a square. I spit the water back into the cup. What the hell did you just say? Just when I think we can get along he says something like that. You heard me, Teresa. His smile is cruel. You're an asshole, Hardin, I growl and throw the half-empty cup at him. His reaction is exactly what I hoped for, complete shock. While he wipes water off his face, I stagger to my feet using the bookshelf for leverage. A couple of books fall to the ground, but I ignore all that and storm out of the room. I stumble downstairs and push my way through the crowd into the kitchen. The anger I feel has overcome my nausea, and all I want 
is to get Hardin's evil smirk out of my head. I spot Zed's black hair through the crowd in the other room and go to where he's sitting with a cute preppy boy. Hey, Tessa, this is my friend Logan, Zed says, introducing us. Logan smiles at me and offers the bottle he's holding. Want some? He asks and passes it to me. The familiar burn feels good. It ignites my body again, and I momentarily forget about Hardin. Have you seen Steph? I ask, but Zed shakes his head. I think she and Tristan may have left. She left? What the hell? I should care more, but the vodka skews my judgment and I find myself thinking she and Tristan would make a cute couple. A couple of drinks later, I feel amazing. This must be why people drink all the time. I vaguely remember having sworn off alcohol at some point tonight, but it's not so bad. Fifteen minutes later, Zed and Logan have me laughing so hard that my stomach hurts. They are much better company than Hardin. You know Hardin is a real ass, I tell them, which elicits wide grins from them both. Yeah, he can be sometimes, Zed says and snakes his arm around me. I want to move it, but I don't want to make it awkward, because I know he doesn't mean anything by it. Soon the crowd starts to die down, and I start to feel tired. It dawns on me that I have no way to get back to the dorms. Do the buses run all night? I slur. Zed shrugs, and just then Hardin's mop of curls appears in front of me. You and Zed then? His voice is thick with an emotion that I can't quite register. I get up and push past him, but he grabs my arm. He has no boundaries. Let go of me, Hardin. Looking for another cup to toss in his face, I say, I'm just trying to find out about the bus. Chill out it's 3 a.m. There is no bus. Your newfound alcoholic lifestyle has you stuck here again. The glee in his eyes when he says this is so mocking that it makes me want to smack him. Unless you want to go home with Zed, when he lets go of my arm, I do go back to the couch with Zed and Logan because I know it will irritate him. After standing there and nodding for a moment, he turns in a huff. Hoping that that same room from last weekend is empty, I tell Zed to take me upstairs so we can find it. Chapter 18. We find the room. Unfortunately one of the beds is occupied by a snoring, pass it out guy. At least that bed is empty. Zed says and laughs. I'm going to walk back to my place if you want to come. I have a couch you could sleep on he says. Cutting through the haze, to try to think clearly for a second, I conclude that Zed, like Hardin, hooks up with a lot of different girls. If I agree to this, it could mean I am offering to kiss him well. I have a feeling with those good looks it's easy for Zed to get girls to do more than kiss. I think I will just stay here in case Steph comes back, I say. His face falls a little, but he gives me an understanding smile. He tells me to be careful, and gives me a hug goodbye. The door closes as he leaves, and I can't help but lock it. Who knows who will come in? I look over at the comatose snore and feel secure that he isn't waking up anytime soon. The tiredness I felt downstairs has somehow faded, my mind going back to Hardin and his comment about how Noah hasn't slept with me yet. It may seem strange to Hardin, who's with a different girl every weekend, but Noah is a gentleman. We don't need to have sex. We have fun together doing other things like while well, we go to the movies and go for walks. With that in mind, I lie down, but quickly find myself staring at the ceiling, counting the tiles in an attempt to go to sleep. Occasionally the drunk guy wrestles around on the other bed, but eventually my eyes close and I begin to drift off. I haven't seen you around here before, a deep voice suddenly slurs in my ear. I jump up and his head bumps my chin, causing me to bite my tongue. His hand is on the bed, inches away from my thighs. His breathing is ragged and smells like vomit and liquor. What's your name, cutie, he breathes, and I gag. I lift one thin arm up to push him away from me, but it doesn't work, and he just laughs. I'm not going to hurt you, we're just going to have some fun, he says and licks his lips, leaving a string of saliva down his chin. My stomach turns and the only thing I can think to do is to knee him, hard, hard and right there. He grabs his crotch and stumbles back, giving me my chance to bolt. Once my shaky fingers finally open the lock, I rush out into the hallway 
where several people give me odd stares. Come on, come back here. I hear the disgusting voice say, not too far behind me. Strangely, nobody seems fazed by a girl being chased down the hall. He is only a few feet away, but fortunately is so drunk he keeps stumbling into the wall. My feet acted their own accord, taking me down the hall to the only place I know in this damn fraternity house. Harden. Harden, please open the door. I yell, one hand banging on the door and one trying to twist the locked doorknob. Harden. I scream again, and the door flies open. I don't know what made me come to his room of all places, but I would take Harden's judgmentalism over the drunk guy trying to have his way with me any day. Tess? Harden asks, seeming confused. He wipes his eyes with his hand. He is wearing only black boxer briefs, and his hair is jetting out all over his head. Weirdly, I am more surprised by how good he looks than by the fact he called me Tess for once instead of Teresa. Harden, please can I come in? This guy I say, and look behind me. Harden pushes past me, and looks down the hall. His eyes meet my stalker, and the creep changes from scary to frightened. He looks at me one more time, before turning around and walking back down the hall. Do you know him? My voice is shaky and small. Yeah, get inside, he says and pulls me by my arm into his room. I can't help, but note the way his muscles move under his inked skin as he walks to his bed. His back has no tattoos on it, which is a little strange since his chest, arms, and stomach are covered. He rubs his eyes again. Are you okay? His voice is raspier than ever from just being woken up. Yeah, yes. I'm sorry for coming here and waking you up. I just didn't know what, don't worry about it. Hardin's hand runs through his messy hair and he sighs. Did he touch you? He asks, without any trace of sarcasm or humor. No, he tried, though. I was stupid enough to lock myself in a room with a drunk stranger, so I suppose it's my fault. The idea of that creep touching me makes me want to cry, again. It's not your fault that he did that. You aren't used to this type of situation. His voice is kind and totally the opposite of his usual tone. I walk across the room toward his bed, silently asking him for permission. He pats the bed and I sit down with my hands in my lap. I have no plans on getting used to it. This really is the last time I'm coming here, or to any parties, for that matter. I don't know why I even tried. And that guy he was just so don't cry, Tess, Hardin whispers. And the funny thing is, I hadn't realized I was. Hardin brings his hand up, and I almost flinch away, but not before the pat of his thumb captures the tear from my cheek. My lips part in surprise from his gentle touch. Who is this guy, and where is this snarky, rude Hardin? I look up to meet his green eyes and his pupils dilate. I hadn't noticed how gray your eyes are, he says, so low that I lean closer to hear him. His hand is still on my face, and my mind is racing. Pulling half of his bottom lip in his mouth, he takes his lip ring between his teeth. Our eyes meet, and I look down unsure of what's going on. But when he removes his hand, I look at his lips once more, and I can feel my conscience and my hormones battling. But my conscience loses, and I crash my lips against his, catching him totally off guard. Chapter 19. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I can't stop. As my lips touch Hardin's I feel his sharp intake of breath. Hardin's mouth tastes just like I had imagined. I can taste the faint hint of mint on his tongue as he opens his mouth and kisses me. Really kisses me. His warm tongue runs along mine, and I can feel the cold metal of his lip ring on the corner of my mouth. My entire body feels like it's been ignited. I have never felt like this before. He brings his hand to my face, cupping my flushed cheeks, before both of his hands go to my hips. He pulls back a little, and plants a small kiss on my lips. Tess, he breathes out, then quickly brings his mouth back to mine, his tongue sliding in once more. My mind is no longer in charge, the sensation has taken over every inch of me. Hardin pulls me by my hips closer to him as he lies back on the bed, never breaking our kiss. Unsure of what to do with my hands, I put them against his chest, and then climb onto his torso. His skin is hot, and his chest is moving up and down with his rapid breaths. 
He pulls his mouth away from mine, and I whimper at the loss of contact, but before I can complain he's at my neck. I feel every swipe, and lick his tongue makes. His breath moves across me. He grabs hold of my hair, to keep my head just above his as he continues to kiss my neck. His teeth graze my collarbone and I moan, the feeling shooting down my whole body, when he begins gently sucking on my skin. I would be embarrassed, if I wasn't so intoxicated, by Hardin and the alcohol. Sorry for what, he says and walks over to his dresser. He pulls out a black shirt, and pulls it over his head. My eyes go down to his boxers again, and they are noticeably tighter in the front. I flush and look away. For kissing you I say, though something in me really doesn't want to apologize for that. I don't know why I did it. It was just a kiss. People kiss all the time, I hear him say. His words hurt my feelings for some reason. Not that I care, if he didn't feel what I did what did I feel? I know I don't actually like him. I am just drunk, and he is attractive. It has been a long night, and the alcohol made me kiss him. Somewhere in the back of my mind I fight down the thoughts, of how much I wanted it to happen again. He was just being so nice, that's why. Can we not make a big deal of it, then? I ask. I would be humiliated, if he told anyone. This isn't me. I don't get drunk, and I don't cheat on my boyfriend at parties. Trust me, I don't want anyone to know about this either. Now, stop talking about it, he snaps. And there's his arrogance again. So now you're back to your old self, I see. I never was anyone else, don't think because you kissed me, basically against my will, we have some sort of bond now. Ouch. Against his will? I can still feel the way his hand gripped my hair, the way he pulled me on top of him, and the way his lips mouthed Tess before kissing me again. I shoot up off the bed. You could have stopped me. Hardly, he scoffs and I feel like crying again. He makes me too emotional. It's too humiliating, too painful how he's basically saying I forced him to kiss me. I bury my head in my hands for a moment and head for the door. You can stay in here tonight since you have nowhere else to go, he says quietly, but I shake my head. I don't want to be anywhere near him. This is all part of his little game. He will offer to let me stay in his room, so I'll think he is a decent person, then he will probably draw some vulgar design on my forehead. No, thanks, I say and walk out. When I reach the stairs, I think I hear him call my name, but I keep going. Outside, the cool breeze feels wonderful against my skin, I sit on the familiar stone wall, and turn my phone back on. It's almost 4 a.m. I should be waking up in an hour, to get an early shower and start studying. Instead I'm sitting on this broken stone wall, alone and in the dark. With a few stragglers milling about, and unsure what to do, I pull out my phone and scroll through the text messages from Noah and my mother. Of course he told her. It's what he would do, but I can't even be upset with him. I just cheated on him. What would give me the right, chapter 20. A block away from the frat house, the streets are dark and quiet. The other frat houses aren't as big as Hardin's. After an hour and a half of walking and psopsising, I finally reach the campus. Fully sober and figuring that I might as well stay awake, I stop at the 7-Eleven and grab a cup. As the caffeine hits me, I realize that there are so many things I don't understand about Hardin. Like, why is he in a fraternity with a bunch of preppy rich kids, if he is punk, and why does he go from hot to cold so quickly? It's all academic musing, though, since I don't know why I even bother to waste my time thinking about him, and after tonight I am beyond done trying to be friendly with him. I can't believe I kissed him. That was the biggest possible mistake I could have made, and the second I let my guard down he attacked, worse than ever. I'm not stupid enough to trust that he won't tell anyone, but I hope his embarrassment over kissing the virgin will keep him quiet. I will deny it until the grave if anyone asks. I need to come up with a good explanation for my mother and Noah for my behavior tonight. Not the kissing, they will never know about that, but that I was at a party. Again. But I also really need to have a talk with Noah about telling my mother things. If I'm an adult now, she doesn't need to know what I'm doing all the time. By the time I reach my dorm, my legs and feet hurt, and I actually sigh in relief as I turn the knob. 
but then I nearly have a heart attack at the sight of Harden sitting on my bed. You've got to be kidding me. I half scream when I finally regain my composure. Where were you? He asks calmly. I drove around trying to find you for almost two hours. What? What? Why? As in, if he was going to do that, why didn't he just offer to take me home earlier? More importantly, why didn't I ask him to, as soon as I found out he hadn't been drinking? I just don't think it's a good idea for you to be walking around at night, alone. And because I can no longer read his expressions, and because staff is walk knows where, and I'm alone here with him, the person who seems to be the real danger to me, all I can do is laugh. It's a wild laugh, ragged and not really me. And it's definitely not because I find this funny, but because I'm too drained to do anything else. Harden furrows his brows, frowning at me, which only makes me laugh harder. Get out, Harden just get out. Harden looks at me and runs his hands through his hair. Which is at least something, in the little time that I have known this frustrating man that is Harden Scott, I have learned that he does that when he is either stressed or uncomfortable. Right now I hope it's both. Teresa, I'm he begins, but his words are cut off by a terrible pounding on the door, and screaming. Teresa. Teresa Young, you open this door. My mother. It's my mother. At 6 a.m., when a boy is in my room. Immediately I spring into action, as I always do when faced with her anger. Oh my god, Harden, get in the closet, I whisper hiss and grab his arm, yanking him up off the bed, and surprising us both with my strength. He looks down at me, amused. I am not hiding in the closet. You're 18. He says it, and I know he's right, but he doesn't. No my mother. I groan in frustration, and she pounds again. The defiance with which his arms are crossed over his chest tells me I'm not moving him, so I check the mirror, wiping at the bags under my eyes, and grab my toothpaste, smearing a little on my tongue, to conceal the smell of vodka even beyond my coffee breath. Maybe all three cents will confuse her nose or something. I'm already with a pleasant face and greeting on my lips, when I open the door, but it's then that I see my mother hasn't come alone. Noah is standing at her side, of course he is. She looks furious. And he looks concerned? Hurt? Hey. What are you guys doing here? I say to them, but my mother pushes by me, and goes straight for Hardin. Noah slips silently into the room, letting her take the lead. So this is why you haven't been answering your phone? Because you have this this, she waves her arms around in his direction. Tattoo troublemaker in your room at 6 a.m. My blood boils. I am usually timid, and sort of afraid, when it comes to her. She has never hit me, or anything but she isn't shy, when it comes to pointing out my mistakes, you weren't wearing that, are you, Tessa? You should have brushed your hair again, Tessa. I think you could have done better than that on your tests, Tessa. She always puts, so much pressure on me to be perfect all the time, it's exhausting. For his part, Noah just stands there glaring at Hardin, and I want to scream at both of them, actually at all three of them. My mother for treating me like a child. Noah for telling on me. And Hardin for just being Hardin. Is this what you do in college, young lady? Do you stay up all night, and bring boys back to your room? Poor Noah was worried sick about you, and we drive all this way to find you running around with these strangers, she says, and Noah and I both gasp. Actually, I just got here. And she wasn't doing anything wrong, Hardin says, and I am shocked. He has no idea what he is up against. Still, he's an immovable object, she's an unstoppable force. Maybe this would be a good fight. My subconscious tempts me to grab a bag of popcorn and sit down in the front row to watch. My mother's face gets mean. Excuse me? I certainly was not speaking to you. I don't even know what someone like you is doing hanging around my daughter anyway. Hardin absorbs the blow mutely, and just remains standing and staring at her. Mother, I say through my teeth. I'm not sure why I'm defending Hardin, but I am. Maybe part of it is that she sounds a bit too much like how I treated Hardin when I first met him myself. Noah looks at me, then at Hardin and back to me again. Can he tell that I just kissed Hardin? The memory is fresh in my mind and makes my skin tingle just thinking about it. Tessa, you are out of control. 
I can smell the liquor on you from here, and I can only assume that this is the influence of your lovely roommate and him, she says, punctuating it with an accusing finger. I am 18, mother. I had never drank before, and I didn't do anything wrong. I am just doing what every other college student is doing. I'm sorry that my cell phone battery died and that you drove all the way here, but I'm fine. Suddenly exhausted from the last few hours, I sit down at my desk chair after my speech and she sighs. Seeing my resignation gives my mother a calmer demeanor somehow. She's not a monster, after all. Turning to Hardin, she says, young man, could you leave us for a minute? Hardin looks at me, as if asking if I will be okay. I nod and he nods back and walks out of the room. Noah swiftly closes the door behind him, his eyes trailing Hardin all the while. It's a strange sensation, Hardin and I together against my mother and my boyfriend. Somehow I know he'll be waiting somewhere just outside the door until they leave. For the next 20 minutes, my mother sits on my bed and explains that she is just worried about me ruining my chance at an amazing education and doesn't want me to drink again. She also tells me that she doesn't approve of my friendship with Steph, Hardin, or anyone else in their group. She makes me promise that I will stop hanging around with them, and I agree. After tonight, I don't want to be around Hardin anyway, and I won't be going to any more parties with Steph, so there's no way my mother will know if I am friendly with her or not. Finally, she stands up and claps her hands together. Since we are already here, let's go get some breakfast and maybe do some shopping. I nod in agreement, and Noah smiles from where he's leaning on my door. It does sound like a good idea, and I am starving. My thoughts are still a little stifled by alcohol and tiredness, but my walk home, the coffee, and my mother's lecture have sobered me. I head for the door, but stop when my mother coughs. You'll need to clean up a little and change, of course. She smiles her condescending smile. I go get some clean clothes out of my dresser and change in the closet. I touch up last night's makeup and am ready to go. Noah opens the door for us, and we all three look at where Hardin is sitting on the floor, leaning against the door across the hall. When he looks up, Noah grasps my hand, tightly, protectively. Still, I find myself wanting to pull my hand away from him. What is wrong with me? We are going to go into town, I tell Hardin. In response, Hardin nods several times, like he's answered some question deep within himself. And for the first time he looks vulnerable, and maybe a little hurt. He humiliated you, my subconscious reminds me. Which is true, but I can't help feeling guilty as Noah pulls me along past Hardin, and my mother gives Hardin a victory smile, causing him to look away. I really don't like that guy, Noah says and I nod. Me either, I whisper. But I know I'm lying. Chapter 21. Breakfast with Noah and my mother is agonizingly slow. My mother continues to bring up my wild night and finds every opportunity to ask me if I am tired or hungover. Granted, last night was very out of character for me, but I don't really need to hear about it over and over. Has she always been this way? I know she just wants the best for me but she seems to be worse now that I'm in college. Or maybe being away from her for a week has given me a newfound outlook on her. Where should we shop? Noah asks between mouthfuls of pancake, and I shrug. I wish he had just come alone. I would love to spend time with him. I do need to have a talk with him about not telling my mother every detail of my life, especially the bad, and if we were just alone, that would be easier too. Maybe we should go to the mall around the block, I'm not really familiar with the area yet, I tell them, cutting the last few bites of my French toast into pieces. Have you thought about where you want to work yet? Noah asks. I'm not sure yet. A bookstore maybe? I wish I could find an internship or something related to publishing or writing, I tell them, which elicits from my mother an award-winning proud smile. That would be great, somewhere you could work until you finish college and that could then hire you full-time, she says, smiling again. I try to hide my sarcasm with yeah, that would be ideal, but Noah catches it and grabs my hand to give it a little conspiratorial squeeze under the table. As I put my fork into my mouth, the metal reminds me of Hardin's lip ring. And I pause for a moment. Noah catches this too, 
and looks at me with questioning eyes. I need to stop thinking about Hardin. Now. I smile at Noah and pull his hand up to kiss it. After breakfast my mother drives us to the Benton Mall, which is huge and crowded. I am going to go into Nordstrom's, so I'll call you when I am ready, she tells us, to my relief. Noah takes my hand again, and we browse through a bunch of stores. He tells me about his soccer game on Friday, and how he shot the winning goal. I listen intently, and tell him how great it all sounds. You look nice today, I tell him and he smiles. His perfect white smile is adorable. He is wearing a maroon cardigan, khakis, and dress shoes. Yes, he really does wear loafers, but they are cute, and somehow fit his personality. You do too, Tessa, he says and I cringe. I know I look like hell, but he's too unfalteringly kind to tell me so. Unlike Hardin, who would tell me in a heartbeat. Ugh, Hardin. Desperately wanting to get my mind off Mr. Rude, I pull Noah into me by the neck of his cardigan. When I go to kiss him, he smiles but pulls away. What are you doing, Tessa? Everyone's staring at us. He gestures toward a group of adults trying on sunglasses at a kiosk. I shrug playfully. No, they aren't. And so what? I really don't care. Usually I would, but I need him to kiss. Me. Just kiss me please, I practically beg. He must see the desperation in my eyes, because he tilts my chin up and kisses me. It's gentle and slow, no urgency behind it. His tongue barely touches mine but it's nice. Familiar and warm. I wait for a fire to ignite within me, but it doesn't. I can't compare Noah to Hardin. Noah is my boyfriend, whom I love, and Hardin is a jerk who has a roster of girls he hooks up with. What's gotten into you? Noah teases as I try to pull his body against mine. I flush and shake my head. Nothing, I just missed you, that's all, I tell him. Oh and I cheated on you last night, my subconscious adds. Ignoring that, I say, but, Noah, could you please stop telling my mother when I do things? It makes me really uncomfortable. I love that you are close to her, but I feel like a child, when you basically tell on me. It feels good to get that off my chest. Tessa, I am so sorry. I was just worried about you. I promise I won't do it again. Honestly. He wraps his arm around my shoulder and kisses my forehead, and I believe him. The rest of the day is better than the morning, mostly because my mother takes me to a salon and I get my hair trimmed and some layers added into it. It still hangs down my back, but with my new cut it has more volume and looks much better. Noah showers me with compliments the entire drive back to my dorm, and everything just feels right. I say goodbye to them at the front door, once again promising to stay away from anyone with a tattoo, and within a hundred mile radius. When I walk into my dorm room, I feel a tinge of disappointment to find it empty, but I'm not sure if I was hoping to see Steph or someone else. I don't even bother taking my shoes off before I lie in my bed. I'm too exhausted and in need of sleep. I sleep the night away, and don't wake up until noon. When I wake up, Steph's asleep in her bed. I go study for the rest of Sunday, and when I return she's gone. Monday morning she's still not back, and I start feeling a strong urge to catch up on what she was doing all weekend. Chapter 22, before heading to my first class, I stop to grab my usual at the coffee house, where Landon is waiting for me with a smile. After our hellos, we're interrupted by a girl asking for intricate directions, and so we don't get the chance to catch up until we're walking to our last class of the day. The class that all day I have been dreading, but anticipating. How was your weekend? Landon asks and I groan. Terrible, actually. I went to another party with Steph, I tell him, and he makes a sour face and laughs. I'm sure yours was much better. How's Dakota? His smile grows at the mention of her name, and I realize that I didn't mention seeing Noah on Saturday. Landon tells me about Dakota applying to a ballet company in New York and how happy he is for her. All the while, I wonder if Noah's eyes light up like that when he talks about me. As we walk into class, he's telling me how his father and stepmother were thrilled to see him, but I find myself searching the room and not listening very closely to him. Hardin's seat is empty. Won't it be hard, 
If Dakota is gone so far? I manage to ask as we take our seats. Well, we are already far from each other now, but it works. I really just want the best for her, and if New York is it, that's where I want her to be. The professor walks in, silencing us. Where's Hardin? He wouldn't skip class just to avoid me, would he? We dive into Pride and Prejudice, a magical book that I wish everyone would read, and before I realize it the class is over. You've cut your hair, Teresa. I turn around to see Hardin smiling behind me. He and Landon exchange awkward stares, and I try to think of what to say. He wouldn't mention the kiss in front of Landon, would he? Those dimples, deep as ever, tell me that yes, yes he would. Hey, Hardin, I say. How was your weekend? His expression is so smug. I pull Landon by the arm. Good. Well, see you around. I yell nervously and Hardin laughs. When we're outside, Landon asks, what was that about, obviously catching on to my strange behavior. Nothing, I just don't like Hardin. At least you don't have to see him often. But there is something behind his voice, and why would he say that? Does he know about the kiss? Um yeah. Thank God, is all I can muster. He pauses. I wasn't going to say anything, because I don't want you to associate me with him, but, he smiles nervously, Hardin's dad is sort of dating my mom. What? What? Hardin's dad, yes, yes, I got that, but Hardin's dad lives here? Why is Hardin here, I thought he was British? If his dad lives here, why doesn't he live with him? I flood Landon with questions, before I can stop myself. He looks confused, but less nervous than a moment ago. He's from London. His dad and my mom live close to the campus, but Hardin and his dad don't have a good relationship. So please don't mention any of this to him. We already don't like each other. I nod. Sure, okay. A thousand more questions come to my mind, but I stay quiet as my friend goes back to talking about Dakota, his eyes brightening with each word about her. When I get back to my room, Steph isn't back, yet since her classes run two hours past mine. I start to lay out my books and notes to get ready to study, but decide to call Noah instead. He doesn't pick up, and it really makes me wish he was here with me at college. It would make things so much easier and comfortable. We could be studying or watching a movie together right now. Still, I know that I'm thinking about this because of. My guilt about kissing Hardin is consuming me, Noah is so sweet, and he doesn't deserve to be cheated on. I am so lucky to have him in my life. He's always there for me, and he knows me better than anyone. We have known each other basically our whole lives. When his parents moved in down the street, I was ecstatic to have someone my age to hang out with, and the feeling only grew as I got to know him and learned he was an old soul like me. We spent our time reading, watching movies, and bringing life into the greenhouse behind my mother's place. The greenhouse has always been my safe haven. When my dad drank I would hide in there, and no one except Noah knew where to find me. The night my dad left was a terrible night for me, and my mother refuses to speak of it, ever. Doing so would shatter the perfect facade she has created for herself, but I still want to talk about it sometimes. Even though I hated him for drinking so much and for pushing my mother around, I still felt a deep need to have a father. That night, stowed away in the greenhouse, while my dad screamed and went wild, I kept hearing glasses shattering in the kitchen, and then, when it stopped, footsteps. I was terrified my father was coming for me, but it was Noah. And I had never been so relieved in all my life to see someone safe. From that day on we were inseparable. Over the years, our friendship turned into more, and neither of us has ever dated anyone else. I text Noah that I love him and decide to take a catnap before I begin my studies. I pull out my planner and check my work one more time, I can surely fit in a 20-minute nap. Not even 10 minutes into my nap, there's a knock at the door. Figuring Steph must have forgotten her key, I groggily pull the door open. Of course it isn't her. It's Hardin. Steph isn't back yet, I say and walk back to my bed, leaving the door open for him. I'm a little surprised he even bothered to knock, since I know Steph gave him an extra key as backup for herself. I will have to talk to her about that. 
I can wait, he says and plops down on Steph's bed. Suit yourself. I groan, ignoring his chuckle as I pull the blanket over my body and close my eyes. Or rather, trying to ignore it. There is no way I am going to be able to sleep knowing that Hardin is in my room, but I would rather pretend sleep than face the awkward, rude talk we are bound to have. I try to ignore the sound of him gently tapping the headboard of her bed until my alarm goes off. Going somewhere, he asks and I roll my eyes, even though he can't see me. No, I was taking a 20-minute nap, I tell him and sit up. You set an alarm to make sure your nap is only 20 minutes, he says, amused. Yeah, I do. So what's it to you, anyway? I grab my books and lay them out neatly, in order of my class schedule and stack the notes for each class on top of them. Are you OCD or something? No, Hardin. Not everyone's crazy because they just like things a certain way. There's nothing wrong with being organized, I snap. And he laughs, of course. I refuse to look at him, but out of the corner of my eye, I can see him pushing up off the bed. Please don't come over here. Please don't come, and then he's standing over me looking down at where I sit on my bed. He grabs my literature notes and turns them over a couple of times exaggeratedly like he's staring at a rare artifact. I reach up for them but, like the annoying jerk he is, he lifts them higher, so I stand and swipe at them. But he tosses them in the air and they fall to the ground in a scattered mess. Pick those up. I demand. He smirks and says, okay, okay, but just grabs my sociology notes and does the same thing to them. I scramble to pick them up before he steps on them, but that's only funny to him. Hardin, stop. I yell, just as he does the same with the next stack. Infuriated, I stand up and shove him away from my bed. You mean, someone doesn't like their stuff being messed with, he asks, still laughing. Why must he always laugh at me? No. I don't. I yell and go to shove him again. He steps toward me, and grabs my wrists, pushing me back against the wall. His face is inches from mine, and suddenly I'm aware I'm breathing way too hard. I want to scream at him to get off me, to let me go, and demand that he put my work back. I want to slap him, to make him leave. But I can't. I'm frozen against the wall and mesmerized by his green eyes burning into mine. Hard and please are the only words I finally find. But they are soft. And I'm not sure if I am begging him to let me go, or kiss me. My breathing still hasn't slowed. I can feel his increasing, the way his chest rises powerfully. Seconds feel like hours, and finally he removes one hand from my wrists, but the other is large enough to hold both. For a second, I think he might slap me. But his hand moves up to my cheekbone, and then he gently tucks my hair behind my ear. I swear I can hear his pulse as he brings his lips to mine, and the fire crackles under my skin. This is what I have been longing for since Saturday night. If I could only feel one thing for the rest of my life, this would be it. I don't let myself think about why I am kissing him again, or what terrible thing he will say afterward. All I want to focus on is the way he presses his body against mine, when he lets go of my wrists, pinning me to the wall, and the way his mouth tastes like mint again. The way my tongue somehow follows his, and the way my hands slide over his broad shoulders. His hands grip the backs of my thighs, and he lifts me up, my legs instinctively wrapping around his waist, and I'm amazed at the way my body somehow knows how to respond to him. I bury my fingers in his hair, gently tugging at it, while he walks back toward my bed, his lips still molded to mine. The responsible voice inside my head finds her way. In reminding me that this is a terrible idea, but I push her back. I am not stopping this time. I pull Hardin's hair harder, earning a moan from him. The sound elicits one of my own, the two mixing in the most heavenly way. It is the hottest sound I have ever heard, and I want to do anything I can to hear it again. He sits back on my bed, pulling me so I'm on his lap. His long fingers dig into my skin, but the pain is wonderful. My body begins gently rocking back and forth on his lap, and his grip tightens. Fuck, he breathes into my mouth, and I experience a sensation I have never felt before as I feel him harden against me. How far will I let this go? I ask myself, but I don't have an answer. 
His hands find the hem of my shirt, and he tugs at it, pulling it up. I can't believe I'm letting him, but I don't want to stop. He pulls away from our heated kiss to get the shirt over my head. His eyes meet mine, then go down to my chest as he takes his lip between his teeth. You're so sexy, Tess. The idea of dirty talk never appealed to me, but somehow hard in saying those words becomes the most sensual thing I have ever heard. I never buy any fancy underwear because no one, literally no one, ever sees them, but right now I wish I had something besides this plain black bra. He's probably seen every type of bra there is, the annoying voice in my head reminds me. To try to get such thoughts out of my head, I rock harder against his lap, and he wraps his arms around my back and pulls my body to his, our chests touching the door handle jingles. I push myself off Hardin's lap and throw my shirt on, the trance I was in immediately broken. Steph steps through the door and stops short when she sees me and Hardin. As she takes in the scene before her, her mouth forms and oh I know my cheeks are bright red, not only from the embarrassment, but from the way Hardin has made me feel. What the hell did I miss, she gasps, staring at us both with a huge grin. I swear her eyes are practically clapping with glee. Nothing much Hardin says and stands. He walks to the door and doesn't look back as he walks out of the room, where I'm left panting and Steph laughing. What the actual hell was that? She asks me and then covers her face in mock horror. But she's too excited by the gossip and pops back quickly. You and Hardin you and Hardin are like messing around? I turn and pretend to look through the stuff on my desk. No. No way. We aren't messing around I tell her. Are we? No, we just happened to kiss, twice. And he took my shirt off, and I was basically humping him but we aren't messing around, like regularly. I have a boyfriend, remember? She comes over to face me. So that doesn't mean you can't mess around with Hardin, I just can't believe it. I thought you guys hated each other. Well, Hardin hates everyone. But I thought he hated you even more than his normal hatred for people, she says, then laughs. When did this even how did this happen? I sit on her bed and run my fingers through my hair. I don't know. Well, Saturday when you left the party I ended up in his room because this creep tried to hit on me and then I kissed Hardin. We promised to never speak of it again, but then he came by today and he started messing with me, not in that way. I point at the bed, which only makes her smirk grow. Like he was throwing my stuff around, and I pushed him, and then somehow we ended up on the bed. It sounds so bad as I repeat it. I really am acting so out of character, just like my mother said. I put my hands over my face. How could I do this to Noah, again? Whoa, that sounds hot, Steph says, and I roll my eyes. It's not, it's terrible and wrong. I love Noah and Hardin is a jerk. I don't want to be another conquest of his. You could learn a lot from Hardin you know sexually. My mouth falls open. Is she serious? Is that something she would do wait, has she? Her and Hardin? No way, I don't want to learn anything from Hardin. Or anyone besides Noah, I tell her. I can't imagine Noah and I making out like that. My mind replays Hardin's words, you're so sexy, Tess. Noah would never say something like that, no one has ever called me sexy before. I feel my cheeks heat up as I think about it. Have you? I ask a little sheepishly. With Hardin? No. And something inside me feels better when she says that. But then she continues. Well I haven't had sex with him, but we had a little fling when we first met, as embarrassing as that is to admit. But nothing came from it, we were sort of friends with benefits for about a week. She says it like it's no big deal, but I can't help the jealousy that stirs inside me. Oh benefits? I ask. My mouth is completely dry, and I find myself suddenly annoyed by Steph. Yeah, nothing too big. Just like a few heavy makeout sessions, a grope here and there. Nothing serious, she says and my chest hurts. I'm not surprised really, but I wish I wouldn't have asked. Does Hardin have a lot of friends with benefits? I don't want to hear the answer, but I can't help asking. She snorts and sits down on her bed across from me. Yeah, he does. I mean, not like hundreds, but he's a pretty active guy. I can tell she's seen how I reacted, 
and is trying to sugarcoat it for my sake. I make the mental decision for what feels like the hundredth time to stay away from him. I will not be anyone's friends with benefits. Ever. He doesn't do it to be mean or use girls, they pretty much throw themselves at him, and he lets them know from the start that he doesn't date, she says. I remember her telling me that before. But it's not like he said that to me, when we why doesn't he date? Why can't I stop asking these questions? I don't know, really listen, she says, her voice full of concern, I think you could have a lot of fun with. Harden, but I also think this could be dangerous for you. Unless you know you will never develop any sort of feelings for him, I would stay away. I have seen a lot of girls fall for him, and it's not pretty. Oh, trust me, I do not have feelings for him. I don't know what I was thinking. I laugh, and hope that it at least sounds genuine. Steph nods. Good. So, how much trouble did you get into with your mom and Noah? I tell her all about my mother's lecture, minus the part about me promising not to be friends with her anymore. We spend the rest of the night talking about classes, Tristan, and anything I can think of besides Harden. Chapter 23. The next day Landon and I meet at the coffee house before class to compare notes for sociology. It took me an hour to get all my notes in order after Hardin's annoying stunt yesterday. I want to tell Landon about it, but I don't want him to think badly of me, especially now that I know about his mom and Hardin's dad. Landon must know a ton about Hardin, and I have to keep reminding myself not to ask questions about him. Besides, I don't care what Hardin does. The day flies by and finally it's time for literature. Per usual, Hardin is in the seat next to mine, but today he doesn't seem inclined to look my way at all. Today will be our last day on Pride and Prejudice, the professor informs us. I hope you all have enjoyed it, and since you've all read the ending, it feels fitting to base today's discussion on Austin's use of foreshadowing. Let me ask, as a reader, did you expect her and Darcy to become a couple in the end? Several people murmur or randomly flip through their books like it'll provide an immediate answer for them, but only Landon and I raise our hands, as always. Miss Young, the professor calls on me. Well, the first time I read the novel, I was on the edge of my seat, about whether or not they would end up together. Even now, and I have read it at least ten times, I still feel anxious during the beginning of their relationship. Mr. Darcy is so cruel, and says such hateful things about Elizabeth and her family, that I never know if she can forgive him, let alone love him. Landon nods at my answer, and I smile. That's a load, a voice cuts through the stillness. Hardin's voice. Mr. Scott? Would you like to add something? The professor asks, clearly surprised at Hardin's participation. Sure. I said that's a load. Women want what they can't have. Mr. Darcy's rude attitude is what drew Elizabeth to him, so it was obvious they would end up together, Hardin says, then picks at his fingernails, as if he isn't the slightest bit interested in the discussion. That isn't true, about women wanting what they can't have. Mr. Darcy was only mean to her, because he was too proud to admit he loved her. Once he stopped his hateful act, she saw that he really loved her, I say, much louder than I intended. Much louder. I look around the room and find everyone is staring at me and Hardin. Hardin exhales. I don't know what kind of guys you normally go for, but I think that, if he loved her, he wouldn't have been mean to her. The only reason he even ended up asking for her hand in marriage was because she wouldn't stop throwing herself at him, he says with emphasis, and my heart drops. But finally we're getting at what he's really thinking. She did not throw herself at him. He manipulated her into thinking he was kind and took advantage of her weakness. I scream, and then the room really, truly goes silent. Hardin's face is flushed with anger, and I can't imagine mine looks much different. He manipulated her? Try again, she is I mean, she was so bored with her boring life that she had to find excitement somewhere, so she certainly was throwing herself at him, he yells back, his hand gripping the desk. Well, maybe if he wasn't such a memoir, he could have stopped it after the first time instead of showing up to her room. After the words leave my mouth, I know that we've been exposed, and snickers and gasps are heard throughout the room. Okay, lively discussion. I think that's probably enough on that topic for today the professor begins, 
but I grab my bag and run out of the room. From somewhere behind me in the halls, I hear Hardin's angry voice yell, you don't get to run this time, Teresa. I get outside, and am crossing the green lawn, about to reach the corner of the block, when he grabs my arm, and I jerk away. Why do you always touch me like that? Grab my arm again, and I will slap you. I scream. I surprise myself at my harsh words, but I've had enough of his crap. He grabs my arm again, but I can't manage to follow through on my promise. What do you want, Hardin? To tell me how desperate I am? To laugh at me for letting you get to me again? I am so sick of this game with you, I won't play it any longer. I have a boyfriend who loves me, and you are a terrible person. You really should see a doctor, and get some medication for your mood swings. I can't keep up with you. One second you're nice, then you're hateful. I want nothing to do with you, so do yourself a favor and find another girl to play your games, because I'm done. I really do bring out the worst in you, don't I? He asks. I turn away, and attempt to shift my focus to the busy sidewalk next to us. A few confused students' eyes linger on Hardin and me for a beat too long. When I face him again, he's running his fingers across a small hole at the bottom of his worn black t-shirt. I expect him to be smiling or laughing, but he's not. If I didn't know any better I would think he was hurt. But I do know better, and I know he couldn't care less. I'm not trying to play games with you, he says and runs his hand over his head. Then what are you doing? Because your mood swings give me a headache, I snap. A small crowd is gathered around us, and I want to curl into a ball and disappear. But I have to know what he will say next. Why can't I stay away from him? I know he's dangerous and toxic. I have never been as mean to someone as I am to him. He deserves it, I know, but I don't really like being mean to anyone. Hardin grabs my arm yet again and pulls me into a small alleyway between two buildings, away from the crowd. Tess, I, I don't know what I'm doing. You kissed me first, remember? He reminds me. Yeah, I was drunk, remember? And you kissed me first yesterday. Yeah, you didn't stop me. He pauses. It must be exhausting, he says. What? What must be exhausting? Acting like you don't want me, when we both know you do, he says, and steps closer. What? I do not want you. I have a boyfriend. The words tumble out too fast, and reveal their absurdity, making him smile. A boyfriend that you're bored with. Admit it, Tess. Not to me, but to yourself. You're bored with him. His voice lowers, and slows to a sensual pace. Has he ever made you feel the way I do? W what? Of course he has, I lie. No he hasn't. I can tell, that you've never been touched really touched. His words send a now familiar burn through my body. That's none of your business, I say and back away, making him take three steps toward me. You have no idea, how good I can make you feel, he says, and I gasp. How does he go from yelling at me to this? And why do I like it so much? I have no words. Hardin's tone and dirty words make me weak, vulnerable, and confused. I have become a rabbit in a fox's trap. Really, you don't have to admit it. I can tell, he says, his voice thick with arrogance. But all I can do, is shake my head. His smile grows, and I instinctively back against the wall. He takes a step toward me, and I take a deep, hopeful breath. Not again. Your pulse has quickened, hasn't it? Your mouth is dry. You're thinking about me, and have that feeling down there. Don't you, Teresa? Everything he is saying is true, and the more he talks to me like this, the more I want him. It's strange to crave and hate someone at the same time. The attraction I feel is purely physical, which is surprising considering how opposite he is from Noah. I don't remember ever being attracted to anyone except Noah. I know that, if I don't say something now, he will win. I don't want him to have this power over me and win too. You're wrong, I mutter. But he smiles. And even that sends electricity through me. I'm never wrong, he says. Not about this. I step to the side, before he fully traps me against the wall. Why do you keep saying I throw myself at you if... You're the one cornering me now? I ask my anger pushing past my lust for this maddening tattooed boy. Because you made the first move on me. 
Don't get me wrong, I was as surprised as you were. I was drunk and had a long night, as you already know. I was confused because you were being nice to me. Well, your version of being nice. I scoot past him and sit down on the curb so I can get out of his space. Talking to him is so exhausting. I'm not that mean to you, he says, looming over me, but it sounds more like a question than a statement. Yeah, you are. Do you go out of your way to be mean to me? Not just me, but everyone. But it still seems like you are extra hard on me. I can't believe I am being this honest with him. I know it's a matter of minutes before he turns on me. That's just not true. I'm no meaner to you than I am to the rest of the general population. I shoot up. I knew I couldn't have a normal discussion with him. I don't know why I keep wasting my time. I yell. I start walking back toward the main pathway and lawn. Hey, I'm sorry. Just come back over here. I groan, but my feet react before my brain can catch up, and I end up standing a few feet away from him. He sits on the curb, where I was previously sitting. Sit, he demands. And I do. You're sitting awfully far away, he says, and I roll my eyes. You don't trust me? No, of course I don't. Why would I? His face falls slightly as my words hit him, but he recovers quickly. Why would he care if I trusted him? Can we just agree to either stay away from each other or be friends? I don't have it in me to keep fighting with you. I sigh, and he moves a little closer. He takes a deep breath before he speaks. I don't want to stay away from you. What? My heart beats out of my chest. I mean I don't think we can stay away from each other, with one of my best friends, being your roommate and all. So I suppose we should try to be friends. Disappointment bubbles up from nowhere, but this is what I want, right? I can't keep kissing Harden and cheating on Noah. Okay, so friends? I say, pushing down this feeling. Friends, he agrees and reaches out his hand for me to shake. Not friends with benefits, I remind him as I shake, only to feel the blood rush to my cheeks. He chuckles and moves his hand to play with his eyebrow ring. What makes you say that? Like you don't know. Steph already told me. What, about me and her? You and her, and you and every other girl. I try to fake a laugh, but it comes out as a cough, so I cough a little more to try to cover. He raises his eyebrow at me, but I ignore him. Well, me and Steph that was fun. He smiles as if remembering something, and I swallow the bile rising in. The back of my throat. And yeah, I have girls that I fuck. But why would that concern you, friend? He's so nonchalant about the whole thing, but I'm in shock. Hearing him admit to sleeping with other girls shouldn't bother me but it does. He isn't mine, Noah is. Noah is. Noah is. I remind myself. It doesn't. I just don't want you to think that I will be one of those girls. Oh are you jealous, Teresa? He mocks me, and I shove him. There is no way in hell I will ever admit that. No, absolutely not. I feel sorry for the girls. He raises his eyebrows playfully. Oh, you shouldn't. They enjoy it, trust me. Okay, okay. I get it. Can we please just change the subject? I sigh and lift my head back to look at the sky. I need to clear the image of Hardin and his harem out of my mind. So, will you try to be nicer to me? Sure. Will you try not to be so uptight and bitchy all the time? Looking at the clouds, I dreamily say, I'm not bitchy, you're just obnoxious. I look at him and start laughing. Fortunately he joins in. It's a nice change from screaming at each other. I know we haven't really resolved the big issue here, which is the feelings that I may or may not have for him, but if I can just get him to stop kissing me, I can focus back on Noah and stop this terrible cycle before it gets worse. Look at us, two friends. His accent is so cute when he isn't being rude. Hell, even then it is, but when his voice is soft his accent makes it so much softer, like velvet. The way words roll off his tongue and through his pink lips I can't think about his lips. I tear my eyes away from his face and stand up, wiping my skirt off. That skirt really is dreadful, Tess. If we're going to be friends you need to not wear that anymore. For a second I'm hurt, but when I look up at him, he's smiling. 
this must be the way he jokes, still rude, but I'll take this over his usual pure malice. My phone alarm vibrates. I need to get back and study, I tell him. You set an alarm to study? I set an alarm for a lot of things, it's just something I do. I hope he just lets this topic go. Well, set an alarm for us to do something fun tomorrow after class, he says. Who is this, and where is the real Hardin? I don't think my idea of fun is the same as yours. I can't even imagine what fun is to Hardin. Well, we'll only sacrifice a few cats, burn down only a few buildings I can't stop the giggle from escaping, and he smiles back. Really, though, you could use some fun, and since we are new friends, we should do something fun. I need a few moments to contemplate whether I should be alone with Hardin before I answer him. But before I can answer, he turns to walk away. Good, I'm glad you're bored. See you tomorrow. And he's gone. I don't say anything. I just sit back down on the curb. My head is spinning from the last 20 minutes. First, he basically offered me sex, telling me I have no idea how good he could make me feel. Then, a few minutes later, he was agreeing to try to be nice to me. Then we were laughing and joking, and it was nice. There are still so many questions I have about him, but I think I can be friends with Hardin, like Steph is. Okay, not like Steph is, but like Nate or one of their other friends who hang out with him. This is really the best thing. No more kissing, no more sexual advances from him. Just friends. But as I walk back to my room, past all the other kids going about without any knowledge of Hardin or his ways, I can't quite manage to shake the fear that I just walked into another one of his traps. Chapter 24. I try to study when I get back to my room, but can't seem to focus. After staring at my notes for a couple of hours, but not having really read anything, I decide a shower might help. When they're crowded, the co-ed bathrooms still make me uncomfortable, but no one ever messes with me, so I'm getting used to them. The hot water feels amazing and loosens up my tense muscles. I should be relieved and happy that Hardin and I have reached some sort of truce, but now anger and annoyance have been replaced by nervousness and confusion. I've agreed to spend time with Hardin tomorrow, doing something fun, and I am terrified. I just hope it goes well. I don't expect to become best friends with him, but I need us to get to a place where we don't scream at each other every time we talk. The shower feels so good I stay in there for a while, and when I get back to my room, Steph's already come and left. I find a note from her saying Tristan is taking her off campus for dinner. I like Tristan. He seems really nice despite his overuse of eyeliner. If Steph and Tristan continue to see each other then maybe, when Noah comes to visit we could all go do something together. Who am I kidding? Noah wouldn't want to hang out with people like them, but I'm aware enough to admit that up until three weeks ago I never would have either. I end up calling Noah before bed, we haven't talked all day. He's so polite, he asks about my day, as soon as he picks up. I tell him it was good, I should tell him that Hardin and I are going to hang out tomorrow, but I don't. He tells me that his soccer team beat Seattle high by a landslide, even though Seattle's really good. And I'm happy for him, because he seems really happy to have played so well. The next day goes by way too fast. Landon and I walk into literature class, and Hardin is already in his seat. Are you ready for our day tonight? He asks and my mouth falls open. Landon's does too. I don't know what I feel more conflicted about, Hardin saying it like that, or how it will affect how Landon sees me. Day 1 of. Our quest to become friends is not going well so far. It's not a date, I say to him, then turn to Landon and roll my eyes and nonchalantly say, we're hanging out as friends while ignoring Hardin. Same thing, Hardin replies. I avoid him for the rest of the class which is easy, since he doesn't really try to talk to me after that. After class, as Landon starts putting his stuff into his backpack, he looks at Hardin, then quietly says to me, be careful tonight. Oh, we're just trying to get along since my roommate is his good friend, I reply, hoping Hardin doesn't hear me. I know, you're really a great friend. I'm just not sure Hardin deserves your kindness, he says, purposefully loud, and I look up at him. Don't you have something else to do besides badmouth me? 
Get lost, man, Hardin snaps from behind me. Landon frowns and looks at me again. Just remember what I said. He walks away, and I worry about how much I've maybe upset him. Hey, you don't have to be cruel to him, you guys are practically brothers, I say. Hardin's eyes go wide. What did you just say, he growls. You know, your dad and his mom? Was Landon lying? Or was I not supposed to mention this? Landon said not to bring up Hardin's relationship with his dad, but I didn't think he meant the whole thing. That is none of your business. Hardin looks angrily at the door where Landon disappeared. I don't know why the asshole even told you that. I'm going to have to shut him up, it seems. You leave him alone, Hardin. He didn't even want to tell me, but I got it out of him. The idea of Hardin hurting Landon makes me sick. I need to change the subject. So where are we going today? I ask, and he glares at me. We aren't going anywhere. This was a bad idea. He snaps, turns on his heels, and walks away. I stand there for a minute, waiting to see if Hardin changes his mind and will come back. What the hell? He really is bipolar, I'm sure of it. Back in my dorm room, I find said, Tristan, and Steph sitting on her bed. Tristan's eyes are focused on Steph and said is flicking his thumb across the trigger of a metal lighter. I would usually be annoyed with this many unexpected guests, but I really like said and Tristan, and I need the distraction. Hey, Tessa. How are classes? Steph asks and gives me a big smile. I can't help but notice the way Tristan's face lights up when he looks at her. They were okay. Do you? I put my books on my dresser, and she tells me about her professor spilling hot coffee on himself, making them get out early. You look nice today, Tessa, said tells me, and I say thanks and crowd on Steph's bed with the three of them. The bed really is too small for all of us, but it works. After we've been talking about various weird professors for a few minutes, the door opens, and we all turn to see who it is. It's Hardin. Ugh. Jeez, man, you could at least knock for once, Steph scolds him and he shrugs. I could have been naked or something. She laughs, obviously not angry at his lack of manners. Nothing I haven't seen before, he jokes, and Tristan's face falls, while the other three chuckle. I can't find the humor either. I hate thinking about Steph and Hardin together. Oh, shut up, she says, still laughing, and grabs hold of Tristan's hand. His smile returns, and he moves a little closer to her. What are you guys up to? Hardin asks and sits opposite us, on my bed. I want to tell him to get off, but I keep quiet. I thought for a second he had come here to apologize, but now I can see he just came to hang out with his friends, and I am not one of them. Zed smiles. We were actually going to go to the movies. Tessa, you should come. Before I can answer, Hardin speaks up quickly. Actually, Tessa and I have plans. There is a strange edge to his voice. God, he's so moody. What? Zed and Steph say in unison. Yeah, I was just coming to get her. Hardin stands up and puts his hands into his pockets, gesturing toward the door with his body. You ready? Or what? My mind screams, no, but I nod, and slip off Steph's bed. Well, see you all later. Hardin announces and practically pushes me out the door. Outside, he leads me to his car, and, surprising me, opens the passenger door for me. I stand still with my arms crossed, looking at him. Well, I'll remember not to ever open a door for you again I shake my head. What the hell was that? I know full well you didn't come here to get me, you just got done telling me that you didn't want to hang out with me. I yell. And we are back to yelling at each other. He makes me crazy, literally. Yes, I did. Now get in the car. No. If you don't admit that you didn't come here to see me, I will go back in there and go to the movies with said, I say, which makes him clench his jaw. I knew it. I don't know how to feel about this revelation, but somehow I knew Hardin didn't want me to go to the movies with said, and that that's the only reason he's trying to hang out with me now. Admit it, Hardin, or I am gone. Okay, fine. I admit it. Now get in the damn car. I won't ask again, he says and walks around to the driver's side. Against my better judgment, 
I get in too. Hardin still looks angry as he pulls out of the parking lot. He turns the screeching music up way too loud. I reach down and shut it off. Don't touch my radio, he scolds. If you're going to be a jerk the whole time, I don't want to hang out with you. And I mean it. If he's like this, I don't care where we are, I'll hitch it back to the dorms or something. I'm not. Just don't touch my radio. My thoughts go back to Hardin tossing my notes into the air, and in turn I want to yank his radio out and throw it out the window. If I knew I could tear it from the dash, I would. Why do you care if I go to the movies with Seth anyway? Steph and Tristan were going too. I just don't think Sed has the best intentions, he says quietly, his eyes glued to the road. I begin to laugh and he frowns. Oh, and you do. At least Sed is nice to me. I can't stop laughing. The idea of Hardin trying to protect me in some way is hilarious. Sed is a friend, nothing more. Just like Hardin. Hardin rolls his eyes, but doesn't give me an answer. He turns the music back on, and its guitars and bass literally hurt my ears. Can you please turn it down? I beg. To my surprise, he does, but leaves it on for background noise. That music is terrible. He laughs and taps the steering wheel. No, it's not. Though I would love to know your opinion on what is good music. When he smiles like this, he looks so carefree, especially with his window down, the breeze blowing through his hair. He reaches one hand up and pushes his hair back. I love the way it looks, when it's back like that. I shake the thoughts from my head. Well, I like Bone Ivor, and the fray, I finally answer. Of course you do, he says, and chuckles. I defend my two favorite bands. What is wrong with them? They are insanely talented, and their music is wonderful. Yeah, they are talented. Talented at putting people to sleep. When I reach across and playfully swat his shoulder, he mock winces and laughs. Well, I love them, I say with a smile. If we could just stay in this playful state, I might actually have a good time. I look out the window for the first time, but I don't really know where we are. Where are we going? To one of my favorite places. Which is where? Do you really have to know everything that is going on in advance, don't you? Yeah I like to, control everything. I stay quiet. I know he's right, but that's just the way I am. Well, I'm not telling you until we get there which will be only about 5 minutes from now. I lean back against the leather seat of his car and turn my head to glance at the back seat. A messy stack of textbooks and loose papers rest on one side, and a thick black sweatshirt rests on the other. See something that you like back there? Hardin catches me by embarrassed surprise. What kind of car is this? I ask. I need a distraction from both not knowing where we are going and him calling me out for being nosy. Ford Capri, a classic, he boasts, obviously proud. He goes on to tell me all about it, even though I have no idea what he's talking about. Still, I like to watch his lips as he talks, the way they move slowly as the words are even slower. After looking over at me a few times during the conversation, he pretty harshly says, I don't like to be stared at, though he does smile a little after. Chapter 25. We start down a gravel road, and Hardin turns the music off, so that the only noise is the little stones crunching beneath the tires. I suddenly realize we are out in the middle of nowhere. I get nervous now. We are alone, really alone. There are no cars, no buildings, nothing. Don't worry, I didn't bring you out here to kill you, he jokes and I gulp. I doubt he realizes that I'm more afraid of what I might do when alone with him than if he was to actually try to kill me. After another mile he stops the car. I look out the window and see nothing but grass and trees. There are yellow wildflowers across the landscape, and the breeze is perfectly warm. Granted, the place is nice and serene. But why bring me here? What are we going to do here? I ask him as I climb out of the car. Well, first, a bit of walking. I sigh. So he took me here to exercise? Noticing my sour expression, he adds, not too much walking, and begins along a part of the grass that looks flattened from being used a number of times. We're both quiet for most of the walk, save a few root snips from Hardin about me being too slow. I ignore him and take in my surroundings. 
I am beginning to understand why he likes this seemingly random place. It's so quiet. Peaceful. I could stay here forever, as long as I brought a book with me. He turns off the trail and goes into a wooded area. My natural suspiciousness kicks in, but I follow. A few minutes later we emerge from the woods to a stream, or really more of a river. I have no idea where we are but the water looks pretty deep. Hardin doesn't say anything as he pulls his black t-shirt over his head. My eyes scan his ink torso. The way the empty branches of the dead tree are drawn into his skin is more appealing than haunting under the bright sun. He then bends down to untie his dirty black boots, glancing up at me, catching me staring at his half-naked body. Wait, why are you undressing? I ask and look at the stream. Oh no. You are going to swim? In that? I say and point to the water. Yeah, and you are too. I do it all the time. He unbuttons his pants and I have to force myself to not stare at the way the muscles in his bare back move when he bends down and pulls them over his legs. I am not swimming in that. I don't mind swimming, but not in a random place in the middle of nowhere. And why is that? He gestures toward the river. It's clean enough that you can see the bottom. So there are probably fish and God knows what in there. I realize how ridiculous I sound, but I don't care. Besides, you didn't tell me we were going swimming, so I have nothing to swim in. He can't argue with that. You're telling me you're the kind of girl who doesn't wear underwear? He smirks, and I gave it him, and those dimples. Yeah, so go in your bra and panties. Wait, so he thought I would come out here and take all my clothes off and swim with him? My insides stir, and I get warm thinking about being naked in the water with Hardin. What is he doing to me? I have never, ever had these types of thoughts before him. I am not swimming in my underwear, you creep. I sit on the soft grass. I'll just watch, I tell him. He frowns. Now only in his boxer briefs, the black material is tied against his body. This is the second time I have seen him shirtless, and he looks even better here, under the open sky. You're no fun. And you're missing out, he says flatly. And jumps into the water. I keep my eyes on the grass, and pluck a few blades out, playing with them between my fingers. I hear Hardin call, the water is warm, Tess, from the stream. From my spot on the grass, I can see the drops of water falling from his now black hair. He is smiling as he pushes his soaked hair back and wipes his face off with one hand. For a moment I find myself wishing I was someone else, someone braver. Like Steph. If I was Steph, I would strip down and jump into the warm water with Hardin. I would splash around and climb up the bank just to jump back and soak him. I would be fun and carefree. But I'm not Steph. I'm Tessa. This is one beyond boring friendship, so far Hardin exclaims and swims closer to the bank. I roll my eyes and he chuckles. At least take your shoes off and put your feet in. It feels amazing and pretty soon it will be too cold to swim in. Putting my feet in wouldn't be so bad. So I take my shoes off and roll my jeans up enough to dip my feet over the edge and into the water. Hardin was right, the water is warm and clear. I wiggle my toes and can't help but smile. It's nice, isn't it? He asks, and I can't help but nod. So just come in. I shake my head and he splashes me with the water. I scoot back and scowl at him. If you come in the water, I will answer one of your always intrusive questions. Any question that you want, but only one he warns. Curiosity gets the best of me, and I tilt my head in concentration. There are so many mysteries about him, and here's a chance to maybe solve one of them. This offer expires in one minute, he says and slips beneath the water. I can see his long body swimming under the clear water. It does look like fun, and Hardin drives a hard bargain. He knows just how to use my curiosity against me. Tessa, he says after his head pops back up above the surface, stop overthinking everything and just jump in. I don't have anything to wear. If I jump in in my clothes, I will have to walk back to the car and ride back soaked, I whine. I almost want to get in the water. Okay, I know I do. Wear my shirt, he offers, which shocks me, so I wait a second for him to tell me he was joking, but he doesn't. Go on, just wear my shirt. 
It will be long enough for you to wear in here, and you can keep your bra and panties on, if you wish, he says with a smile. I take his advice and stop thinking. Fine, but turn around, and do not look at me, while I am changing, I mean it. I try my best to be intimidating, but he just laughs. He turns around and faces the opposite direction, so I lift my shirt over my head, and grab his as quickly as I can. Slipping it on, I can tell he was right, since it reaches down to the middle of my thighs. I can't help, but admire the way his shirt smells, like faint cologne mixed with a smell I can only describe as Harden. Hurry the hell up, or I will turn around, he says, and I wish I had a stick, to throw at his head. I unbutton my jeans, and step out of them. Folding my jeans and shirt neatly, I put them next to my shoes on the grass. Harden turns around, and I tug at the bottom of his black t-shirt, trying to pull it as far as it will go. His eyes widen, and I watch them rake down my body. He takes his lip ring between his teeth and I notice his cheeks flush. He must be cold, because I know it couldn't possibly be me he is reacting to. I'm come in the water, yeah, he says, his voice raspier than usual. I nod and walk slowly to the bank. Just jump in. I am. I am. I yell nervously, and he laughs. Get a little running start. Okay. I step back a little, and start to run. I feel foolish, but I'm not letting my tendency to overthink ruin this. As I reach my last stride, I look at the water and stop with my feet right on the edge. Oh come on. You were off to such a good start. His head falls back in laughter, and he looks adorable. Harden, adorable? I can't. I am not sure what is stopping me. The water is deep enough to jump in, but not too deep. The water in the spot where Harden is standing goes only to his chest, which means it would reach just under my chin. Are you afraid? His tone is calm but serious. No, I don't know. Sort of, I admit and he walks through the water toward me. Sit on the edge, and I'll help you in. I sit down and close my legs tightly, so he doesn't see my panties. Noticing this, he grins as he reaches me. His hands grip my thighs and once again I am on fire. Why does my body have to respond to him this way? I'm trying to make us friends, so I need to ignore the fire. He moves his hands to my waist and asks, ready? As soon as I nod yes, he is lifting me and pulling me. Into the water, water that's warm and feels amazing against my hot skin. Harden lets me go too soon and I stand up in the water. We are closer to the bank so it only reaches just below my chest. Do just stand there he says mockingly, and I ignore him, but do walk out a little. The t-shirt bubbles up from the water going under it, and I yelp and pull it down. Once it's positioned, it promises to stay put for the most part. You could just take it off he says with a smirk, and I splash at him. Did you just splash me? He laughs and I nod, splashing at him again. He shakes his wet head and lunges for me under the water. His long arms hook around my waist and pull me under. My hand flies up to plug my nose. I haven't mastered swimming without my nose plugged. When we emerge, Hardin is cracking up, and I can't help but laugh with him. I am actually having fun, real fun, not that average watching a good movie fun. I can't decide which is more amusing, the fact that you are actually having a good time or the fact that you have to plug your nose underwater, he says through his laughter. I get a jolt of bravery and move toward him, ignoring the way the t-shirt floats up again, and I try to push his head underwater. Of course, he is too strong for me and doesn't budge, so he only laughs harder, showing all of his beautiful white teeth. Why can't he be like this all the time? I believe you owe me an answer to a question, I remind him. He looks off toward the bank. Sure, but only one. I'm not sure which one to ask, I have so many. Before I can decide, though, I hear my voice making the decision for me, who do you love the most in the world? Why would I ask him that? I want to know more specific things, like why is he a jerk? Why is he in America? He looks at me suspiciously, as if he is confused by my question. Myself, he answers, and goes back underwater for a few seconds. He pops back up, and I shake my head. That can't be true, I say in challenge. I know he is arrogant, but he has to love someone anyone? What about your parents? 
I ask and immediately regret it. His face twists and his eyes lose the softness I was becoming fond of. Do not speak of my parents again, got it, he snaps, and I want to smack myself for ruining the good time we were having. I'm sorry, I was just curious. You said you would answer a question, I remind him quietly. His face softens a little, and he steps toward me, the water around us rippling. I really am sorry, Hardin, I won't mention them again, I promise. I really don't want to fight with him out here, he would probably leave me out here alone, if I upset him too much. He takes me by surprise, when he grabs my waist, and lifts me into the air. I keep my legs and flail my arms, screaming at him to put me down, but he only obliges me, by laughing and tossing me into the water. I land a few feet away and when I come above water his eyes are bright with glee. You're going to pay for that. I yell. He fake yawns in response, so I swim at him, and he grabs me again, but this time I wrap my thighs around his waist without really realizing it. A shot gasp falls from his lips. Sorry, I mutter and unhook my legs. But he grabs them, and folds them back around his waist. That electricity between us can be felt again, this time more intensely than ever before. Why does this always happen with him? I shut my mind off from my thoughts, and put my arms around his neck to steady myself. What are you doing to me, Tess, he says softly, and rubs his thumb over my bottom lip. I don't know I answer truthfully into his thumb, which still traces over my mouth. These lips the things you could do with them, he says slowly, seductively. I feel that burn deep in my stomach, that makes me putty in his arms. Do you want me to stop? He looks into my eyes. His pupils are so dilated, that there is only a slight ring around the now dark green of his eyes. Before my mind can catch up, I shake my head and press my body against his under the water. We can't just be friends, you know that, don't you? His lips touch my chin, making me tremble. He continues a line of kisses along my jawline and I nod. I know he is right. I have no idea what this is that we are, but I know I will never be able to only be friends with Hardin. As his lips touch the spot just below my ear, I moan, prompting Hardin to do it again, this time sucking the skin. Oh, Hardin, I moan and squeeze him with my legs. I bring my hands down his back and graze my nails against his skin. I might explode just from him kissing my neck alone. I want to make you moan my name, Tessa, over and over again. Please let me. His voice is full of desperation. And I know deep inside there's no way I can say no. Say it, Tessa. He takes my earlobe between his teeth. I nod again, harder. I need you to say it, baby, out loud so I know you really want me to. His hand travels down and under his t-shirt that I am wearing. I want to I rush the words, and he smiles against my neck, his mouth continuing its gentle assault. He doesn't say anything and instead grabs my thighs, lifting me higher onto his torso as he begins to walk out of the water. When he reaches the bank, he lets me go and climbs out. I whine, certainly inflaming his ego even more, but right now I don't care. All I know is that I want him, I need him. He reaches out for my hands and pulls me up onto the bank with him. Unsure what to do, I just stand on the grass, feeling hard and heavy, soaked shirt on my shoulders and thinking he's too far away. From where he stands, he dips down a little to meet my eyes. Do you want it to be here? Or my room? I shrug nervously. I don't want to go to his room, because it's too far, the drive will give me too much time. To overthink what I am about to do. Here, I say and look around. There is no one in sight, and I pray that no one will come here. Eager. He smiles and I try to roll my eyes, but it probably looks like a desperate flutter. The heat in my body is slowly burning out the longer Hardin's touch is not on me. Come here, he says in a low voice and the heat returns. My feet pad quietly across the soft grass until I'm only inches from Hardin. His hands immediately reach for the hem of the t-shirt, and he peels it upward off my body. The way he looks at me alone drives me crazy, my hormones are out of control. My pulse speeds up as he looks my body up and down one more time, before taking my hand. He spreads his shirt on the grass like a blanket of sorts. Lie down he says, guiding me to the ground with him. 
he lays me on the wet fabric and props himself up on his elbow, lying on his side, facing me on my back. No one has ever seen me this exposed before, and Hardin has seen so many girls, girls much better looking than me. My hands move up to cover my body, but Hardin sits up and grabs both of my wrists, and pushes them down to my sides. Don't ever cover up, not for me he says and looks into my eyes. It's just I begin to explain, but he cuts me off. No, you will not cover up, you have nothing to be ashamed of, Tess. Does he mean that? I mean it, look at you, he continues, seeming to read my mind. You've been with so many girls, I blurt out, and he frowns. None like you. And I know I could take his answer many different ways, but I choose to let it go. Do you have a condom? I ask him, trying to remember the few things I know about sex. A condom? He chuckles. I'm not going to have sex with you, he says and I begin to panic. Is this all a game to humiliate me? Oh, is all I say and begin to pull myself up. But he grabs my shoulders and gently pushes me back down. I'm sure I'm flush red, and I don't want to be exposed to his sarcastic eyes like this. Where are you going? He starts, but then realization hits him. Oh no, Tess, I didn't mean it like that. I just meant that you have never done anything like at all, so I am not going to have sex with you. He stares at me for a moment. Today, he adds, and I feel a little bit of the pressure in my chest dissolve. There are many other things I want to do to you first. He climbs on top of me, all of his weight, supported on his hands. He is in a push-up position. His wet hair drips water droplets onto my face and I squirm. I can't believe no one has fucked you before, he whispers and he shifts his body to lie on his side once again. He brings his hand to my neck and trails it down, touching me only with his fingertips, down the valley of my breasts, down my stomach until he stops just above my underwear. We are really doing this, me and Hardin. What is he going to do? Will it hurt? A hundred thoughts race through my mind, but disappear as soon as his hand reaches into my panties. I hear him suck a breath through his teeth, and he brings his mouth to mine. His fingers move a little, and it shocks me. Does that feel good? He asks into my mouth. He's only rubbing me, how does it feel so good? I nod and he slows his fingers down. Does it feel better, than when you do it? What? Does it? He asks again. WH what? I manage, even though I have no control of my body or mind right now. When you touch yourself. Does it feel like this? I'm not sure what to say, and when I just stare at him, something behind his eyes snaps too. Wait you've never done that either, have you? His voice is full of surprise, and something else lust? He goes back to kissing me, and his fingers keep moving up and down. You're so responsive to me, so wet, he says and I moan. Why are these filthy words so hot when Hardin says them? I feel a gentle pinch and it sends a shock through my whole body. What? Was that? I half ask, half moan. He chuckles and doesn't answer, but I feel him do it again, and my back arches off the grass. His mouth travels down to my neck, then my chest. His tongue dips down under the cup of my bra, and his hand massages one of my breasts. I feel a pressure building in my stomach, and it is pure bliss. I pinch my eyes closed, and bite down on my lip. My back lifts off the grass once again, and my legs begin to shake. That's right, Tessa, come for me, he says, which makes me feel like I am spiraling out of control. Look at me, baby, he purrs. I open my eyes. The sight of his mouth nipping the skin on my chest sends me over the edge and my vision goes white for a few seconds. Harden, I say, and then repeat, and I can tell by the way his cheeks flush that he loves it. Slowly, he pulls his hand out and rests it on my stomach as I try to return my breathing to normal. My body had never felt so energized before, and it's never felt so relaxed as this now. I'll give you a minute to recover. He laughs to himself and moves away from me. I frown. I want him to stay close, but I'm also strangely unable to speak. After the best few minutes of my life, I sit up and look toward Hardin. He already has his jeans and shoes on. We're leaving already? The embarrassment is clear in my voice. I had assumed he would want me to touch him too. Even if I don't really know what to do, 
he could explain it to me. Yeah, you wanted to stay longer? I just thought I don't know. I thought maybe you would want something I have no idea how to say this. Lucky for me he catches on. Oh, no. I am okay, for now, he says and gives me a small smile. Is he going to go back to being mean again? I hope not, not after this. I have just shared the most intimate experience I have ever had with him. I won't be able to stand it if he treats me terribly again. He did say for now, so he wants something later? I am already starting to regret this. I put my clothes on over my wet bra and panties and try to ignore the soft wetness between my thighs. Hardin picks up his wet shirt and hands it to me. He takes in my confused expression and tells me to towel off. His eyes shift to the apex of my thighs. Oh. I unbutton my pants, and he doesn't bother to turn around as I swipe the shirt across my sensitive skin there. I don't miss the way his tongue brushes across his bottom lip while he watches me. He pulls his cell phone from the pocket of his jeans, and his thumb slides across the screen repeatedly. I finish doing what he recommended and hand him his shirt back. As I step into my shoes, the air around us has changed from passionate to distant, and I find myself wishing to be as far away from him as possible. I wait for him to talk to me as we walk back to the car, but he doesn't say anything. My mind is already coming up with every possible worst-case scenario for what happens next. He opens my door for me, and I nod to thank him. Is something wrong? He asks me, while he drives back down the gravel road. I don't know. Why are you being so weird now? I ask him, even though I'm afraid of his answer, and can't look directly at him. I'm not, you are. No, you haven't said a word to me since you know. Since I gave you your first orgasm? My mouth drops and my cheeks flush. Why am I still surprised by his dirty mouth? Um, yeah. Since that, you haven't said anything. You just got dressed and we left. Honesty seems to be the best option right now. So I add, it makes me feel like you're using me or something what? Of course I'm not using you. To you someone I would have to be getting something out of it, he says, so offhandedly that I can suddenly feel the tears coming. I do my best to keep them back but one escapes. Are you crying? What did I say? He reaches over and puts his hand on my thigh. To my surprise it soothes me. I didn't mean it like that, I am sorry. I'm not used to whatever is supposed to happen, after messing around with someone, plus I wasn't going to just drop you off at your room, and go our separate ways. I thought maybe we could get some dinner or something. I am sure you're starving. He squeezes my thigh gently. I smile back at him, relieved by his words. I wipe away the tear, that escaped prematurely, and with it goes my worry. I don't know what it is about Hardin, that makes me so emotional in every way possible. The idea of him using me makes me more upset than it should. My feelings for Hardin are so confusing. I hate him one minute and want to kiss him the next. He makes me feel things I never knew I could, and not just sexually. He makes me laugh. And cry, yell, and scream, but most of all he makes me feel alive. Chapter 26. Hardin's hand is still on my thigh, and I hope he never removes it. I take a quick opportunity to study some of the tattoos covering his arms. The infinity symbol above his wrist catches my eye again, and I can't help but wonder if it means something to him. It feels personal, ink there, just above the bare skin on his hand. I check his other wrist for a matching symbol, but there isn't one. The infinity symbol is common enough, mostly among women, but the way the two loops on the ends are hearts makes me even more curious. So what type of food do you like, he asks. What a refreshingly normal question for him to ask me. I pull my matted, almost dry hair into a bun, and think for a second about what I want to eat. Well, I like anything, really, as long as I know what it is, and it doesn't involve ketchup. He laughs. You don't like ketchup? Aren't all Americans supposed to be wild for the stuff? He teases. I have no idea, but it's disgusting. We both laugh, and I look over at Hardin, who says, let's just stick with a plain diner then. I nod and he reaches to turn the music up, but stops and puts his hand back on me. So what do you plan on doing after college, he asks. 
It's something he's already asked me before, in his room. I'm going to move to Seattle immediately, and I hope to work at a publishing house, or be a writer. I know it's silly, I say, suddenly embarrassed by my high ambitions. But you already asked me that before, remember? No, it's not. I know someone over at Vance Publishing House. It's a bit of a drive, but maybe you should apply there for an internship. I could talk to him. What? You would do that for me? My voice goes high, because I'm pretty surprised. Even if he has been nice for the last hour, this isn't quite what I expected. Yeah, it's not a big deal. He seems a little embarrassed. I am sure he isn't used to doing nice things. Wow, thank you. Really. I need to get a job or internship soon anyway, and that would literally be a dream come true. I clap my hands. He chuckles and shakes his head. You're welcome. We pull into a small parking lot next to an old brick building. The food here is amazing, he says and climbs out of the car. Walking around to the trunk, he opens it and pulls out another plain black t-shirt. He really must have an endless supply. I was enjoying him being shirtless, so much that I forgot he would eventually have to put one back on. When we get inside we seat ourselves in the fairly deserted place. An old woman walks to the table and goes to hand us our menus, but he waves them off, ordering a hamburger and fries, gesturing like I should do the same. I trust him on this one and order it, minus ketchup, of course. While we wait, I tell Hardin about growing up in Richland, which, being from England, he's never heard of. He isn't missing out on much, the town is small, and everyone does the same things, and no one ever leaves. Everyone except me, I will never move back there. He doesn't offer me much information about his past, but I'm hopeful and patient. He seems very curious about my life as a child, and he frowns when I tell him about my dad's drinking. I had mentioned it to him before, while we were fighting, but this time I went into a little more detail. During a pause in the conversation, the waitress reappears with our food, which looks delicious. Good, huh? Hardin asks as I take my first bite. I nod and wipe my mouth off. The food is amazing, and we both clear our plates, me being more hungry than I've ever been before. The drive back to the dorms is relaxed. His long fingers rub circles on my leg, and I'm disappointed to see the WCU sign when we finally hit campus in the student parking lot. Did you have a nice time? I ask him. I feel so much closer to him now than I did a few hours ago. He can be really good when he tries to be. Yeah, I did actually. He seems surprised. Listen, I would walk you to your room, but I don't want to play 20 questions with Steffi smiles and turns his body sideways to face me. It's fine. I'll just see you tomorrow, I tell him. I'm not sure if I should try to kiss him goodbye or not, so I'm relieved when his fingers tug on a few loose strands of my hair and tuck them behind my ear. I rest my face in his palm, and he leans over and touches his lips to mine. It starts as a simple and gentle kiss, but I feel it warm my entire body and I need more. Hardin grabs my arm and pulls it to gesture for me to climb over the middle divider. I quickly oblige and straddle his lap, my back hitting the steering wheel. I feel the seat recline slightly, giving us more room as I lift his shirt a little to slide my hands under it. His stomach is hard and his skin is hot. I trace my fingers along the ink there. His tongue massages mine, and he wraps his arms around me tightly. The feeling is almost painful, but it's a pain I will gladly endure to be this close to him. He moans into my mouth as I put my hands farther up his shirt. I love that I can make him moan too, that I have this effect on him. I'm really about to get lost in the sensation again, when we are interrupted by my phone ringing. Another alarm? He teases as I pull back and reach into my purse. Smiling, I open my mouth to say something smart back at him, but when I look at the screen and see it's Noah, I stop. Looking at Hardin, I can tell he's figured it out. His expression changes, and fearing that I'm losing him, this mood, I hit the ignore button and toss my phone back onto the passenger seat. I am not thinking about Noah right now. I push him to the back corner of my mind and lock that door. I lean back in to continue kissing Hardin, but he stops me. I think I better go. 
His tone is clipped and sends worry through me. When I draw back to look at him, his gaze is distant, and ice immediately replaces the fire in my body. Harden, I ignored it. I am going to talk to him about all this. I just don't know how or when, but it will be soon, though, I promise. I knew somewhere in the back of my mind that I would have to break up with Noah the moment I kissed Harden that first time. I can't aid him if I've already betrayed him. It would always hang over my head like a dark cloud of guilt, and neither of us wants that. The way I feel about Harden is another reason I can't be with Noah anymore. I love Noah, but if I really loved him the way he deserves to be loved, I wouldn't be having these feelings for Harden. I don't want to hurt Noah, but there is no turning back now. Talk to him about what, he snaps. All of this. I wave my hands around. Us. Us. You're not trying to tell me you're going to break up with him for me, are you? My head starts to spin. I know I should climb off his lap, but I am frozen. You don't want me to? My voice comes out as a whisper. No, why would you? I mean, yeah, if you want to dump him, go for it, but don't do it on my behalf. I just I thought I start to fumble my words. I already told you that I don't date, Teresa, he says. My body wants to freeze like a deer in headlights. The only thing that makes it possible for me to climb off him is the fact that I refuse to let him see me cry again. You're disgusting, I say bitterly and grab my stuff from the floorboards and my phone from the seat. Hardin looks like he wants to say something, but he doesn't. Stay away from me from now on, I mean it. I shout and he closes his eyes. I walk as fast as I can to my building to my room, somehow managing to hold in my tears until I get inside and shut the door. I am so grateful Steph's gone as I slide down the door and break into sobs. How could I be so stupid? I knew how he was when I agreed to be alone with him, yet I practically jumped at the opportunity. Just because he was nice to me today, I got it into my head that what, that he would be my boyfriend? I laughed through my sobs at how stupid and naive I am. I really can't even be angry with Hardin. He told me he doesn't date, but today we had such a nice time. He was actually pleasant and playful, and I thought we were really building a relationship of some kind. But it was all an act, just so he could get into my pants. And I let him. Chapter 27. My tears dry, and I am showered, and somewhat mentally stable by the time staff returns from the movies. So. How was your hangout with Hardin, she asks and grabs her pajamas out of her dresser. It was okay, he was his normal charming self, I. Tell her and manage a laugh. I want to tell her about what we did, but I'm too ashamed. I know she wouldn't judge me, and despite wanting to be able to tell someone, I also really don't want anyone to know. Steph looks at me with concern evident in her eyes, and I have to look away. Just be careful, okay? You're too nice for someone like Hardin. I want to hug her and cry into her shoulder but instead ask, how was the movie, to change the subject. She tells me how Tristan kept feeding her popcorn and that she is really starting to like him. I want to gag, but I know I am just jealous because Tristan actually likes her in a way Hardin doesn't like me. But I remind myself that I do have someone who loves me and that I need to start treating him better and stay away from Hardin for real this time. The next morning I'm drained. I have no energy and feel like I could cry at any moment. My eyes are red and puffy from crying last night, so I walk over to Steph's dresser and grab her makeup bag. I pull out brown eyeliner and draw a thin line under my eyes and on my eyelid. It makes my eyes look much better. I put a little powder under my eyes to give my skin a little color. A few swipes of mascara and I look like a new person. Pleased with the way I look, I put on my tight jeans and a tank top. Still feeling naked, I grab a white cardigan out of my closet. This is the most effort I have made in my appearance for a regular school day since picture day my senior year of high school. Landon texts me that we'll have to meet in class, so when I stop by the coffee house I grab him a drink too. I'm still pretty early to class, so I walk slower than usual. Hey, Tessa, right? I hear a guy's voice say. I look over and see a preppy boy coming my way. Yeah, Logan, right? I ask him and he nods. 
Do you coming over again this weekend? He asks. He must be part of the frat. Of course he is. He's preppy and gorgeous. Oh, no, not this weekend. I laugh and he joins in. Bummer, you were fun. Well, if you change your mind, you know where it is. I gotta go, but I'll see you around. Giving me a fake little tip of the hat, he walks away. In class, Landon is already seated and thanks me repeatedly for bringing him coffee. You look different today, he says as I sit down. I put makeup on, I joke and he smiles. He doesn't ask about my night with Hardin, and I am grateful. I'm not sure what I would say to him. Just as the day gets pleasant, and I begin to stop thinking about Hardin, it's time for literature. Hardin sits in his normal seat in the front. He's wearing a white t-shirt for once, and it's thin enough that his tattoos are visible underneath it. It amazes me how attractive I find his tattoos and piercings when I've never cared for either before. I look away quickly, sit down in my usual seat next to him, and pull out my notes. I'm not giving up my great seat because of one rude boy. Still, I hope Landon arrives soon so I won't feel so alone with Hardin. Tess? Hardin whispers as the class begins to fill up. No. Don't answer him. Ignore him, I repeat to myself. Tess, he says again, this time louder. Do not speak to me, Hardin, I say through my teeth. I avoid looking at him. I will not fall back into his trap. Oh come on, he says, and I can tell he thinks this is all funny. My tone is harsh, but I don't care, I mean it, Hardin, leave me alone. Fine, have it your way, he says equally harshly, and I sigh. Landon walks in, and I am so grateful. Seeing the tension between Hardin and me, he asks in his kind tone, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, I lie, and class begins. Hardin and I continue ignoring each other all week, and each day, that passes without talking to him makes it a little easier to not think about him so much. Steph and Tristan have been hanging out all week, so I've had our room mostly to myself, which has been both good and bad. Good because I get a lot of studying done, but bad because I am left alone with my thoughts about Hardin. All week I have been wearing a little bit more makeup, but still my baggy and conservative clothes. By Friday morning, I feel like I am really over this whole mess with Hardin. That is, until everyone keeps talking about partying at the frat house. Seriously, there is a party there every Friday, and usually Saturday too, so why they feel the need to get excited about it every weekend blows my mind. After being asked by at least 10 people if I will be at the party, I decide to do the only thing that I know will keep me from going. I call Noah. Hey, Tessa, he chirps into the phone. It has been a few days since we've actually talked and I've missed his voice. Hey, do you think you could come visit me? I ask. Sure, yeah. Maybe I can come next weekend? I groan. No, I mean like today. Like now. Could you leave right now? I know he likes to plan things just like I do, but I need him to come now. Tessa, I have practice after school. I am still at school now, just at lunch, he explains. Please, Noah, I really miss you. Can't you just leave now and come here for the weekend? Please? I know I'm begging, but I don't care. Um yeah, sure, Tessa. I'll come now. Is everything okay? Happiness floods me, I'm really surprised that squeaky clean Noah is agreeing to this, but I am so glad he is. Yeah, I just really miss you. I haven't seen you in almost two weeks, I remind him. He laughs. I miss you too. I am going to get a slip and leave in a few minutes, so I will see you in about three hours. I love you, Tessa. I love you too, I say and hang up. Well, that settles that. Any chance that I might have ended up at that party is now gone. A newfound sense of relief fills me as I walk to literature and into the gorgeous old brick building the class is in. That sense of relief vanishes when I walk into the classroom and see Hardin hovering over Landon's desk. What the hell? I rush over just as Hardin slams his hand on the desk and growls, don't ever say some shit like that again, you prick. Landon moves to stand up but he would be insane to try to fight Hardin. Landon is muscular and all, but he's so kind I can't imagine him hitting anyone. 
I grab hold of Hardin's arm and pull him back away from Landon. His other hand rises into the air and I flinch, but once he realizes it's me, he drops his hand and curses under his breath. Leave him alone, Hardin. I yell and turn to Landon. He looks just as mad as Hardin does, but he sits down. Do you need to mind your own business, Teresa, Hardin snidely says, and moves to his seat. He really should sit in the back somewhere. Sitting between them, I lean over and whisper to Landon, are you okay? What was that about? He looks toward Hardin and sighs. He is just an asshole. That pretty much sums it up, he says loudly, and puts on a chipper grin. I giggle a little and straighten up. I can hear Hardin's ragged breathing next to me, and I get an idea. A childish idea, but I do it anyway. I have some good news. I tell Landon in my best Mokshiri voice. Really? What's that? Noah's coming to visit today, and he'll be here all weekend. I say and smile, while clapping my hands together. I know I am overdoing it, but I feel Hardin's eyes on me, and I know he heard me. Really? That is great news? Landon says earnestly. Class begins and ends without Hardin saying a word to me. This is how it will be from now on, and it's fine with me. I wish Landon a nice weekend and walk back to my room to touch up my makeup and grab something to eat before Noah gets here. I laugh at myself a little while doing my makeup. Since when am I the type of girl who has to touch up her makeup before her boyfriend comes? I sense that it's since that day at the stream with Hardin an experience that changed me, though the way he hurt me after changed me even more. The makeup is only a slight change, but I know it is there. I eat and straighten my room up a little, folding Steph's clothes and putting them away. I hope you won't mind. Noah finally texts that he's here, and I jump off the bed where I was resting and rush outside to greet him. He looks better than ever in navy blue pants, a cream cardigan, and a white shirt underneath. He really does wear a lot of cardigans, but I love them. His welcoming smile warms my heart, and he wraps his arms around me and tells me how nice it is to see me. As we walk back to my room, he looks at me for a moment and asks, are you wearing makeup? Yeah, a little. It's just something I have been experimenting with, I explain. He smiles. It looks nice, he says, and kisses my forehead. In my room, we end up browsing through the romantic comedy section on Netflix to pick a movie. Steph texts me and says she is with Tristan and won't be back tonight, so I turn the lights off and we sit back against my headboard, Noah's arm around my shoulder and my head on his chest. This is me, I think, not some wild girl swimming in a punk boy's t-shirt. We start up a movie that I've never heard of before and not five minutes into it the door bursts opens. I immediately figure that maybe Steph has forgotten something she needs. But of course it's Hardin. His eyes go straight to where Noah and I are cuddled on the bed, illuminated by the TV light. I flush. He has come here to tell Noah, I know it. Panic takes over my body, and I scoot away from my boyfriend, making it seem like I just made a surprised little jump. What are you doing here? I snap. You can't just barge in here. Hardin smiles. I'm meeting Steph, he answers and sits down. Hey, Noah, nice to see you again. He smirks and Noah looks uncomfortable. He is probably wondering why Hardin has a key to the room and doesn't bother to knock. She's with Tristan, probably already at your house, I tell him slowly, silently pleading for him to leave. If he tells Noah now, I have no idea how I could recover. Oh, he says. I can tell by his smirk. That he came here just to torment me. He will probably stay until I come clean to Noah myself. Are you two coming to the party? No we aren't. We're trying to watch a movie, I tell him, and Noah reaches over and takes my hand. Even in the dark, I can see Hardin's eyes focus on where Noah's hand touches mine. That's too bad. I better go he turns toward the door, and I feel some relief. But then he twists back. Oh, and, Noah, he begins, making my heart drop. That's a nice cardigan you're wearing. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding. Thanks. It's from the Gap, Noah says. He is clueless and unaware that Hardin is making fun of him. I can see that. Do you two have fun, Hardin says and leaves the room. 
Chapter 28. He's not so bad, I guess, Noah says when the door closes. I laugh nervously. What? And when he raises his eyebrow at me, I continue, nothing, I am just surprised to hear you say that. I lie back onto his chest. The electricity that filled the room moments ago has dissolved. I'm not saying I would want to hang out with the guy, but he was friendly enough. Harden is nothing even close to friendly, I say, and. Noah chuckles and wraps his arm around me. If he only knew the things that happened between Harden and me, the way we kissed, the way I moaned his name while he, God, Tessa, just stop. I lean my head up and kiss Noah's jaw, making him smile. I want Noah to make me feel the way Harden does. I sit up and turn to face him. I take his face between my hands and press my lips against his. His mouth opens and he kisses me back. His lips are soft just like his kiss. It's not enough. I need the fire, I need the passion. I wrap my hands around his neck and pull myself onto his lap. Whoa, Tessa, what are you doing? He asks and tries to push me off gently. What? Nothing, I just I want to make out, I guess, I say and look down. I am usually not embarrassed in front of Noah, but this isn't something we usually talk about. Okay, he says, and I kiss him again. I feel warmth from him, but not the fire. I start to rock my hips, hoping to light it somehow. His hands go down to my waist, but he pushes them against me, stopping my movements. I know we agree to wait until marriage, but we're just kissing here. I grab his hands and pull them away and continue to rock against him. No matter how many times I try to kiss him harder, his mouth stays soft and timid. I can feel him getting turned on, but he won't act on it. I know I am doing this for all the wrong reasons, but I don't care at the moment, I just need to know that Noah can do to me what Hardin does. It isn't actually Hardin that I want, it's the feeling isn't it? I stop kissing Noah and slide off his lap. That was nice, Tessa. He smiles and I give him one back. It was nice. He is so careful, too careful, but I love him. I press play on the movie, and within minutes I feel myself drifting off. I should go, Hardin says. His green eyes looking down at me. Go where? I don't want him to go. I am going to stay at a hotel close by. I'll come back in the morning, he says, and after I stare at him a moment, his face fades into Noah's. I jolt up and wipe my eyes. Noah, it is Noah. It was never Hardin. You're obviously really sleepy, and I can't stay the night here, Noah says gently, and brushes my cheek. I want him to stay, but now I'm afraid of what I will see or say in my sleepy state. Noah clearly doesn't think it's decent for him to stay in my room anyway. Hardin and Noah are polar opposites. In every way. Okay, thank you again for coming, I mumble and he kisses me lightly on the cheek, before sliding out from under me. I love you, he says. I nod, bury my head back into my pillow, and descend into dreams I don't remember. The next morning, I wake up to Noah calling on the phone. He tells me he is on his way, so I roll out of bed and rush to the showers, wondering what Noah and I should do today. There isn't much to do around here, unless we go into town. Maybe I should text Landon and ask what there is to do around here besides party at a frat house. He seems to be my only friend who would know. Having decided to wear my gray pleated skirt and a plain blue shirt, I ignore Hardin's voice in the back of my head telling me that it's ugly, and dress in the stall. Noah is in the hall waiting by my door as I return with a towel still in my hair. You look lovely, he says with a smile, and puts his arm over my shoulder as I open the door. I just need to do my hair, and put a little makeup on, I tell him, and grab Steph's makeup bag, which I'm glad she didn't take with her. I will need to get some of my own now that I know I like the way it looks. Noah sits patiently on my bed as I dry my hair and curl the ends. I stop and give him a kiss on the cheek before I apply my makeup. What do you want to do today? I finish with mascara and fluff my hair. College really suits you, Tessa. You have never looked better, Noah says. I don't know, maybe we can go to a park or something, then dinner. I look at the clock. How's it already 1 p.m.? I text Steph and tell her I will be out most of the day, 
and she responds saying she will be gone until tomorrow. She basically lives at Hardin's fraternity house on the weekends. Noah opens the passenger door of his Toyota. His parents made sure he had the safest car, the newest model. The interior is spotless, no stacks of books, no dirty clothing. We drive around to find a park, which only takes a little bit. It's a small, quiet space with half green, half yellowing grass and a few trees. As we pull into a spot, Noah asks, hey, when are you going to start looking for a car? I think this week, actually. I am going to apply for jobs this week too. I don't mention the internship advanced publishing that hard and dangled in front of me. I don't know if I can still get it or how I tell Noah if I did. That is great news. Let me know if you need any help with either of those, he says. We walk around the park once and then sit at a picnic table. Noah talks most of the time, and I nod along. I find myself zoning in and out of the conversation, but he doesn't seem to notice. We end up walking a little more, and come to a small stream. I snort at the irony and Noah looks at me quizzically. Do you want to swim? I ask, not quite sure why I push this moment further. In there? No way, he says, laughing, and as I deflate a little, I mentally smack myself. I need to stop comparing Noah to Hardin. I was just joking, I lie, and drag him along down the trail. It is 7, before we leave the park, so we decide to order pizza, when we get back to my room and watch a classic, Meg Ryan falling in love with Tom Hanks through a radio show. I am starving by the time the pizza comes, so I eat almost half of it myself. In my defense, I haven't eaten all day. Halfway through the movie my phone rings and Noah reaches over to grab it for me. Who's Landon, he asks. There is no suspicion in his voice, only curiosity. He has never been the jealous type, he never needed to be. Until now, my subconscious reminds me. He's a friend from school, I say and answer. Why would Landon be calling me so late? He's never called me for anything other than to compare notes. Tessa? Landon says loudly. Yeah, is everything okay? Um, well, no, actually. I know Noah is there but he hesitates. What's wrong, Landon? My heart starts to race. Are you okay? Yeah, it's not me. It's Harden. Panic overtakes me. H. Harden? I stutter. Yeah, if I give you an address can you come here please? I hear something crash in the background. I jump off my bed and I have my shoes on before my mind catches up. Noah stands up too, almost as if in sympathy. Landon, is Hardin trying to hurt you? My mind can't make sense of what else could be going on. No, no, he says. Text me the address, I tell him, and then hear another crash. I turn to Noah. Noah, I need your car. His head turns sideways. What is going on? I don't know it's Hardin. Give me your keys, I demand. He reaches into his pocket and pulls them out, but says insistently, I'm coming with you. But I snatch the keys from his hands and shake my head. No, you I need to go alone. My words hurt him. He looks hurt. And I know it's wrong to leave him here, but right now the only thing I can think about is getting to Harden. Chapter 29 Landon's text reads 2875 Cornell Road, which I copy, and paste into my maps program, which says the drive is 15 minutes. What could be going on there that Landon could possibly need me? I'm just as confused when I arrive at the address as I was when I left my room. Noah has called twice, both of which I've ignored. I need the navigation to stay on the screen, and, honestly, the confused look on his face when I left him there is haunting me. The houses on the street are all large and look like mansions. This house in particular is at least three times larger than my mother's. It's an old-fashioned brick house with a sloped yard that makes it appear to be sitting on a hill. Even under the streetlights, it's beautiful. I'm guessing this must be Hardin's father's house, since this doesn't belong to a college kid, and it's the only reason why Landon would be here as well. I take a deep breath, get out, and walk up the steps from the sidewalk. I knock hard on the dark mahogany door, and it opens within seconds. Tessa, thank you for coming. I'm sorry, I know you have company. 
is Noah with you? Landon asks and looks out to the car, while gesturing me inside. No, he's back at the dorms. What's going on? Where's Hardin? The backyard. He is out of control. He sighs. And I am here because I ask as nicely as I can. What does Hardin being out of control have to do with me? I don't know, I knew you hate him, but you do talk to him. He's really drunk, completely belligerent. He showed up here and opened a bottle of his father's scotch. He drank over half the bottle. And then he started breaking things. All my mother's dishes, a glass cabinet, basically everything he could get his hands on. What? Why? Hardin told me he doesn't drink was the lie, too. His dad just told him that he and my mother are getting married okay? I'm still confused. So Hardin doesn't want them to get married? I ask as Landon leads me through the large kitchen, where I gasp as I take in the huge mess Hardin has made. Broken dishes are scattered across the floor, and a large wooden cabinet has been knocked over, its glass panels shattered. No, but it's a long story. Right after his dad called and told him, they left town for the weekend to celebrate. I think that's why Hardin came here, to confront his dad. He never comes here, he explains and opens the back door. I see a shadow sitting at a small table on the patio. Hardin. I don't know what you think I can do, but I'll try. Landon nods. He leans down and puts his hand on my shoulder. He was calling out for you, he tells me quietly, and my heart stops. I walk toward Hardin, and he looks up at me. His eyes are bloodshot, and his hair is hidden under a gray beanie. His eyes go wide, then darken, and I want to step back. He looks almost scary under the dim patio light. How did you get here? Hardin says loudly and stands up. Landon he I answer, then wish I hadn't. You fucking called her? He yells toward Landon, who for his part walks back inside. Do you leave him alone, Hardin? He is worried about you, I scold. He sits back down, gesturing for me to take a seat too. I sit across from him and watch as he grabs the mostly empty bottle of dark liquor and puts it to his mouth. I watch his Adam's apple move as he gulps it down. When he's finished, he slams the bottle down onto the glass of the patio table, and it makes me jump, thinking either the bottle or the table or both might break. Oh, aren't you two something? You both are so predictable. Poor Hardin is upset, so you gang up on me and try to make me feel bad for breaking some shitty china, he drawls with a sick smirk. I thought you don't drink? I ask him, and cross my arms. I don't. Until now, I guess. Don't try to patronize me. You're no better than me. He points a finger at me, then grabs the bottle for another swig. And it's scary, but I can't deny that being near him, even in his drunken state, breathes life into me. I have missed the feeling Hardin gives me. I never said I was better than you. I just want to know what made you drink now? What does it matter to you? Where's your boyfriend? His eyes blaze into mine and the emotion behind them is so strong that I am forced to look away. If only I knew what that emotion was. Hatred, I suppose. He's back in my room. I just want to help you, Hardin. I lean a little over the table to reach for his hand, but he recoils from my touch. Help me, he cackles. I want to ask him why he was calling out for me, if he is going to continue to be hateful but I don't want to throw Landon under the bus again. If you want to help me, then leave. Why won't you just tell me what's going on? I look down at my hands and pick up my fingernails. He sighs and pulls his beanie off and runs his hand through his hair before pulling it back on. My father decided to tell me just now that he is marrying Karen and the wedding's next month. He should have told me long ago and not over the phone. I'm sure perfect little Landon's known for a while, Oh. I hadn't actually expected him to tell me, so I am not sure what to say. I am sure he had his reasons not to tell you. You don't know him. He doesn't give a shit about me. Do you know how many times I have talked to him in the last year? Maybe ten. All he cares about is his big house, his new soon-to-be wife, and his new, perfect son. Hardin slurs and takes another drink. I stay quiet while he continues. You should see the dump that my mum lives in in England. She says she likes it there, but I know she doesn't. It's smaller than my dad's bedroom here. 
my mom practically forced me to come here for university, to be closer to him, and we see how that worked out. With this little bit of information he has given me, I feel like I can understand him so much better. Hardin's hurt. That's why he is the way he is. How old were you when he left? I ask him. He eyes me warily but answers. 10. But even before he left, he was never around. He was at a different bar every night. Now he's Mr. Perfect, and he has all this shit, Hardin says and waves his hand toward the house. Hardin's dad left when he was 10, just like mine, and they were both drunks. We have more in common than I thought. This wounded and drunk Hardin seems so much younger, so much more fragile than the powerful person I've known so far. I'm sorry that he left you guys, but, no, I don't need your pity, he interrupts. It's not pity. I'm just trying to, trying to what? Help you. Be here for you, I say softly. And he smiles. It's a beautifully haunting smile, and makes me hopeful, that I can help him through this, but I know what is really about to happen. You are so pathetic. Don't you see, that I don't want you here? I don't want you to be here for me. Just because I messed around with you doesn't mean I want anything to do with you. Yet here you are, leaving your nice boyfriend, who can actually stand to be around you, to come here and try to help me. That, Teresa, is the definition of pathetic, he says, punctuating it with air quotes. His voice is full of venom, just like I knew it would be, but I ignore the pain in my chest and look at him. You don't mean that. I think back to a week ago when he was laughing, and tossing me into the water. I can't decide if he is a great actor or a great liar. I do, though, go home, he tells me, and raises the bottle to take another drink. Reaching across the table, I snatch it from him and toss it into the yard. What the hell, he yells, but I ignore him and walk toward the back door. I hear him scramble, and then he steps in front of me. Where are you going? His face is inches from mine. I am going to help Landon clean up the mess you made, and then I am going home. My voice comes out much calmer than I feel. Why would you help him? The disgust in his voice is clear. Because he, unlike you, deserves for someone to help him, I say and his face falls. I should be saying much more to Hardin. I should scream at him for the hurtful things he just said to me, but I know that is what he wants. This is what he does, he hurts everyone near him and he gets a kick out of the chaos, that comes out of that. Hardin quietly steps out of my way. When I go inside, I find Landon crouched over, pulling the cabinet upright. Where's the broom? I ask when he's done. Landon looks at me with a thankful smile. Right over there, he says, motioning to the broom. Thank you for everything. I nod and begin sweeping up the smashed dishes. There are just so many. I feel terrible that when Landon's mom comes back she'll find all of her dishes gone. I hope they didn't have any sentimental value to her. Ouch. I gasp when a small piece of glass digs into my finger. Droplets of blood fall onto the wooden floor, and I jump up to reach the sink. Are you okay? Landon asks, worried. Yeah, it's just a little piece, I don't know why there is so much blood. It really doesn't hurt that bad. I close my eyes as the cold water runs over my finger, and after a couple of minutes I hear the back door open. I snap my eyes open and turn to see Hardin standing in the doorway. Tessa, can I talk to you please, he asks. I know I should say no, but something about the redness around his eyes makes me nod. His eyes look to my hand, and then the blood on the floor. He walks over to me quickly. Are you okay? What happened? It's nothing, just a little glass I tell him. He reaches for my hand and pulls it out from under the water. And when he touches my arm, I feel the electricity. Looking at my finger, he frowns, then lets it go, walking over to Landon. He was just calling me. Pathetic, now he is acting all concerned about my health? He is going to make me crazy, literally crazy, as in locked in a padded room. Where are the band-aids, he practically demands of Landon and Landon tells him they're in the bathroom. Within a minute heart in his back, and he grabs my hand again. First he squeezes some antibacterial gel onto my cut, then he wraps a band-aid around my finger gently. I stay quiet, as confused by Hardin's actions as Landon looks. 
Can I talk to you please? He asks again, and thought I know I shouldn't, since when do I do what I should when Hardin is involved? I nod, and he wraps his fingers around my wrist, and leads me outside. Chapter 30. I am sorry, he says with an intensity, that makes me look away, and focus on the large tree in the backyard. He leans in close. Did you hear me? He asks. Yeah, I heard you, I snap and stare back at him. He is crazier than I thought, if he thinks he can just say sorry, and I will forget the horrible things he continues to do to me on an almost daily basis. You're so damn difficult to deal with, he says and sits back on his chair. The bottle I tossed into the yard is now in his hand, and he takes another drink from it. How's he not passed out yet? I am difficult? Do you have to be kidding me? What do you expect me to do, Hardin? You are cruel to me, so cruel, I say and pull my bottom lip between my teeth. I will not cry in front of him again. Noah has never made me cry, we have been in a few fights over the years, but I have never been upset enough to cry. His voice is low, and almost feels like it's part of the night air I don't mean to be. Yes, you do, and you know it. You do it purposefully. I have never been treated this poorly by anyone in my entire life. I bite my lip harder. I can feel the knot in my throat. If I cry, he wins. That's what he wants. Then why do you keep coming around? Why not just give up? If I I don't know. But I can assure you that after tonight I am not going to. I am going to drop literature and just take it next semester. I hadn't planned on doing that until now, but it is exactly what I should do. Don't, please don't do that. Why would you care? You don't want to be forced. To be around someone as pathetic as me, right? My blood is boiling. If I knew what to say to hurt him as bad as he always hurts me, I would. I didn't mean that I'm the pathetic one. I look straight at him. Well, I won't argue with that. He takes another drink, and when I reach for the bottle, he pulls it away. So you're the only one who can get drunk? I ask, and a wry smile appears on his face. The patio light shines off his eyebrow ring as he hands me the bottle. I thought you were going to toss it again. I should, but instead I put the bottle to my lips. The liquor is warm and tastes like burnt liquor is dipped in rubbing alcohol. I gag and harden chuckles. How often do you drink? Do you imply before it was never, I say. I need to get back to being angry with him after he answers. Before tonight it has been about six months. His eyes fall to the floor like he is ashamed. Well, you shouldn't drink at all. It makes you an even worse person than usual. Still staring at the ground, his face is serious. You think I am a bad person? What, is he that drunk, that he would ever consider himself good? Yes. I'm not. Well, maybe I am. I want you to he starts, but then stops, straightens up, and leans back on the chair. Do you want me to what? I have to know what he was going to say. I hand him back the bottle, but he sets it on the table. I don't want to drink, the one was bad enough, given the terrible judgment I have around Hardin as it is. Nothing he says, lying. Why am I even here? Noah is back in my room waiting for me, and here I am wasting even more time on Hardin. I should go. I stand up and head for the back door. Don't go his voice says softly. And my feet stop in their tracks at the pleading tone. I turn around to find Hardin less than a foot from me. Why not? Do you have more insults to throw in my face? I shout and turn away. His hand wraps around my arm and jerks me back. Don't turn your back on me. He shouts even louder than I did. I should have turned my back on you a long time ago. I scream and push against his chest. I don't know why I am even here. I came all the way here the second Landon called me. I left my boyfriend, who, like you said, is the only one who can stand to be around me. To come here for you. Do you know what? You're right, Hardin, I am pathetic. I am pathetic for coming here, I am pathetic for even trying, but I'm cut off by his lips against mine. I push at his chest to stop him, but he doesn't budge. Every part of me wants to kiss him back, but I stop myself. I feel his tongue trying to pry its way in between my lips, and his strong arms wrap around me, pulling me closer to him despite my attempts to push away. It's no use. He is stronger than me. Kiss me, Tessa, he says against my lips. 
I shake my head, and he grunts in frustration. Please, just kiss me. I need you his words unravel me. This indecent drunken terrible man just said he needs me, and somehow it sounds like poetry to my ears. Harden is like a drug, each time I take the tiniest bit of him, I crave more and more. He consumes my thoughts and invades my dreams. The second my lips part, his mouth is on mine again, but this time I don't resist. I can't. I know this isn't the answer to my problems, and that I'm just digging myself deeper, but that doesn't matter right now. All that matters is his words, and how he said them, I need you. Could Hardin possibly need me the way I desperately need him? I doubt it, but for right now I want to pretend that he does. He brings one of his hands to cup my cheek, and he runs his tongue along my bottom lip. I shudder and he smiles, his lip ring tickling the corner of my mouth. I hear a rustling noise and pull away. He lets me stop the kiss, but he keeps his arms wrapped tightly around me, his body pressed against mine. I look toward the back door, and pray that Landon didn't witness my terrible lapse of judgment. I don't see him, thank God. Harden, I really have to go. We can't keep doing this. It's not good for either of us, I tell him and look down. Yes, we can, he says and lifts my chin up, forcing me to look into his green eyes. No, we can't. You hate me, and I don't want to be your punching bag anymore. You confuse me. One minute you're telling me how much you can't stand me, or humiliating me after my most intimate experience. He opens his mouth to interrupt me, and I put my finger against his pink lips and continue. Then the next minute you're kissing me, and telling me you need me. I don't like who I am when I'm with you, and I hate the way I feel after you say terrible things to me. Who are you when you are with me? His green eyes steady my face, waiting for my reply. Someone I don't want to be, someone who cheats on their boyfriend and cries constantly I explain. Do you know who I think you are when you're with me? He runs his thumb along my jawline, and I try to stay focused. Who? Yourself. I think this is the real you, and that you're just too busy caring what everyone else thinks about you to realize it. I don't know what I think about this, but he sounds so honest, so sure of his answer that I take a second to really think about his words. And I know what I did to you, after I fingered you. He notices my scowl and continues. Sorry after our experience, I know it was wrong. I felt terrible after you got out of my car. I doubt that, I snap, remembering how much I cried that night. It's true, I swear it. I knew you think I'm a bad person, but you make me, he draws up short. Never mind. Why does he always stop? Finish that sentence, Hardin or I am leaving right now, I tell him. And mean it. The way his eyes seem to burn when he looks at me, the way his lips part slowly, as if every word will hold something, a lie or a truth, it makes me wait for his response. Do you make me want to be good, for you I want to be good for you, Tess. Chapter 31. I try to take a step back from him, but his grip is too strong. I must have heard him wrong. My emotions are getting the best of me, so I turn, and look out into the darkness of the backyard, trying to make sense of the meaning behind his words. Hardin wants to be better for me? In what way? He couldn't mean it could he? I look back at him, my eyes hazy. What? He looks unaffected truthful? Hopeful? What? Do you heard me? No. I'm sure I misunderstood. No, you didn't. You make me feel something unfamiliar. I don't know how to handle these types of feelings, Tessa, so I do the only thing I know how to do. He pauses and blows out a small breath. Which is be an asshole. Once again I find myself in a trance. This could never work, Hardin, we are so different. First off, you don't date, remember? We aren't that different, we like the same things. We both love books for example, he says, traces of liquor in his breath. Even standing here, I can't wrap my mind around the idea of Hardin trying to convince me that we could be good together. You don't date I remind him again. I know, but we could be friends? There it is. We are back to square one. I thought you said we couldn't be friends? And I won't be friends with you I know what you mean by that. You want all the benefits of being a boyfriend without actually having to commit. His body sways and he leans on the table and loosens his grip on me. Why is that so bad? 
Why do you need a label? I'm thankful for the space between us and the fresh, scotch-free air. Because, Harden, even though I've not really had a lot of restraint lately, I do have self-respect. I will not be your plaything, especially when it involves being treated like dirt. I raise my hands into the air. And besides, I'm already taken, Harden. Harden's evil dimples come out with his smirk. And yet, look where you are right now. Reflexively, I blurt out, I love him, and he loves me, and then watch Harden's expression change. He lets go of me, and stumbles over the chair. Don't say that to me. He slurs his words, which are coming out faster than before. I almost forgot how drunk he was. You're only saying this because you're drunk. Tomorrow you will go back to hating me. I don't hate you. He goes into the lawn a bit. I wish he didn't have this effect on me. I wish I could just walk away. But instead I stick around and hear him say, if you can look me in the eyes and tell me that you want me to leave you alone and never speak to you again, I will listen. I swear, from this point on I will never come near you again. Just say the words. I open my mouth to tell him just that. To tell him to stay far away from me, to tell him I never want to lay eyes on him again. He turns and comes closer. Tell me, Tessa, tell me that you never want to see me again. Then he's touching me. He runs his hands along my arms and goosebumps immediately raise on my skin. Tell me you never want to feel my touch again, he whispers, bringing his hand to my neck. His index finger traces along my collarbone and back up and down my neck. I hear my breathing quicken as he brings his lips less than an inch from mine. That you never want me to kiss you again, he says, and I can smell the scotch and feel the heat off his breath. Tell me, Teresa, he coos in thy whimper. Harden, I whisper. Do you can't resist me, Tessa, just as I can't resist you. His lips are close to mine, they are almost touching. Stay with me tonight, he asks, and makes me want to do whatever he says. The movement by the door catches my eye, and I jerk away from Harden. Looking up, I see Landon's face twisted with confusion before he turns away and disappears from the doorway. I am snapped back into reality. I have to go, I say and Harden curses under his breath. Please, please stay. Just stay with me tonight, and if you decide in the morning to tell me you don't want to see me anymore just please stay. I am begging you and I don't beg, Teresa. I find myself nodding before I can stop myself. And what will I tell Noah? He is waiting for me, and I have his car. I can't believe I am actually considering doing this. Just tell him that you have to stay, because I don't know. Don't tell him anything. What's the worst thing he can do? I shudder. He will tell my mother. Without a doubt. Irritation toward Noah fills me. I should not have to worry about my boyfriend telling my mother on me, even if I do something wrong. He is probably asleep anyway, Hardin says. No, he has no way to get back to his hotel. Hotel? Wait, he doesn't stay with you? No, he has a hotel room close by. And you stay there with him? No, he stays there, I say sheepishly, and I stay in my room. Is he straight? Hardin asks, his bloodshot eyes dancing in amusement. My eyes go wide. Of course he is. Sorry but something is not right there. If you were mine, I wouldn't be able to stay away from you. I would. Fuck you every chance I had. My mouth falls open. Hardin's dirty words have the strangest effect on me. I flush and look away. Let's go inside, I hear him say. The trees are swaying back and forth. I think that is my cue I've had way too much to drink. You're staying here? I had assumed he would go back to his frat house. Yeah and so are you. Let's go. He grabs my hand, and we walk toward the back door. I will have to find Landon and try to explain what he saw through the door. I don't know what's happening myself, so I'm not sure how I will explain it, but I have to make him understand somehow. As we walk through the kitchen, I notice the mess is almost completely cleaned up. You need to clean the rest of this tomorrow, I tell him and he nods. I will, he promises. Yet another promise I hope he keeps. My hand in his, he leads me up the grand staircase. I pray that we don't run into Landon in the hallway, 
and I am relieved when we don't. Hardin opens the door to a pitch black room and gently pulls me inside. Chapter 32. My eyes adjust to the darkness, but the only light is a small streak of moonlight coming through the bay window. Hardin? I whisper. I hear him curse as he trips over something, and I try not to laugh. I'm right here, he says and clicks on a desk lamp. I look around the large room, which reminds me of a hotel. A four-poster bed with dark linens is centered against the far wall and looks like a king size with at least 20 pillows on top. The desk is oversized and made of cherry wood, and the computer sitting on it has a bigger monitor than the television in my dorm room. The bay window has a built-in bench, while the other windows are masked with thick navy curtains that don't allow the moon to shine through. This is my room, he says and rubs the back of his neck with his hand. He looks almost embarrassed. Do you have a room here? I ask, but of course he does. It is his father's house and Landon obviously lives here. Landon had mentioned that Hardin never comes here, so maybe that is why it looks so museum-like, untouched and impersonal. Yet I haven't ever actually slept in it until tonight. He sits on the chest placed at the foot of the bed and unties his boots. He pulls his socks off and tucks them into the shoes. My heart swells at the idea that I am part of a first for Hardin. Oh. Why is that? I am taking advantage of his drunken honesty. Because I don't want to. I hate it here he answers quietly and unbuttons his black pants and pulls them down his legs. What are you doing? Getting undressed, he says, stating the obvious. I mean, why? Even though part of me is dying to feel his hands on me again, I hope he doesn't think I'm going to have sex with him. Well, I am not sleeping in skinny jeans and boots, he half laughs. His hand sweeps the hair off his forehead, making it stand straight up. Everything he does sends that wild feeling through my body. Oh. He pulls his shirt over his head, and I can't look away. His tattooed stomach is flawless. He tosses the t-shirt at me, but I don't catch it, letting it fall to the ground. I raise one eyebrow at him and he smiles. You can sleep in that. I assume you won't want to sleep in just your underwear. But of course, I am perfectly fine with it if you do. He winks and I giggle. Why am I giggling? I can't sleep in his t-shirt, I will feel too naked. I'm fine sleeping in this, I tell him he eyes my outfit. He hasn't made a single rude comment about my long skirt or loose blue blouse, so I hope he doesn't start now. Fine. Suit yourself. If you want to be uncomfortable, go ahead. He moves toward the bed in only his boxers and begins to toss the decorative pillows onto the floor. I walk over and open the chest, and just as I had thought, it is empty. Oh, don't throw those down. They go in here, I tell him, but he just laughs and tosses another onto the floor. Groaning, I gather the pillows and stuff them into the chest. He again chuckles and pulls back the comforter before plopping down onto the bed. He crosses his arms behind his head, then crosses his feet and gives me a smile. The words tattooed on his ribs are stretched because of the position of his arms. His long, lean body looks exquisite. You're not going to whine about sleeping in the bed with me, are you? He asks, and I roll my eyes. I actually wasn't going to. I know it's wrong, but I want to sleep in the bed with Hardin more than I think I have ever wanted anything. No, the bed is big enough for both of us, I say with a smile. I don't know if it's Hardin's smile or the fact that he's wearing only boxers, but I'm in a much better mood than before. Now that's the Tessa I love, he teases and my heart lurches at his choice of words. I know he doesn't, and would never, mean it that way, but it sounded, so nice coming off his lips. I climb onto the bed and scoot to the edge, as far away from Hardin's body as I can. Any farther and I'll fall off. I hear him chuckle, and I roll over on my side to face him. What is so funny? Nothing, he lies, and bites his lip trying not to laugh. I like this playful Hardin. His humor is contagious. Tell me. I pout and pucker out my bottom lip. His eyes go straight to my mouth, and he runs his tongue along his lips, before hooking his lip ring between his teeth. You've never slept in a bed with a guy before, have you? He rolls onto his side and moves a little closer to me. No, I simply answer, and his smile grows. 
We are only a couple of feet apart, and before I know what I'm doing, my hand reaches out and pokes the little dimple on his cheek. His eyes dart to mine in surprise. I start to pull my hand away, but he grabs it and puts it back against his cheek, then moves it up and down his cheek slowly. I don't know why no one has fucked you yet. All that planning you do must help you put up a really good resistance, he says, and I gulp. I've never really had to resist anyone, I admit. Guys in high school found me attractive and hit on me enough, but no one ever tried to actually have sex with me. They all knew I was with Noah. We were well liked and were both voted on to homecoming court every year. That's either a lie or you went to an all-blind high school. Your lips alone are enough to make me hard. I gasp at his words and he chuckles. He brings my hand to his mouth and runs it along his wet lips. His breath is hot against my fingers and I'm surprised when he bares his teeth and gently bites the pad of my index finger, somehow making me feel it in the pit of my stomach. He moves my hand down to his neck and my fingertips trace the swirl of an ivy branch tattoo on his neck. He watches me carefully but doesn't stop me. You like the way I talk to you, don't you? His expression is dark but so sexy. My breathing hitches and he smiles again. I can see the blush in your cheeks and I can hear the way your breathing has changed. Answer me, Tessa, put those full lips of yours to use, he says, and I giggle, I don't know what else to do. I will never admit the way his words turn something on deep inside of me. He lets go of my hand, but wraps his fingers around my wrist and closes the gap between us. I am hot, too hot. I need to cool down or I will start sweating soon. Can you turn the fan on? I ask and he furrows his brow. Please. He sighs but climbs off the bed. If you are hot, why don't you change out of those heavy clothes? That skirt looks itchy anyway. I have been waiting on him to tease me for my clothes, but this only makes me smile, since I can see his true motive here. You should dress for your body, Tessa. These clothes you wear hide all of your curves. If I hadn't seen you in your bra and panties, I would never know how sexy and curvy your body actually is. That skirt literally looks like a potato sack. I laugh, even though he is insulting me and somehow managing to compliment me at the same time. What do you suggest I wear? Fishnets and tube tops? No, well, I might love to see that, but no. You can still cover yourself, but wear clothes your size. That shirt hides your chest too, and your tits are nothing you should be hiding. Will you stop using those words? I scold him and he smiles. Rejoining me on the bed, he scoots his practically naked body close to mine. I am still hot, but Hardin's odd way of complimenting me has given me a new wave of confidence. I climb out of bed. Where are you going? He slurs, his voice panicked. To change, I say, and walk over to grab his t-shirt from the floor. Now turn around and don't peek. I put my hands on my hips. No. What do you mean, no? How can he be telling me no? I won't turn around. I want to see you. Oh, okay. But I just smile, shake my head, and turn the light off. Harden whines, and I smile to myself as I unzip my skirt. It pulls at my feet when another light clicks on. Harden. I hurry and pick the skirt back up. Harden is leaning up on his elbows to look at me and he isn't shy about his eyes moving up and down my body. He's seen me in less clothing before, and I know he isn't going to listen, so I take a deep breath and pull my shirt over my head. Not that I won't admit that I'm enjoying this little game we have going right now. I know deep down I want him to look at me, that I want him to want me. I'm wearing a plain white bra and white panties, nothing fancy or special, but Hardin's expression makes me feel sexy. I take his t-shirt and pull it over my head. It smells so good, just like Hardin. Come here, he whispers from where he lies. I ignore my subconscious telling me to run away as fast as I can and walk toward the bed. Chapter 33. Hardin's blazing eyes don't leave mine as I make my way to him. I prop my knee up on the bed and push myself onto it. At the same time, Hardin lifts himself up so his back is against the headboard and holds his hand out for mine. The second I place my small hand in his, he wraps his fingers around it and pulls me onto him. 
My knees go around his sides, and I am straddling his lap. I've done this before with him, but never wearing so little clothing. I hold myself up using my knees, so we aren't touching, but Hardin isn't having it. He positions his hands on my hips and gently pushes me down. His t-shirt bunches at my sides, bearing my thighs completely, and I am suddenly glad that I shaved my legs this morning. The second our bodies touch my stomach begins to stir. I know this happiness that I feel isn't going to last, and I feel like Cinderella, waiting for the clock to strike and end my blissful night. Much better, he says and gives me a crooked smile. I know he's drunk, and that's why he is being so nice, well, nice for him, but right now I will take it. If this is truly my last time around him, then this is how I want to spend it. I keep telling myself that. I can behave however I want tonight with Hardin, because when the daylight comes, I am going to tell him never to come near me again, and he will oblige. It's for the best, and I know that is what he will want when he isn't intoxicated. In my defense, I am just as intoxicated by Hardin as he is by the bottle of scotch he consumed. I keep telling myself that too. As Hardin continues to stare into my eyes, I begin to feel nervous. What should I do next? I have no idea where he wants to take this, and I don't want to make a fool out of myself by trying to do something first. He seems to notice my uncomfortable expression. What's wrong, he asks, and brings a hand to my face. His finger traces over my cheekbone, and my eyes involuntarily close at his surprisingly gentle touch. Nothing I just don't know what to do, I admit and look down. Do whatever you want to do, Tess. Don't overthink it. I lean back a little to create about a foot of space between our torsos, and bring my hand up to his bare chest. I look at him for permission and he nods. I press both hands against his chest softly, and he closes his eyes. My fingers trace the birds on his chest, and down to the dead tree on his stomach. His eyelashes flutter as I trace the scripture on his ribs. His expression is so calm, but his chest is moving up and down quicker than it was a few moments ago. I'm unable to control myself as I bring my hand down and run my index finger along the waistband of his boxers. His eyes shoot open, and he looks nervous. Harden, nervous? Can I untouch you? I ask with the hope that he gets what I mean without me having to say it. I feel detached from myself. Who is this girl straddling this punk boy and asking to touch him down there? I think back to what Harden said earlier about me being my true self with him. Maybe he is right. I love the way I feel right now. I love the electricity shooting through my body when we're like this. He nods. Please. So I lower my hand, keeping it on top of his boxers, and slowly I reach the slight bulge in the fabric. He sucks in a breath as I graze my hand over him. I don't know what to do, so I just keep touching it, running my fingers up and down. I am too nervous to look up at him, so I keep my eyes on his growing crotch. Do you want me to show you what to do? He asks quietly, his voice shaky. The usual cocky demeanor has shifted into something mysterious. I nod and he puts his hand over mine, bringing it down to touch him again. He opens my hand and makes my fingers cup around his length. When he sucks a breath between his lips, I look up at him through my lashes. He takes his hand off mine, giving me full control. Fuck, Tessa, don't do that he growls. Confused, I still my hand and am about to jerk it away when he speaks up. No, no, not that. Keep doing that I mean don't look at me that way. What way? That innocent way that look that makes me want to do so many dirty things to you. I want to throw myself back onto the bed and let him do whatever he wants. I want to be his, to be freed for a moment from whatever it is that makes me so scared sometimes. I give him a small smile and begin to move my hand again. I want to take his boxers off, but I'm afraid to. A moan escapes his lips and I tighten my grip. I want to hear that sound again. I don't know if I should move my hand faster or not, so I keep my movement slow and tight, and he seems to like it. I lean in and press my lips against the clammy skin of his neck, causing him to moan again. Fuck, Tess, your hand feels so good wrapped around me. I give him a little tighter squeeze and he winces. Not that hard, baby, he says in a voice that's soft 
and sounds like it could never be the same one that mocked me before. Sorry, I say and kiss his neck again. My tongue runs over the skin beneath his ear and his body jumps. His hands go to my chest, and he cups my breasts beneath his hands. Can I take off your bra? His voice is so uncontrolled and raspy, I'm amazed by the effect I am having on him. I nod and his eyes light up in excitement. His hands are shaky as he reaches under the shirt and up my back, unclasping my bra, as soon as his fingers touch the strap with a dexterity that makes me think for a minute about how many times he has done this before. I force the thoughts to the back of my mind and Hardin slides the straps down my arms, making me let go of him. Tossing my bra off the bed, he returns his hands up under my shirt and grabs hold of my breasts again. His fingers lightly pinch my nipples as he leans forward to kiss me. I moan into his mouth and reach down and grab his length again. Oh, Tessa, I'm going to come, he says, and I feel the wetness growing in my panties, even though he is only touching my chest. I feel like I may come too, from his moans and his gentle assault against my breasts alone. His legs tense under me, and his kiss becomes sloppier. His hands drop down by his sides, and I feel a wetness spread through his boxers and pull my hand away. I have never made anyone else come before. My chest heats, filling with a strange new sense that I'm now one step closer to being a woman. Staring down at the wet spot on Hardin's boxers, I love the control I feel over him. I love that I could bring his body pleasure the way he does mine. Hardin's head rolls back and he takes a few deep breaths while I sit on his thighs, unsure what to do. After a moment, his eyes open and he lifts his head back up to look at me. A lazy smile crosses his face, and he leans forward to kiss me on my forehead. I have never come like that before he says, and I am back to being embarrassed. It was that bad? I ask and try to move off his legs. He stops me. What? No, you were that good. It usually takes more than someone just grabbing me through my boxers. A pang of jealousy hits me. I don't want to think about all the other girls that have made Hardin feel this way. He takes in my silence and cups my cheek, brushing his thumb along my temple. I am comforted by the fact that the others had to do more than I did, but I still wish there weren't any others. I don't know why I bother to feel this way, Hardin and I are still unresolved. We are never going to date or be anything other than this, but right now, I just want to live in the moment, just the two of us. I laugh a little as the thought crosses my mind. I am not alive in the moment type of person at all. What are you thinking, he asks, but I shake my head. I don't want to tell him about my jealous thoughts. It's not fair, and I don't want that conversation. Oh come on, Tessa, just tell me, he says, and I shake my head again. In a very unhardened move he grabs hold of my hips and begins to tickle me. I scream with laughter and fall off him and onto the soft bed. He continues to tickle me until I can't breathe. His laughter booms through the room and it's the most beautiful sound I have ever heard. I have never heard him laugh this way and something tells me hardly anyone has. Despite his flaws, his many flaws, I consider myself lucky to see him in this moment. Okay okay. I will tell you. I screech and he stops. Good choice, he says. But looking down, he adds, but hold that thought. I need to change my boxers. I blush. Chapter 34. Harding goes over to his dresser and opens the top drawer, pulling out a pair of blue and white plaid boxers, and holds them up in the air with a disgusted look on his face. What? I ask, and prop my head up on my elbow and look at him. These are hideous, he says. I laugh, but I'm also pleased that the earlier secret about whether or not there were clothes in the dresser is now settled at least. Landon's mother or Hardin's father must have purchased all the clothes in the room for Hardin. Which is sad, really, that they would buy clothes and fill the dresser in hopes that Hardin would come around sometime. They aren't so bad, I tell him, and he rolls his eyes. I doubt anything will look as good as Hardin's usual black boxer briefs, but then again I can't imagine anything looking actually bad on him. Well, beggars can't be choosers. Back in a minute, he says and walks out of the room wearing only his wet boxers. 
Oh God, what if Landon sees him? I will be humiliated. I need to find Landon first thing in the morning, to explain the turn of events. But, really, what am I going to say? It's not what it looked like. We were just talking, and then I agreed to stay the night, and somehow I ended up in my panties and a t-shirt, and then gave him the closest thing to a handjob that I know of. That sounds terrible. I lay my head onto the pillows and stare at the ceiling. I consider getting up and checking my phone, but decide against it. The last thing I need right now is to read texts from Noah. He is probably panicking, but, honestly, as long as he doesn't tell my mother, I don't care as much as I should. If I'm completely honest with myself, I haven't felt the same about Noah since I kissed Hardin for the first time. I know I love Noah. I have always loved Noah. But. I'm beginning to question whether I really love him as a boyfriend and someone I could spend my life with, or if I love him, because he has always been such a stable person in my life. He's always been there for me, and on paper we're perfect for each other, but I can't ignore the way I feel when I'm with Hardin. I've never had these types of feelings before. Not just when we're on top of each other, but the way he gives me butterflies, just by looking at me, the way I find myself desperately wanting to see him, even when I'm fuming mad at him, and, mostly, the way he always invades my thoughts, even when I try to convince myself that I hate him. Hardin has gotten under my skin, no matter how hard I try to deny it. I'm in his bed instead of with Noah. On cue, the door opens, and I am snapped from my thoughts. I look up and see Hardin in the clean plaid boxers and giggle. They are a little too big and much longer than his briefs, but they still look great. I like them. I smile and he glares at me before turning out the light and switching on the television. He climbs back onto the bed and lies down close to me. So, what were you going to tell me, he asks, and I cringe. I was hoping he wouldn't bring it up again. Don't be shy now. You've just made me come in my boxers, he jokes and then pulls me closer to him. I bury my head in the pillow, and he laughs. I pull my head up and Hardin tucks my hair behind my ear, before giving me a soft kiss on my lips. It's the first time he has kissed me that tenderly, and yet it feels more intimate than when we kiss with tongue. He lays his head back on the pillow and changes the channel. I want him to hold me until I fall asleep but I get the feeling Hardin is not a cuddling type of guy. I want to be good for you, Tess. Hardin's words from earlier tonight play in my head and I wonder if he meant them or if he was just really drunk. Are you still drunk? I ask and lay my head on his chest. His body stills, but he doesn't push me off. No, I think our little screaming match in the yard sobered me up, he says. One of his hands is holding the remote and the other is hanging in the air awkwardly as if he doesn't know what to do with it. Oh, well, at least something good came out of it. He turns his head and looks down at me. Yeah, I guess so he says, and finally puts his hand on my back. It's an amazing feeling having him hold me. No matter what terrible thing he says to me tomorrow, he can't take this moment away from me. This is my new favorite place to be, my head on his chest and his arm on my back. I think I actually like drunk Hardin better. I yawn. Is that so? He says and turns to look at me again. Maybe, I tease and close my eyes. You're terrible at distractions. Now, tell me. I might as well just tell him. I know he isn't going to drop it. Well, I was just thinking of all the girls you've you know, done things with. I try to hide my face in his chest, but he drops the remote on the bed and tilts my chin up to look at him. Why were you thinking about that? I don't know because I have literally no experience and you have a lot. Steph included, I answer. The image of the two of them together makes me nauseous. Are you jealous, Tess? His voice is full of humor. No, of course not, I lie. So you don't mind if I tell you a few details, then? No. Please don't. I beg, and he chuckles and wraps his arm a little tighter around me. He doesn't say anything else about it and I could not be more relieved. I couldn't bear to hear the details of his flings. I feel my eyes getting heavier and try to focus on the television. I am so comfortable lying here in his arms. You're not going to sleep, are you? It's still early, he says, barely breaking through my haze. 
Is it? It feels like it has to be at least two in the morning. I arrived here around nine. Yeah, it's only midnight. That isn't early. I yawn again. To me it is. Plus, I want to return the favor. What? Oh. My skin is starting to tingle already. Do you want me to, don't you? He purrs, and I gulp. Of course I do. I look up at him, and try to hide my eager smile. He notices and with a swift, delicate motion flips us over, so he is hovering above me. He supports his weight with one arm, while his other hand reaches lower. I bring my leg up to his side, and when my knee bends he runs his hand from my ankle to the top of my thigh. So soft, he says and repeats the motion. He gives my thigh a light squeeze, and my skin is covered in goosebumps within seconds. Hardin leans over and places a single kiss on the side of my knee, causing my leg to jerk. He grabs it and laughs, hooking his arm around it. What is he going to do? The anticipation is driving me crazy. I want to taste you, Tessa, he says, eyes locked on mine to gauge my reaction. My mouth is instantly parched. Why is he asking to kiss me, when he knows he can do that any time? I part my lips and wait for him. No. Down here, he corrects me, bringing his hand in between my legs. My lack of experience must astound him, but he at least tries to fight his smile. I frown at him, and his finger touches me over my panties, causing me to suck in a breath. His finger makes soft strokes over my sex as he continues to look into my eyes. You're already wet for me. His voice is raspier than usual. His hot breath stings my ear, and he runs his tongue along my earlobe. Talk to me, Tessa. Tell me how badly you want it. He smirks and I squirm as he applies more pressure to my sensitive area. I can't find my voice, because my body is on fire from his touch. After a few more seconds he pulls his hand away and I whimper. I didn't want you to stop, I whine. You didn't say anything, he snaps, and I recoil. I don't want this Harden. I want the laughing, playful. Harden. Couldn't you tell? I ask him, and move to sit up. He pulls himself up, and sits on my thighs, holding his weight on his parted knees. He brushes his fingers across the tops of my thighs and my body instantly reacts, shifting my hips to meet his. Say it, Hardin instructs. I know that he is well aware that I do. He just wants to make me say it aloud. I nod and he waves his finger back, and forth in front of me. No nodding, just tell me what you want, baby, he says, and climbs off of my knees. I mentally weigh the pros and cons of this situation. Is the humiliation of telling Hardin that I want him to kiss me down there worth the feeling I will get from him doing it? If it feels anywhere near as good as what Hardin did to me with his fingers the other day, then I know it's worth it. I reach out and grab his bare shoulder to stop him from moving any farther away from me. I'm overthinking this, I know I am, but my mind won't stop racing. I want you to. I move closer to him. Want me to what, Teresa? He has to be kidding me. He knows exactly what he's doing. You know to kiss me, I say and his smile grows. He leans over and plants a kiss on my lips. I roll my eyes, and he kisses my lips again. Is that what you wanted, he says with a smirk, and I swat his arm. He is going to make me beg him. Kiss me there. I blush and cover my face with my hands. He pulls them away, laughing, and I frown at him. You're embarrassing me on purpose. I scowl. His hands are still on mine. I'm not meaning to embarrass you. I just want to hear you say what you want from me. Never mind, Hardin, I say and sigh loudly. Because I am embarrassed, and maybe my hormones are going haywire and messing with my emotions, but now the moment has passed, and I'm annoyed with his ego and constant need to goad me. I roll over and lie on my side, facing away from him, and cover myself with a blanket. Hey, I'm sorry, he says, but I ignore him. I know part of me is just annoyed at myself that being around Hardin has turned me into a typical hormonal teenager. Good night, Hardin, I snap and hear him sigh. He mutters something under his breath, that sounds like fine, but I don't ask him to repeat it. I force my eyes closed, and try to think of anything besides Hardin's tongue, or the way his arm just draped across my body as I fall asleep. Chapter 35. I am hot, too hot. 
I try to pull the covers off me, but they won't budge. When my eyes open, the night before comes flooding into my mind, Hardin screaming at me in the yard, the scotch on his breath, the broken glass in the kitchen, Hardin kissing me, Hardin moaning as I touched him, his wet boxers. I try to lift myself, but he's too heavy, his head lying across my chest, and his arm wrapped around my waist, his body cloaking mine. I'm surprised we ended up like this. He must have moved this way in his sleep. I do admit, I don't want to leave this bed, leave Hardin, but I have to. I have to get back to my room. Noah is there. Noah. Noah. I gently push Hardin off by his shoulder, rolling him onto his back. Then he rolls onto his stomach and groans but doesn't wake. I hurry to my feet and grab my scattered clothes off the floor. Being the coward that I am, I want to be out of here by the time he wakes. Not that he'll mind. At least he won't have to invest his energy in hurting me on purpose if I leave on my own. This way is better for both of us. Regardless of how we laughed together last night, nothing is the same in the light of day. Hardin will remember how we got along pretty well last night and then will feel the need to be extra hateful to make up for it. It's what he does and I will not be around this time. For a second last night, the thought had crossed my mind that maybe our night together would change his mind, make him want to have more with me. But I know better, really. I fold his t-shirt neatly on the dresser and zip my skirt up. My shirt is wrinkled from lying on the floor last night, but that's really the least of my worries at the moment. I slip my feet into my shoes, and as I grab hold of the door handle, I think, one more look back won't hurt. I look back to the sleeping Hardin. His messy hair is sprawled onto the pillow, and his arm is now draped over the side of the bed. He looks so peaceful, so beautiful despite the pieces of metal in his face. I turn back around and turn the door handle. Tess. My heart drops. I slowly turn back around to Hardin, expecting to see his harsh green eyes glaring at me. But instead, they are closed. A frown is set on his face, but he is still asleep. I can't decide if I'm relieved that he's asleep or summer that he called out my name. Is that what he did or am I hearing things now? I jump out of the room and gently close the door behind me. I have no idea how to get out of this house. I walk straight down the hall and I am relieved to find the stairs easily. I pad down the stairs and nearly collide with Landon. My pulse quickens as I try to think of something to say. His eyes scan my face, and he stays silent, waiting for an explanation, I assume. Land and I, I have no idea what to say. Are you okay? He asks with concern. Yeah, I'm fine. I know you must think, I don't think anything. I really do appreciate you coming. I know you don't like Hardin, and it means a lot to me that you would come here to help get him in control. Oh. He is so nice, too nice. I almost want him to tell me. How disgusted he is that I stayed the night with Hardin, that I left my boyfriend alone in my room all night, after I took his car and ran to Hardin's rescue, just so I feel as bad as I should. So are you and Hardin friends again? He asks, and I shrug. I have no idea what we are. I have no idea what I'm doing. He just he I break into sobs. Landon wraps his arms around me in a warm and comforting hug. It's okay. I know he can be so terrible, Landon says softly. Wait he must think that I'm crying because Hardin did something terrible to me. He would probably never assume that I'm crying because of my feelings for Hardin. I need to get out of here before I ruin Landon's good opinion of me and before Hardin wakes up. I have to go. Noah is waiting, I say, and Landon gives me a sympathetic smile before saying goodbye. I get into Noah's car and drive back to my dorm as fast as I can, crying most of the way there. How will I explain this all to Noah? I know I have to, I can't lie to him. I just can't imagine how much this will hurt him. I'm a terrible person for doing this to him. Why couldn't I just stay away from Hardin? I've calmed myself as much as I can before I pull into the student lot. I walk as slow as I can, unsure how I'm going to face Noah. When I open the door to our room, I find Noah lying back on my small bed, staring at the ceiling. He jumps up when he sees me come in. Jesus, Tessa. Where have you been all night? 
I've been calling you non-stop, he shouts. This is the first time Noah has ever actually raised his voice at me. We've bickered before, but this is a little scary to see. I am so, so sorry, Noah. I went to Landon's house, because Hardin was drunk, and he was breaking things, and the time just got lost, I guess, so by the time we cleaned up, it was really late, and my phone was dead, I lie. I can't believe I'm lying straight to his face, all the times he has been there for me, and here I am lying to him. I know I should tell him, but I can't imagine hurting him. Why didn't you use someone else's phone, he says forcefully, but then pauses. Never mind, Hardin was breaking stuff? Are you okay? Why did you stay there, if he was being violent? I feel like he is asking me a thousand questions at once, disorienting me. He wasn't being violent. He was just drunk. He wouldn't hurt me, I say and cover my mouth, desperately wishing I could push those last words back in. What do you mean he wouldn't hurt you? You don't even know him, Tessa, he snaps and takes a step toward me. I'm just saying that he wouldn't hurt me like physically. I know him well enough to know that. I was just trying to help Landon, who was there too, I say back. But Hardin would hurt me, emotionally, he already has, and I'm sure he will try again. And here I am defending him. I thought you were going to stop hanging around those type of people? Didn't you promise me, and your mom that you would? Tessa, they aren't good for you. You've started drinking and staying out all night, and you left me here all night, I don't know why you even had me come here, if you were just going to leave. He sits down on the bed, and rests his head on his hands. They aren't bad people, you don't know them. When did you become so judgmental? I ask him. I should be begging for him to forgive me for how badly I've treated him, but I can't help but be irritated by the way he's talking about my friends. Mostly Hardin, my subconscious reminds me, and I want to slap her. I am not judgmental, but you would have never hung out with those goth people before. What? They aren't gothic, Noah, they're just themselves, I say. I am as surprised by the defiance in my words as Noah is. Well, I don't like you hanging out with them, they're changing you. You aren't the same Tessa that I fell in love with. I realize then that his tone hasn't been malicious at all. It's just sad. Well, Noah, I begin, and the door flies open. My eyes follow Noah's to an angry Hardin storming into the room. I look at Hardin, then at Noah, and back to Hardin. There is no way this is going to go well. Chapter 36. What are you doing here? I ask Hardin, even though I do not want to hear the answer, especially not in front of Noah. What do you think? You snuck out on me while I was asleep. What the hell was that? He booms. I hold my breath as his voice echoes off the wall. Noah's face flashes with anger, and I know that he's beginning to put the puzzle pieces together and I'm torn between trying to explain to Noah what is going on and trying to explain to Hardin why I left. Answer me. Hardin yells and stands in front of my face. I'm surprised when Noah steps between us. Don't yell at her, he warns Hardin. I'm frozen in place, while Hardin's face twists in anger. Why is he so mad that I left? He was mocking my inexperience last night and would have kicked me out this morning probably anyway. I need to say something before this all blows up in my face. Hardin please don't do this right now, I beg. If he leaves now, I can try to explain to Noah what is going on. Do what, Teresa? Hardin asks and walks around Noah. I hope Noah keeps his distance. I don't think Hardin will hesitate to take him down. Noah is pretty buff from soccer, especially compared to Hardin's lean body but I have no doubt that Hardin can hold his own and most likely win. What the hell is happening in my life that I have to worry about Noah and Hardin fighting? Hardin, please just go and we will talk about this later I say, trying to defuse things. But Noah just shakes his head. Talk about what? What the hell is going on, Tessa? Oh God. Tell him, go on and tell him Hardin says. I can't believe he is doing this. I know how cruel he can be, but this takes it to a whole other level. Tell me what, Tessa? Noah asks, and I can see his stance is an aggressive one, because of Hardin, but it's softening as he wonders about me. Nothing, just what you know, that I stayed at Hardin and Landon's last night, I lie. 
I try to match my gray eyes to Hardin's in hopes that he will stop this now, but he looks away immediately. Tell him, Tessa, or I will, Hardin growls. I know it's all lost. I know there's no hiding anything anymore, and I begin to cry. But I want Noah to hear it from me, not the smirking asshole who's brought us to this point. I'm humiliated, not for myself, but for Noah. He doesn't deserve any of this, and I'm ashamed of the way I've treated him, and the confessions I'm going to be forced to make in front of Hardin. Noah I me, and Hardin have been I start. Oh my god, Noah stutters, and his eyes begin to water. How could I do this to him? What the hell was I thinking? Noah is so kind, and Hardin's cruel enough to break Noah's heart in front of him. Noah's hands go to his forehead, and he shakes his head. How could you, Tessa? After everything we have been through? When did this start? Tears stream down his face from his bright blue eyes. I have never felt this terrible, I caused those tears. I look over at Hardin and my hatred for him consumes me, so that I shove him instead of answering Noah. Hardin is caught off guard and stumbles backward, but he steadies himself before he falls. Noah, I am so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. I rush over to my boyfriend and try to hug him, but he refuses to let me touch him. And he's probably right too. If I'm being honest, I've not been good to Noah for a while. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. I suppose something crazy like Hardin becoming decent and me breaking up with Noah, so I could date him, how stupid can I be? Or that I could just stay away from Hardin and Noah would never know about what happened between us. The problem is that I can't stay away from Hardin. I am a moth to his flame, and he never hesitates to burn me. Both were stupid and naive ideas, but I haven't made one good choice since I've met Hardin. I don't know what you were thinking either, Noah says with a look of regret and hurt in his eyes. I don't even know you anymore. And with that, he walks out the door. Out of my life. Noah please. Wait. I rush after him, but Hardin grabs my arm and tries to pull me back. Don't touch me. I can't believe you. This is low, Hardin, even for you. I scream and jerk my arm out of his grasp. I push him again, hard. I have never pushed anyone in my life before today and I hate him so much. If you go after him, I'm done, he says, and my mouth falls open. Done? Done with what? Fucking with my emotions? I hate you. But not wanting him to feed off my rage, I slow down and speak more calmly. You can't end. Something that never began. His hands fall to his sides and his mouth opens, but no words come out. Noah. I call and rush out the door. I run down the hall and out across the great lawn, finally catching up to him in the parking lot. He starts walking faster. Noah, please listen. I am sorry, so sorry. I was drinking. I know that isn't an excuse, but I wipe my eyes and his face softens. I can't listen to you anymore, he says. His eyes are red. I reach for his hand, but he pulls away. Noah, please, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. Please. I can't lose him. I just can't. Reaching his car, he runs a hand over his perfectly gelled hair, then turns to face me. I just need some time, Tessa. I don't know what to think right now. I sign defeat, not knowing what to say to that. He just needs time to get over this, and we can go back to normal. He just needs time, I tell myself. I love you, Tessa, Noah says, then catches me by surprise when he kisses my forehead, before climbing into his car and driving away. Chapter 37. Being the disgusting person that he is, Hardin is sitting on my bed when I return. Visions of me grabbing the lamp and bashing him in the head flash through my mind, but I don't have the energy to fight with him. I'm not going to apologize, Hardin tells me as I walk past him towards Steph's bed. I will not sit on my bed while he's on it. I know you aren't, I say and lie back. I won't let him bait me into this fight, and I don't expect him to apologize. I know him better by now. Well, recent history would say that I don't know him at all. Last night I thought he was just an angry boy whose father left him, and that he held on to that hurt, using the only emotion he could to keep people out. This morning, I see that he is just a terrible, hateful person. There is nothing good about Hardin. 
at any moment I believed there was, it was only because that is what he tricked me into believing. He needed to know, he says. I bite down on my lip, to prevent the tears from returning. I stay quiet until I hear Hardin get up and move toward me. Just go, Hardin I say, but when I look up he is standing over me. When he sits down on the bed, I jump up. He needed to know he repeats, and anger boils inside me. I know he just wants to get a rise out of me. Why, Hardin? Why did he need to know? How could hurting him possibly be a good thing? You weren't affected one bit by him, not knowing you could have gone on with your day without telling him. You had no right to do that to him, or me. I feel the tears coming again, but this time I can't stop them. I would want to know if I was him he says, his voice steady and cold. You weren't him, though, and you never will be. I was. Stupid to think you could possibly be anything even close to him. And since when do you care about what is right? Don't you dare compare me to him, he snaps. I hate the way he chooses only one of my statements to respond to, and that he usually warps what I'm saying to better provoke himself. He stands up and moves toward me, but I back away to the other side of the bed. There is no comparison. Don't you get that by now? You are a cruel and disgusting jerk who doesn't give a shit about anyone but yourself. And he, he loves me. He is willing to try to forgive me for my mistakes. I stare into his eyes. My terrible mistakes, I add. Hardin takes a step back, as if I'd pushed him. Forgive you? Yeah, he will forgive me for this. I know he will. Because he loves me, so your pathetic plan, to get him to break up with me, so you can sit back, and laugh didn't work. Now get out of my room. That wasn't I, he starts to say, but I cut him off. I've wasted enough time on him already. Get out. I know you're probably already plotting your next move against me, but guess what, Hardin? It isn't going to work anymore. Now get the fuck out of my room. I am surprised at my harsh words, but I don't feel bad for using them against Hardin. That isn't what I'm doing, Tess. I thought after last night I don't know, I thought you and I he seems to be at a loss for words, which is a first. Part of me, a huge part of me, is dying to know what he's going to say, but this is how I got so tangled in his web in the first place. He uses my curiosity against me, like it's all a game to him. I furiously wipe my eyes, thankful I didn't wear makeup yesterday. You weren't really expecting me to buy that, are you? Did you feel something about me? I need to stop, and he needs to leave before his claws sink deeper into me. Of course I do, Tessa. You make me feel so, no. I don't want to hear it, Hardin. I know you're lying, and this is your sick way of getting off. I feel my walls slowly being torn down by the way Hardin is looking at me, and I can't let it happen. Leave, Hardin. I won't ask again. If you don't leave I will call campus security. Tess, please answer me, he begs. Don't call me Tess. That name is reserved for family, friends, for people who actually care about me, now leave. I yell, much louder than I had planned. I need him to get out, and get away from me. I hate when he calls me Teresa, but I hate when he calls me Tess even more. Something about the way his lips move, when he says it makes it sound so intimate, so lovely. Damn it, Tessa. Just stop. Please, I need to know if you, what a long weekend, boys and girls, I am exhausted. Steph says as she bursts into the room, playful exhaustion coloring her words. But when she notices my tearsed in cheeks, she stops and her eyes narrow at Hardin. What is going on? What did you do? She yells at him. Where is Noah? She asks and looks at me. He left, just like Hardin is about to, I tell her. Tessa Hardin begins. Steph, please make him leave, I beg and she nods. Hardin's mouth falls open with annoyance at my use of Steph against him. He thought he had me trapped again. Let's go, boy wonder, she says and grabs his arm, dragging him toward the door. I stare at the wall until I hear the door shut, but immediately hear their voices in the hall. What the hell, Hardin? I told you to stay away from her. She is my roommate, and she's not like the other girls you mess with. She's nice, innocent, and, honestly, too good for you. I am pleased and surprised by the way she is sticking up for me. But it still doesn't soothe the pain in my chest. 
my heart literally hurts. I thought I had experienced heartbreak after my day with Harden at the stream, but that was nothing compared to how I feel right now. I hate to admit it to myself, but I know that spending the night with Harden last night made my feelings for him so much stronger than they already were. Hearing him laugh while he tickled me, the way he gently kissed my lips, his tattooed arms wrapping around me, the way his eyes fluttered and closed when I traced my fingers over his bare skin all of it, made me fall deeper for him. Those intimate moments between us that made me care for him more also make this hurt so much more. On top of that, I have hurt Noah in a way that I can only pray he forgives me for. It's not like that. In his anger his accent has become thick and his words clipped. Bullshit, Harden, I know you. Find someone else to mess around with. There are plenty of other girls. She isn't the type of girl you need to be doing this with. She has a boyfriend and she can't handle this shit. I don't like hearing her say that I'm too sensitive, like I'm weak or something, but I guess she is right. I have done nothing but cry since I met Harden, and now he has tried to ruin my relationship with Noah. I don't have what it takes to be something like friends with benefits, regardless of how he makes me feel. I have more respect for myself than that, and I'm too emotional. Fine. I will stay away from her. But don't bring her to any more parties at my house, he snaps, and I hear him stomping off. As he goes down the hall, his voice recedes, too, as he yells, I mean it, I don't want to see her again. And if I do, I will ruin her.